Good morning, or actually afternoon. Today is Wednesday, December 13th, 2023. The time is 1 p.m. I'm at-large council member Christina Henderson, chair of the Committee on Health. We are meeting in person and in, via the Zoom internet platform. This roundtable is being broadcast live on channel 13 and on my YouTube page at CMC Henderson. Today, we are holding this joint roundtable with the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety, chaired by Councilwoman Brooke Pinto, and the Committee on Recreation, Libraries, and Youth Affairs, chaired by Councilmember Tryon White, to examine the relationship between the public safety and youth behavioral health here in the District of Columbia. Juvenile crime is a pressing concern in the district, as reported by MPD. There have been notable increases in juveniles involved in crime encompassing carjacking, homicide, or assault with a dangerous weapon during the first nine months of 2023. Specifically, according to MPD statistics, 62% of all arrests for carjackings year-to-date involve juveniles, amounting to 104 young individuals. Furthermore, the incidence of violence, uh, violent crime victimizing district youth has risen, with 97 juveniles having been shot between January and October 2023, resulting in 15 fatalities. Responding to this escalating issue, on November 13, 2023, the mayor declared a public emergency related to juvenile crime, granting district agencies the flexibility, cooperation, and expeditious response needed to address the situation. Youth violence, identified as a preventable public health problem, is detailed in the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's 2016 Comprehensive Technical Package for the Prevention of Youth Violence and Associated Risk Behaviors. The report outlines individual and community risk factors prevalent in um, D.C.'s high crime and high poverty areas, including housing instability, density of alcohol-related businesses, unemployment, poor economic growth, and concentrations of poverty. Conversely, the report identifies numerous factors and approaches that can mitigate youth violence, such as a healthy social problem, healthy social problem solving and emotional regulation skills, positive caregiver relationships, academic success, and improvements to physical environments. Today's objective is to evaluate the current behavioral health system in the district with a specific focus on services tailored to youth up to age 26, including substance use disorder treatment. This encompasses youth under the supervision of DRS, those charged with delinquency or criminal conduct, individuals receiving services or targeted by district violence prevention or interruptive programs, or those identified by a district agency, school, community-based organization, or community members as likely to be victim or perpetrator of crime, particularly crimes of violence. First, I would like to acknowledge um, uh, my colleague, Council Member Trayon White, um, to give an opening statement. Follow that um, uh, as other colleagues come, we'll welcome them in and then we'll um, get to public witnesses. Councilmember White. Uh, thank you, uh, Councilmember Henderson, your leadership on this. Um, also, Councilmember Pinto who will be joining us shortly. Um, public safety is a very key priority of mine and the rest of us on the Council in the District of Columbia. Uh, many times dealing with public safety, we do not discuss the importance of mental health and the factors that the public, uh, that put the public at, at risk of safety. Um, in DC, especially in my ward, youth are dealing with poverty, trauma on a regular basis. Uh, and these issues are getting younger and younger. These factors negatively affect the psyche and hope of many, which are the prime factors of engagement in criminal activity. Uh, sometimes in, in life, we, we see the actions, but we don't get to the root causes. Uh, public safety and behavior health services and support for youth are critical in, the, in not only addressing public safety, but also the potential of the future of D.C. Um, I want to thank you for hosting this hearing today uh, because this oversight roundtable would explore the availability, accessibility and effectiveness of behavior health services for identified youth, as well as strategies for improving the coordination and delivery of services in District of Columbia. Um, there are often times when I interact with a young person, with his and her family, and I found out there are two to three agencies touching this family, but none of them are talking, and that's an issue. Uh, we have to coordinate more as a government to maximize our effectiveness with the families to help them to get the tools and supports they need uh, to be functioning. Um, additionally, this oversight will deliver in collaboration approaches to foster the well-being of the district youth and explore avenues to increase collaboration among agencies service providers and a broader community. Um, we have opened, I know, at least two government agencies. One is the Office of Neighborhood Safety and Engagement, uh, 
uh, they are, then the mayor off open is talking about opening another office next week was with coordinate surveillance. And so it is important that as we grow as a government, even going down to the nonprofits who do the work in the community, uh, that we are coordinate our efforts to better serve residents of the District of Columbia. So I'm looking forward to hearing a testimony here today um, and figure out how we can move this train ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember White. All right, so we're going to move to our public witnesses, and I just want to outline how things are going to go. Um, so we will uh, commence with live public witnesses, and then we'll follow by public witnesses who signed up to testify virtually. Then the hearing will conclude with government witnesses who will be appearing in person. Um, due to the substantial witness list, I did this last week. So uh, for those who, you know, we've had a lot of witnesses with the Committee on Health. Um, everyone is allotted three minutes. I know you have a lot to say, and it is not to say that we don't value your opinion and thoughts on the issue. However, comma, we value the thoughts and opinions of everyone, and we want to make sure that we're not here all night. So please keep to your three minutes a lot of time. I'll gently nudge you when that time has approached, and also upload your written testimony, which can be as voluminous as you would like for it to be. Um, so uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, we have four chairs, so panels of four. Uh, Penelope Spain, CEO and co-founder of Open City Advocates. Joshua Miller, Open City Advocates. Rondell Jordan, Open City Advocates. And Rhonda Hamilton, MI Mother's Keeper. Okay. Uh, oh, wait. So is Joshua coming? Okay. But Rondell is not here. Okay. So Rachel White from DC Action. I have another chair. Great. All right. Miss Spain. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Penelope Spain. I'm a resident of Ward 4, mother to two children being educated in our public schools and for the past 18 years have served as CEO of Open City Advocates, which provides legal representation and holistic advocacy to youth who have been committed to DYRS. Over the nearly two decades that I have been defending young people in the deep end of DC's juvenile justice system, there have been dark periods where DC's youth jail was one of the worst in the country, where daily assaults resu resulted in blood and tears and every corner was thick with despair, fear, and filth. And there have been promising periods where there was a sense of collective urgency, collaboration, and dedication to implement the best practices available and to innovate together to meet the unique needs of DC's children and families. There was an emphasis on sunlight, fresh air, recreation, and community gatherings. Sadly, we're quickly spiraling down into another dark period. We adults point fingers, huddle in our respective silos, and resort to failed tough-on-crime ta tactics instead of encircling our children and their care caregivers with love and support. But some of us have learned some lessons over the years. We want to share those lessons and be part of pulling us back towards the light, the times of hope, light, and collective action. In 2009, the notorious Oak Hill was shuttered and new beginnings opened. Transitioning from a 180 bed facility to a 60 bed facility required a significant investment in community-based services, an investment of financial resources, community building and leadership. The initiative was called DC Youth Link. DC Youth Link certainly had its problems, which I can share at another time, but the best part about it was that service providers and government partners regularly sat around the same table to learn, troubleshoot and innovate. It was around one of those tables, in fact, that I first met Council Member White. The best part of DC Youth Link model is precisely what seems to be missing in our current haphazard, disjointed efforts to address youth crime. Through DC Youth Link, dozens of providers knew one another and the services available, regularly made cross referrals and warm handoffs, and any and all court involved youth was everyone's concern. Contracts allowed for collaboration service plans actually address needs, and robust flex funds helped fill the gaps. Youth were given stipends for reaching milestones and achievements, and families regularly gathered for special trips where they and their children were treated as valued members of our community worthy of celebration. So as we work to address the current state of youth violence in DC, 
I urge the council, the mayor, and all government leaders to employ the approach we began back we began to build back then. It requires leadership that believes in building up our youth instead of locking them up, robust and flexible financial investments, and the very hard work of collaboration. Thank you, Ms. Spain. Mr. Miller? Thank you. Um, my name is Joshua Miller. I'm a resident of Ward 4 and Research and Advocacy Director for Open City Advocates. Before that, I was the Director of Education for Georgetown University's College and Prison Programs and the Managing Director for Georgetown's Pivot Program, which provides entrepreneurship and business leadership training for returning citizens. I've been working with incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people for more than a decade in both DC and Maryland. And during that time, DC has had one of the highest incarceration rates in the US and thus one of the highest rates in the world. Not only do we incarcerate excessively, we simply don't treat people in secure congregate settings well. Anyone who works in these systems recognizes urgent needs for reform. I'm not gonna go through a litany of different um, recent uh, crises, but the US Marshals in the DC jail and um, the, the district courts um, sort of orders against the DC jail during the pandemic strike me as evidence that we're not doing this well. The litany of our failures in incarceration is unre unrelentingly long, and the Jerry M lawsuit found problems in juvenile facilities here in the district that led to comprehensive settlement and work plans for improvement that was to be overseen by the Office of Independent Juvenile Justice Facilities Oversight. Um, yet recently we've learned that there is potentially um, a violation of that original work plan in DYRS's intention to create 10 new beds, or actually they, they've already launched those new beds. So our failures have, systematic, have been systematic and pervasive, and the pandemic brought some of them to light, uh, while creating increased pressure and stress for those working in these facilities that has led to chronic staffing shortages and further reductions in morale. The, the mayor's recently declared juvenile justice crime emergency will make it easier for DC to contract with secure out of state facilities where our young people will be housed far from home and from DC government's oversight. At Open, at Open City Advocates, we have learned to be skeptical of these facilities. Conditions are often not what was promised, programs are often lacking, and staff are frequently underqualified. Other states view our children with fear and suspicion and treat them as second class citizens, less than worthy and more than dangerous. Assaults on our kids are ignored or even swept under the rug, and our clients must often accept this out of fear for reprisal. So I would caution that we ought not to outsource the care and rehabilitation of our young people as we have done to our adults. Uh, we are currently caught in another of our periodic spirals of rising crime, overcrowded facilities, and acknowledged abuse. Yet we have the ability to manage young people committed to DYRS in the community, providing rehabilitative and therapeutic services in the least restrictive environment. DC has excellent reentry resources, has had excellent reentry resources in the past decade. We have a network of core service providers um, that could and should be directly engaged in this work. Yet we see little evidence that DYRS draws on the full breadth of available services. <laughs> Just very briefly, the Psychiatric Institute of, of Mr. Washington- Mr. Miller. Yes. I'm so sorry. Um, Ms. Hamilton. Yes. Could you just on turn on your mic? Let's hit the button. <laughs> See, I'm not familiar. Go. Good afternoon, Councilmember Henderson and Mr. White. I am Dr. Rondale Hamilton. I'm the president of the Healthy DCME Leadership Coalition, as well as the executive director for Am I Mother's Keeper. I want to stress that a lot of our observation has happened pre-pandemic because I want us to understand the uh, extent and ongoing challenges that we've witnessed on the ground with the outreach and the lack of systemic challenges, we believe uh, lend their way to the failure of the public safety as well as what we call our mental health model. Um, if we look at current conditions, in the public service, I'm sorry, in the failure of public service, we, uh, public safety, I'm sorry, we can uh, look at the systemic failures uh, easily. We believe that as advocates on the ground, the reality of the housing instability, um, the scores of families that are living with the uh, housing code violations, economic challenges, as well as um, the reality of uh, the social determinants that they're navigating daily. These are the households that are housing these youths and what we feel that the city, the district lacks is the ability to offer root 
cause programming that would uh, address the reality of the environments that these children are being uh, reared in as well as educated in. If we look at the reality of the school system and the shortage of school counselors as it relates to the population of students, I saw a figure that said 39 counselors are supposed to provide oversight for 20,000 students. We're concerned uh, that we're not able to identify appropriately those uh, children that are at risk or families that need further outreach. I am a mental health advocate and I am concerned that with our mental health core service model, it tends to offer a one size fits all when the reality is that we need customized care for our children and our uh, families to be able to overcome the circumstances that they're living with daily. We were very disappointed to find out that the community center programming was not funded um, in Ward 8, where we tend to have a predominance of crime. Um, we are very concerned about the reality of the uh, what is it, a uh, person-centered care model that our mental health uh, institutions seem to offer and follow without the proper oversight. We're concerned about program allocations and fundings that don't provide proper oversight to make sure that the impact on the communities are uh, strong enough so that we could climb out of the crime uh, failures that we're facing and dealing with. I can tell you that uh, looking at a snapshot of our public safety failures in the last week alone, we have had an increase in a seven day period of 50 as it relates to robberies. We've had an increase of 99 more as it relates to vehicle thefts and obviously our homicides we saw happen approximately one per day. So we're not uh, succeeding in current and existing uh, uh, programming and policy. And I will give a written testimony which will speak in d detail. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. White? Um, good afternoon, Committee Chair Henderson and Committee Chair White. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before the Council today regarding the unique mental health needs of youth experiencing homelessness in the district. My name is Rachel White, and I am from DC Action. We are also home to the Kids Count, the Youth Economic Justice and Housing Coalition, the OST Coalition, and Under 3 DC. So one of our priorities is dismantling the pipeline from youth homelessness to chronic adult homelessness, which can can only be done through intentional investments into positive youth development systems throughout the district. By investing early in helping young people find stability, we're cutting off our primary contributor to chronic adult homelessness. One way to disrupt the youth to adult homelessness trajectory is by making it easier for youth in the district to access mental health support services. People living with impaired mental health and disorders are more success susceptible to three factors three key factors that can lead to homelessness, poverty, disaffiliation, and post-personal vulnerability, which can which is detailed more in my written testimony, so I won't go into detail here today. But we have had multiple conversations with youth in the district through focus groups, youth service providers, the Department of Human Services, and the Department of Behavioral Health, which continues to shed light on the existing gaps in service access for youth in the district. According to youth experiencing homelessness and their service providers, there is a lack of accessible, youth-friendly, and culturally competent mental health services throughout the district. The gap acts as a major barrier to youth achieving long-term stability. DBH has committed to working to close these gaps if allocated the appropriate funding. Existing behavioral health supports are missing the mark and not meeting the mental health needs of youth experiencing homelessness. It is the district's responsibility to mitigate existing harm and trauma and prevent future chronic and mental health conditions from occurring. Our young people's future depends on it. It would be remiss of me to not acknowledge the murder of one of the district's youth, which occurred less than two weeks ago inside of DC Doors, a 24-hour youth homelessness drop-in center whose hours may be reduced with the cuts that DHS um, is asking um, DC Doors to figure out. Um, we have been advocating for the past two years for targeted mental health supports for youth experiencing homelessness to no avail and now a life is gone. This was a preventable death. 
In the midst of a mental health and public safety crisis, the mayor is asking all district agencies to make mayor reductions, which will impact the much needed services youth exper experiencing homelessness needs to thrive, while at the same time allocating $500 million to renovate and modernize the Capital One Arena with a unanimous co-sign by the DC Council, prioritizing business development in sports and entertainment over the lives of our children and youth is unconscionable and unacceptable. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I will provide my written testimony. In detail. Great. If everyone can, um, we have a new system. So you could just go to the council website, click on hearings and just upload right there. Um, council member White, if we would do five minute rounds with public witnesses. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, I want to start off uh, with Miss Spain. Um, I, I know you've been doing this work for a sense of period of time, and you talked briefly about DC Youth Link um, and trying to troubleshoot uh, issues related to youth and their, and their services. Uh, I don't know. Were you around when we had DC Youth Investment Trust Corporation? Yes, I was. And in conjunction with DC Youth Link, we partnered with the trust to get money into the community. Yeah. Um, and then you talked about some of the breakdowns and where we were then and where we are now. Uh, can you elaborate on just the access to resources, government-wise, nonprofit-wise, and financially, versus now, then versus now? Sure. Um, well, I think... If I understand your question, first of all, I think one of the challenges back then um, under the trust and with the two different lead entities that were operating on both sides of the river was a real, um, um, th there was a commitment to collaboration between government and nonprofits and really working to innovate together. Unfortunately, I think the trust had not, actual trust, not, not the trust that you're referencing, but had not been built uh, amongst, between the government players and the nonprofit organizations. And so as a result, much of the government bureaucracy was being pushed down onto nonprofit organizations and only large ones um, that uh, were, were able to manage the some of the paperwork, the financials and things of that sort. So as a result of that, much of the innovation and the creativity that comes from within our communities, from, from the very um, neighborhoods where our youth are most troubled, uh, we're not able to thrive in that particular environment. So my one recommendation, if I had one to make from what we did then and what what I would like to see now is more of a block grant model where there is still the collaboration coming together at the tables and doing teaming for service plans um, and really ensuring that all the service providers were well aware of, um, of one another and really could do those warm handoffs that were meaningful. Um, that that I think would happen better and, and we could improve upon that system through a block grant model. I will say also that one of the benefits of the, the um, YouthLink model was access to a joint database system um, where there was some uh, some real time um, access to knowing which youth were connected for which services and yeah. when they last had that. And so I would say um, exploring in, in further detail the, the data sharing between government agencies and the service providers that are uh, serving the young people committed to DYRS in particular. Thank you for that. And I would like to follow with you about that at a later date. Happy I want to jump to Mr. Phillips. You expressed that, uh, that there are excellent reentry services. Can you speak? Can you speak to those services? Uh, I was speaking um, specifically about um, the services offered by uh, the Office of Returning Citizens Affairs. Um, I think that we, over the last three years, certainly through funding from OVSJG uh, that ultimately comes from the federal government through the American Rescue Plan, have had really excellent uh, available resources. And I just wanna point out that those resources dry up this year. So there's at least a $10 million gap there that uh, is really going to hurt returning citizens and has done a lot to support reentry success. Thank you. Gotcha. So I noted two. Um, and so we'll dive in, try to figure out, because when, oftentimes when I communicate with people returning back to the community, uh, they are referred to some of the agencies you mentioned and a few more, but uh, just a comprehensive approach to helping people not to uh, go through recidivism has been struggling in the district. And I think that we have opened more agencies, but have less communication and connectivity with the population. Um, I'm Tim on one minute. 
Oh, I'm over. Am I over my time? Chairman, sure, can I have one more minute, if I may? Okay, there we go. Something's going on with the clock. <laughs> Dr. Hamilton, uh, you spoke extensively. Uh, you were right on about the root causes, and you talked about programming um, and the school system and, and then counselors connect. Uh, I wanted to know, uh, you said that we lack the programming and allocation of oversight. Uh, can you speak more into the oversight you're speaking of you, uh, from, and I don't know if, I didn't know if you're speaking of the government or a particular agency, but particular, what particular oversight are you referring to? I appreciate that. And I was referencing uh, the systemic oversight. We are seeing, as you mentioned, many of the families that are uh, housing these troubled youth are also on uh, other agency records for the district. And what we're finding is that when we make contact with case management, for example, um, there's not a cohesiveness. The young lady just mentioned that uh, sharing of information might help with uh, proactive means, but the lack of oversight from the district side to be able to uh, help these programs be more effective in the households that are housing our youth would be. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And Ms. White, last but not least, you talked about some factors and disaffiliation was one of the factors. Can you give us what that, what that means? So um, youth with impaired mental health may disaffiliate. They may withdraw from their friends, their family, and other people, creating a vacuum of support with few fewer coping mechanisms and resources in times of trouble when their mental health needs are not being met. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Um, I just have a couple of quick questions. Um, so I appreciate all of you for your testimony. Um, one thing as we... We're holding this hearing in December. We're looking into what happens next year in terms of budget. Obviously, I, I don't feel like we should wait until October of 2023. Yeah. But if there is one thing, one thing that you say we should definitely do now, what would that one thing be? Just one. Who wants to go first? Okay, Dr. Hamilton. The one thing that I would like to see happen is an audit of your current program allocation and funding to determine uh, whether or not it's meeting the needs of the community. Okay. Mr. Miller? Um, I would very much like to see increased funding for housing support. Can you be more specific? Housing support for whom? For families, for youth? For families and for youth, but uh, families, uh, youth are often in families. I, I'm That's my funding priority. Okay. Um, to allocate $1.7 million to create a traveling mental health unit to meet youth experiencing homelessness where they physically congregate. Okay. And you all advocated for that last year. So that's yes. a very, I'm familiar <laughs> with that one. Okay. Ms. Spain. And I would say increased investment in community-based uh, grassroots nonprofit organizations and their services, particularly for court-involved youth. Okay. So when we're talking about behavioral health and you're saying in terms of community services, are we talking about providers? Are we talking about out of school time? Are we talking about something else? I'm just trying to tailor yes. us on I, this particular behavioral health topic. I think it is truly about um, a robust network of services. Let me give you just one example. I had one young man who um, unfortunately has been killed by street violence, um, but he had been linked to the Went Center, thankfully was getting fabulous services there. We had funding as a mentoring organization to, to support him. I drove him to and from his appointments each and every time. He was silent on the way to the Went Center. Afterwards, we would go and we'd have ice cream and he was just like a child again and mm. truly, you know, actually opened up. Had I not been there to do the driving to the Went Center and back, that would not have happened. So I think that we have to be careful about looking at, at, at investing. Yes, most definitely we need more investment in mental health services, particularly for young kids, young people who have gone through trauma, but also not, not do so at the dismissal of organizations and support networks that ensure young people are even strong enough to get to the appointment, to even feel connected enough with their community that they feel supported enough to engage in those services. I'll, I'll just say from providing uh, mental health services within in a very unsafe community, for example, at in lockup, young people are not going to engage in that because they're, they don't, they don't want to return from therapy 
with tears pouring down their face. That's that's not mm. a safe environment for them. So again, it is the full environment in, um, cultivating safety for our young people in their families and their community that will enable them to actually access those mental health services. Okay, thank you. Thank you all for being here. We've been joined by Councilmember Pinto. Um, she's virtual. Councilmember Pinto, I don't know if you wanted to make an opening statement. Thank you so much, Chair Henderson. Uh, I would, and I will be up momentarily, but I, I wanted to make sure to get back to hear the end of this panel. Um, I want to thank you and your your team for leading this hearing. The topic of public safety and youth behavioral health is an incredibly important and urgent one. While most of our kids in the district are succeeding, often in spite of extremely difficult circumstances, we also have many youth who need more support. Just this week, we saw 10 young people charged by the U.S. Attorney's Office for a string of carjackings. We recently had five youth be killed who are under electronic monitoring over the course of five weeks. It's clear that the district needs to be doing more to help our kids stay out of the justice system and help rehabilitate those who do end up involved in the system. I'm looking forward to today's continued conversation on these issues and I look forward to hearing feedback and solutions of the best ways to make improvements and progress that is so pressing. As the chairwoman on the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety, I'm working every day on ways in which we as a government can improve public safety in the city. And as we do this work, it's really imperative that none of us get stuck in the silos of who has jurisdiction over which component of the ecosystem. Of course, the jurisdiction of the Judiciary Committee is oversight over agencies that are on the response side of safety, police, fire, emergency response, OUC, the courts, OAG, the U.S. Attorney, Office of Neighborhood Safety and Engagement, and others. But we cannot make the meaningful progress that we must make in this space without a focus on the prevention side of our efforts. A big piece of that puzzle is with our young people and with mental health. All that's to say, I'm very appreciative for my partnership with Councilmember Trayon White and Councilmember Henderson on coordinating our efforts to think across categories and silos and to hold agencies accountable to ensure that the investments they're making are effective. I do not. I do want to take a moment to acknowledge how challenging it is to be a young person today. More than 16% of youth ages 12 to 17 have reported suffering from at least one major depressive episode in the past year. Not only that, but the pandemic has had a tremendous impact on our young people. CDC has reported that during the pandemic, 29% of high school students in the U.S. had a parent or caregiver who's lost their job. 55% were emotionally abused by a parent or caregiver, and 11% were physically abused. These are dark and drastic numbers that we have to do more to wrap our arms around and address. In addition to these stressors, some youth in the district experience a unique combination of continuous traumatic stress and historical trauma. Unlike the more commonly known PTSD, CTSD, the continuous traumatic stress, comes from repeated and continuous exposure to traumatic situations, which could be anything from being raised by a parent with substance use issues, constant exposure to violence, poverty, homelessness, food insecurity, or malnutrition. Looking specifically at the district, we can see the toll these stressors take. The Criminal Justice Coordinating Council found that 1% of justice-involved youth were homeless, 64% enrolled in Medicaid, and 50% had prior contact with child welfare agencies before an arrest. This demonstrates the clear connection between a student's environment and how they engage in their community. And it's really critical that we keep the reality of our young people and the situations that many of them face at the forefront of these discussions. We know that stress can lead to changes in behavioral, emotional health, and cognitive capacity. District actors and stakeholders must coordinate and must coordinate more effectively the emotional, physical, and psychological well being and supports for our kids. We want our young people to grow up in an environment that fosters their passions emboldens them to pursue their goals and sets the foundation for a long, stable, and thriving life. I also speak to parents every single day who tell me that often they need more support for their children. We need to listen to these pleas. So thank you very much uh, for convening this, for co-chairing this hearing today, uh, for leading this effort, um, and for the time to speak on this important issue. I look forward to hearing 
from more of our public witnesses today, as well as speaking to our government witnesses about how we can lean in um, and do this work even more effectively. Thank you, Chair Henderson. Thank you, Councilmember Pinto. Thank you to this panel. Um, next, we'll have Carrie Savage from PAVE, Sarah Camillo from School Justice Project, Patrice Lancaster, and Kelly Williams. Okay, who's, I, I know Carrie, Kelly Williams, there. So Patrice is not, Patrice Lancaster. Okay, uh, James Dunn. All right, we have four. Ms. Savage, when you're ready. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for hosting this critical conversation. PAVE parent leaders, along with community partners, practitioners, school leaders, and educators have advocated for improved and expanded school-based mental health supports and out-of-school time programs for years, two key strategies to supporting students and making DC a safe place for all. We are proud of the progress DC has made in these areas and commend the mayor and council for their work on these issues. Still, there is much more to be done to serve our kids and families. We are truly in a state of emergency. We've seen record high rates of violence-involved youth and chronic absenteeism coming out of the pandemic, which we all know has serious detrimental effects on students' abilities to perform academically, their mental health, and ultimately their safety. And that fact has huge implications for the health and vibrance of our city that should be a state in the future. The theme of my testimony today will be that we need to pour into our youth through strategic policy and programs, and that includes but is not limited to ensuring that all of our students are in school every day and have access to OST programs that ensure their safety and support their development. We need to make sure that when they are in the building, they are met with the support they need to thrive. That means joyful school learning environments, dedicated caring adults in and outside of the building, which includes safe passage workers, and coordinated systems to share insights on issues and get ahead of incidents in the school and outside in the surrounding community. We need productive and engaging programs outside of the school day where students can be safe, build their skills, confidence, and investment in pathways after, for success after graduation. Importantly, we need to be partners with the OST provider community to ensure that we can effectively scale up to meet that need while still maintaining quality programs. We also need to maintain the work the city has done to guarantee that all students have access to behavioral health supports, particularly in school. That means explicit investments in and focus on social emotional learning, restorative practices, and training for all staff in the school building. And we must be better about evaluating effectiveness and be smart about spending to make sure that all of our investments are high impact and we use every dollar to support our students. Just last month, paid parent leaders signed on to the Strengthening Families Coalition, or FFC, SFC, uh, letter to the mayor with four main asks as priorities going into 2024. Essentially, the main goal is to maintain that funding that we invested already so we can keep supporting our students in and outside of school. These asks are very realistic. We know that we no longer have an abundance of funds. We are hoping to lay down stepping stones for greater success in the future. As a quick highlight of what those asks are, are to sustain compensation for our community-based clinicians with inflationary adjustments, provide compensation and develop guidance for the school-based behavioral coordinator role so that that can be an effective and workable solution depending on the LEA and school type, to pilot the addition of non-clinical staff positions for school behavioral health teams, and invest in the development of a district-wide strategic plan for children's behavioral health. Thank you very much for your time and consideration. I look forward to hearing about the solutions that you all want to see as well. Thank you. Sarah? Good afternoon. Thank you for holding this hearing. Young people are our future and we are failing them. My name is Sarah Como and I'm the Director of Programs and co-founder of School Justice Project as well as a Ward 1 resident. I represent older court-involved students with disabilities. When I started 12 years ago, there were myriad workforce development opportunities and employment programs for young people, many community-based high school diploma options, and a network of mental health providers. While not a perfect system, we had the beginnings of a community-based continuum of care. Today, I don't have options for my clients. I can't name a workforce development program. I struggle to find an appropriate school I cannot connect a client to mental health or trauma services. All have lengthy wait lists or simply don't exist. The service desert that DC has become is the worst I've seen. I would argue that things were significantly better in 2013 or 2014 than they are today. 
The reason for this is obvious to me. Our government agencies are failing. We also have an education crisis. Kids do not feel safe in schools or on the way to school. All my clients want to go to school. They want to go to school so badly and earn their diploma that they retain an education attorney to help them. Yes, the process of going to school in DC is so hard that students need an education attorney to help them fight for their education rights. Education is a tool to disrupt court involvement and to propel young people out of the school to prison pipeline and into a positive future. Yet if students cannot access quality education, this will not happen. We must do better. Most of my clients suffer from PTSD or depression. They require intensive and individualized behavioral supports and counseling, yet we struggle to see these services being provided in a tailored and meaningful way. Instead of reducing supports and services, we need to be spending money on young people and ensuring that they can access meaningful therapies and supports. Without investing in young people, we will be spinning our wheels and returning to a time of punitive law and order policies that prioritize resources for punishment and ignore job opportunities. We need community schools that offer high school diplomas and special education for older students that can also meet their unique behavioral and mental health needs. This includes trauma and grief therapies. We need mental health providers. We need paid workforce and employment opportunities that provide pathways to financial independence. Housing must be made available as well as relocation services for families and victims of gun violence and for individuals returning to unsafe neighborhoods. We must meaningfully invest in violence prevention to include holding ones accountable and supporting violence interrupters and credible messengers. Lastly, I hope this council provides oversight of governmental agencies. All of this is provided in great detail in my written testimony. I also cite seven government reports that have been provided to the mayor that contain over 150 recommendations to address public safety and help young people. They all echo what I said today. Invest in young people, create a plan and fund it. That is the solution to public safety. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Williams? Thank you so much for having me. My name is Kelly Williams, and I represent a DC-based CBE and HUBZone certified organization, EDRA. I'm a registered nurse with expertise in pediatrics. I feel like I'm sitting among colleagues here. Um, some of the same topics. So mental and behavioral health is at the top of legislative agendas for most state and local governments across our country. At the heart of the issue is our youth, assuring that children and families receive the help and resources that they need. It's more effective to prevent an illness than to treat one. Many states across the United States are contemplating a more proactive approach to mental and behavioral health, performing youth mental health screening at the beginning of the school year for each and every child. Utah has had this program in place since 2018 and it has proven effective for identification of risk. Much like immunizations, the screening would be done as part of the back to school package. The earlier the intervention, the better the outcome. Washington D is farther along in addressing youth mental health issues than many other places in our, in our great nation. Uh, evidenced by the South Capitol Street Memorial Act of 2012, uh, resulting in the Comprehensive School Behavioral Health Program. As a result of many conversations I've had across stakeholders, across our community leaders, and with agencies here in Washington, D.C., I've got three recommendations for you con your consideration as you march into 2024. The youth, number one, the youth mental health screening for each school child for anxiety, depression, and suicide every year. Number two, um, employing a central IT repository that tracks the child's journey and documents interventions uh, to sh make sure they're being done, they're tracked, and that way we can begin to measure and analyze outcomes. Are we doing the right things? Are do we doing it at the right time? And so on. Third is, and this um, is, uh, others have said this, is we've got a workforce issue with our clinicians. So how might we help that situation Telehealth is a great way to do that. We can bring in specialists from other places that can serve here in DC. Um, with these three um, additions, earlier identification, quality measurement and improvement, and improved access will augment the existing programs and mobilize resources more quickly to youth and their families. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Mr. Dunn? Honorable members of the council, I extend my gratitude for this opportunity to address you today. My name is James Dunn. 
And as the co-chair of Thrive Under 25, I passionately advocate for emerging adults who have encountered the justice system. I want to emphasize a critical truth. Hurt individuals often perpetuate harm. Many young individuals I work with have faced lifelong trauma stemming from adverse, abusive environments since birth. Poverty stands as a central catalyst for much of the turmoil we witness. Allow me to draw from my personal experience to highlight a pressing need within our community, the establishment of safe spaces. Beyond just physical safety, these spaces provide psychological sanctuaries where young minds can thrive without the haunting specter of violence or insecurity. Safe spaces empower our youth to explore their potential, cultivate their talents, and foster positive relationships. However, safety alone is not sufficient. For our youth to truly thrive, they require comprehensive support systems. These encompass access to quality education, that addresses their diverse needs and learning styles, mental health resources that destigmatize seeking help and opportunities for meaningful engagement within their communities. Vocational training and job prospects tailored to their skills are pivotal in shaping a hopeful future. Equally crucial are mentorship programs, providing guidance and encouragement from individuals who understand their struggles and aspirations. Furthermore, we must consider relocating youth to safer neighborhoods, offering them environments conducive to growth and development. Additionally, I am passionate about continuing to work towards empowering our youth in financial literacy. As an expert in options trading and investing, I firmly believe in providing young individuals with the knowledge and essential capital necessary to invest wisely, creating pathways towards generational wealth. Every child deserves the assurance of safety, devoid of fear when stepping beyond their neighborhood's confines. What we're witnessing among, among our youth is akin to PTSD, a harrowing reality that our young ones have suffered to such depths resulting in taking the law into their own hands. Thank you for, thank you so much for allowing me to share. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. Council Member White. Yes, thank you. Um, and this question is for Ms. Como or Mr. Dunn. Um, both of you talked about uh, relocating youth or, or families in the case of uh, some public safety issues. And I, and I hear that often. And even Mr. Miller, I'm sorry, I messed up your name earlier today, uh, was concerned about where and how far and will they get the proper supports if relocated? I didn't know if you guys were speaking on relocating locally or somewhere else out of town. Uh, can you all elaborate on that? We're going to start with Ms. Como and then Mr. Dunn. All right. I was going to let Mr. Dunn go first. <laughs> um, I also know that my colleague James Carpenter is going to be talking about this as well. Um, we... We need young people to feel safe and, uh, you know, they, they need to be able to feel safe in the district and some young people hopefully will be able to feel safe in other neighborhoods in the district and some young people may not be able to feel safe in the district. I, I don't I don't think there's a cookie cutter approach. I was at an event a couple of weeks ago and a former client of mine was brave enough to sit on a young person panel and he talked about relocation and talked about how he is home and he's been home for 10 months and he has not had everyone told him before he came home, there's jobs, there's opportunities, and he has not been able to find employment. And he also was brave enough to share with us that he doesn't feel safe going to the corner store in his neighborhood. So he just stays at home. And someone from the audience asked what his solution was. And he said, I would be relocated anywhere in the United States. I just need to feel safe and to get on my feet. And I, I, I think that's a really powerful statement. So I, I don't know if I answered your question, Mr. Mr. Dunn and my other um, colleagues who do a lot, work a lot more closely with young people in terms of like specifically relocating can answer it better, but that just is my perspective. Thank you. Uh, from my experience, um, of course it depends on individual basis, right? Um, 
what we see, for example, I'll give you some examples. Um, with some of the youth, we see this big influx of youth wearing masks, right? It's not always that they're trying to commit a, commit a crime. It's because they're trying to hide from somebody that they feel like may try to harm them, right? They're trying to disguise their self. And that's very alarming for me, right? That you feel like as a child, you have to disguise yourself to move around freely in, in your neighborhood, right? Yeah. So I think um, one of the things we need to do is clean up our own neighborhoods, right? So that they can feel safe in that, right? Um, create some pockets throughout the district, right? where they may be able to locate to heal and get the proper uh, counseling and things that they may need to heal properly, right? Because like I said, hurt individuals hurt people, right? So it's just, um, but there may be some extreme cases like Ms. Carmel, Ms. Carmel was saying about, they may need to be relocated outside of the district, right? To feel safe. Um, some of these kids have, been through some very traumatic situations and extreme situations. And sometimes uh, that may be what needs to be done from my perspective. Thank you for that. And I do want to add, um, I had a recent opportunity to visit some young people from New Jersey that are in DC. And just to see that they have to, they are really able to be themselves, right? Mm -hmm. Because they explained to me that in their environment, they have to be something they're not because they're afraid and have to protect themselves. They have to carry weapons. And now they're here. Uh, no one knows who they are. And so they can kind of let their guard down, learn, go places, and not be afraid. And I, I, I want to believe that's probably true for a lot of youth who are in danger or may be in danger because some neighborhood beefs or personal beefs that's going on. Um, I know also, Ms. Mr. Dunn, you teach financial literacy you've been on um online with me teaching yeah. the masses about investing and you talked about that briefly in your testimony about economic empowerment how does economic empowerment transfer to transforming the minds of young people in your opinion uh what i see with a lot of youth um because they have come from poverty they're out here taking chances and risks with their lives just to get a dollar right um i come from this same environment i was born and raised in dc uh, I grew up in poverty as well, and I made I made some very irrational decisions as a youth. So, um, in my from my journey and from my experience, I know I felt like if I could show these kids another route to making uh, generating income, which was through uh, the stock market, um, like you talked about, my program I created was called From the Streets to Wall Street where I brought in a bunch of youth and taught them about the stock market and investing. And I also gave them stipends to make their first investments with, right? And for them to actually see their money grow, right? And know that there are other alternatives out here besides breaking the law. Um, I think that's very empowering, right? And uh, a lot of the youth, they are so excited once they learn this information. So these are the things that I believe or programs I need think need to be created in our community to empower our community so that they can break the cycle of poverty. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member White. Um, thank you to this panel of witnesses. Ms. Williams, I want to follow up on a couple of things you brought up. Um, you talked about youth behavioral health screening for every kid at the beginning of the school year and that Utah does this. Um, one of the things as chair of the health committee that I often run into when I'm talking to my colleagues in the health agency space, where I say like, can I do eye screenings? Can we do dental screenings? Can, um, if we know 40% of the school is all missing the same polio vaccine, can we not line them up and just do it at school? And they say, well, we need parental consent for all of this. Does Utah not need parental consent before they screen for behavioral health? The way they have done it is if you go to a public school in that state, that is part of what you're signing up for. Hmm. And so what happens if they flag a kid? Then the next that, then it is referred on to um, one of three things, education, counseling, crisis. Okay. And they're tracked through. Um, to understand, did they show up? Did they have a ride? Those kinds of things um, so that we can understand if early intervention is truly um, a, 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 a deterrent for bad things happening 
rather than waiting until something bad happens. Yeah. Um, okay. So I would imagine that the screening is fine, but to go on to con- further treatment, they would need parental consent. I would, I, that is something we would have to, yes, absolutely. Okay. And in, in the other cases when we've had this with like, um, I remember a number of years ago when there was a move around, we need to do dyslexia screening for everyone. And someone said, well, if we did it for everyone, do we have enough money to then like once, once, um, once we fought, once we, the government identified that this is a problem, now we have a responsibility to like provide Mm -hmm. services for that. And I think it's a capacity question of if we did a screen for everyone, what then is the move after that? When I look at, what is it? I have, um, a 32% vacancy for school-based mental health right now. Right. So this is a fabulous idea. I'm just sort of thinking about how do I operationalize that? Um, Cause it also might help to flag some other issues as well. Um, but then also what do we do about those are the kids in schools, right? But I got what 42% of my ninth graders who are chronically truant. So how do I get that crew um, to also be flagged as well? And so those are great questions. Um, I think that what we expect after the screening is that between 10 and 15 percent will have some sort of risk okay. identified and then mobilize some of these wonderful resources others have pointed out to make sure those families and that youth are supported. OK, thank you for that. Um, Ms. Savage, you talked about OST programs and, and kids in school each day and um you know, I think Paige testified yesterday, 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 yeah, yesterday's truancy here. I don't, I don't even know what today's day is. Um, but one of the things that we have been talking about on the middle and high school side, right? I feel like we do OST programs really well for elementary school students, but then once you get to middle school, you're like, good luck to you after school. Good luck to you because we don't have aftercare for middle grades. Has PAVE parents sort of been talking about that age group in terms of what do we do on that front? Like I remember in high school, like you don't, you weren't kicked out of the building at 3.30. It was like, you could hang out, you could talk to a teacher, you can go to the library, you can go to the computer lab. Like they were just kids who go to after school club, whatever. I don't necessarily, I hear from a lot of teens that at 345, there's a sweep of the building and everyone has to leave unless you are there for a particular purpose. Um, I've heard many similar things and I I can't say that we've gotten to all the answers, but I would say that that particular area is a priority. And I think one of the things that we've talked about in as one step of addressing that is really being creative about the OST workforce. Um, so on the high school side, like there's lots of folks who are looking into job or paid opportunities, SYEP, things like that, that isn't a perfect solve, um, you know, to getting kids out of the school day, but it's one aspect that is more appropriate for high school youth than it is for middle school. Mm -hmm. But I think like between, I, I think I was thinking about your question to the previous panel at the end of like, if you could pick one thing and ultimately like so many of these solutions are so people centered and all of that comes down to workforce and pipeline. Like you mentioned the clinician pipeline. Mm-hmm. And I think we have the the various different roles that we have now to wrap our arms around students, whether it's a clinician, a safe passage worker, an educator, like some of those roles are huge and really overburdened. And then there's some roles like OST or safe passage workers that are maybe part-time, not full-time. And if we were to be a little creative, I'm not saying it wouldn't take resources, right? If you expand someone's role, you need to increase their compensation. But if we were to be a little bit more creative about what does an OST program person do during the day so that they can help um, mitigate some of those gaps in between programming or even with transportation and same for safe passage workers. We're hearing from folks about, um, yes, there's value to safe passage workers, but maybe we wish they had more de-escalation training or that Mm -hmm. if they had more relationships with the community, like those are things they could be doing in between pickup and drop off, Mm -hmm. um, and, and building. So it's a, a workforce, um, you know, an opportunity for a work, uh, a new job for someone, but also helps fill in some of those gaps. And so I think like the middle school population, 
population is tough for transportation in particular, um, but then also making sure we have people who are who are interested in taking on that role. And that part's been really tough. But I think we're, that's why I mentioned working with the OSC providers, because I think the scale question is huge. And yes, it's a money problem, but it's also a people problem, too. Yeah. OK, I'm over my time. Councilmember Pinto. Councilmember Pinto. Okay, she might have stepped away. Thank you so much to, to this group. Um, I wish I could ask way more questions, but again, we'll be here all night. So thank, thank you, you so all. Much. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, we're going to move on to the next panel. Um, Eduardo Ferreira, Jennifer Ubira, Marie Morales Black, and Demetrius Jones. Okay. okay. Is Demetrius Jones here? I don't see. Okay. Uh, Desmond Barr? All right. Uh, Amber? Oh, oh, you're here. Oh, my bad. Sorry. Okay, Eduardo, why don't you go ahead and get started? Good afternoon, Council Members Henderson. Pinto. Can you turn your mic on? There we go. Thank you. Good afternoon, Council Members Henderson, Pintone White. My name is Eduardo Ferrer. I'm a Ward 5 resident, a visiting professor in the Georgetown Juvenile Justice Clinic, and the policy director of the Georgetown Juvenile Initiative. To start, I'm very grateful for this joint hearing. First, this hearing is a great example of intentionally and thoughtfully trying to break down the silos that exist in our city. As has been repeated time and time again, the district is a resource rich, but coordination poor. Indeed, while there are many benefits to the manner in which we organize our government, such organization, both at the executive agency level and the council committee level, reinforces siloing and makes collaboration more difficult and less organic. Holding joint hearings across committees is a great way to create a forum for problem solving and coordination across agencies and across clusters of government. Second, the joint nature of this hearing, the framing of this hearing and the inclusion of DBH in a hearing about public safety is critical to the creation, adoption, and execution of a public health approach to violence prevention and positive youth development. This joint hearing is among the first I can remember that intentionally recognizes the importance that a non-public safety cluster agency plays in preventing violence both in the short term and the long term. I'm hopeful that this will be the first of many joint committee hearings to come in which the council models taking a true public health approach to violence prevention and positive youth development and models the importance of cross agency planning, collaboration, oversight and accountability. And as you can all see from the turnout here today, I think the community is hungry to have these types of cross agency, cross sector conversations. Given the high number of folks testifying today, I'm just going to highlight high level recommendations and then I'm happy to get into more detail uh, in question and answer. And so I have three kind of meta level recommendations and the number of practical recommendations. At the meta level, before anything, we really need a plan. We need a real comprehensive, coordinated, cross agency, cross sector public health approach to positive youth development in the District of Columbia. One that really focuses on prevention rather than reacting to harm once it happens. Second, once we have a plan, we need to actually execute on it. We cannot just leave the plan on the shelf as we have left so many others. And we need to do the big and little things to make sure that youth and families are connected to meaningful supports. And then third, we need to hold more joint hearings across clusters. Uh, in terms of practical recommendations, I'll just highlight three real quickly, all related to Medicaid. One is we need to add home visiting and additional parenting supports to our Medicaid plan. Uh, and that's in the realm of prevention. In the realm of intervention, we need to add violence interruption services to our Medicaid plan, as well as do an analysis of our plan and create a comprehensive continuum. And then third, with respect to mitigation, we need to take advantage of the Medicaid reentry section uh, 1015 demonstration opportunity program uh, so that we can better connect young people to services as they're reentry. Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer? Good afternoon, Chairperson Henderson, Chairperson Pinto, Chairperson White, and members of the committees. My name is Jennifer Ubiera, and I'm a Ward 4 resident and a senior policy counsel at the Council for Court Excellence. This testimony does not represent the specific views or endorsement by any judicial member of CCE. 
The recently released 2021 Youth Risk Behavior Survey for DC results noted an alarming rate of suicidality among middle school females, especially those who identify as Hispanic or Latine, Black, and LGBTQ. The report also reveals that over one in four high school students have witnessed acts of physical violence, such as assault, beatings, stabbings, or shootings in their neighborhoods. The level of trauma impacting our city's youth is astonishing. We see further disparities between LGBTQ students and their heterosexual counterparts um, across various domains, including substance use, feelings of insecurity, sexual violence, and mental health problems. Almost half of all LGBTQ students in high school reported that their mental health is not good at all the time or most of the time, and almost 50% of middle school LGBTQ students reported contemplating suicide. Suicide is among the leading causes of death for youth ages 10 to 24, and overdose deaths for youth ages 14 to 18 nationally has been on a dramatic rise. These disparities present a traumatic reality for DC's youth. Um, forward. As youth are experiencing downward trends in mental health and family financial stability, the city needs to improve how we respond to their needs. First, DC youth should have better access to services to address all of their mental health needs. Given the dearth of providers in the district at the current moment, this response should include free access to online and mobile therapy, national providers like Talkspace and BetterHelp, which I'll, sell, which I'll share more about later. Secondly, DC must implement the recommendations from youth-focused reports published in recent years, such as the CJCC root causes and risk factors reports, and the OVSJG report addressing PINS youth. These studies show the value from both public safety and community perspectives of moving away from carceral and punitive responses while better coordinating government agencies in resource productive ways. Lastly, DC government agencies and residents have invested significant time in task forces, commissions, and new district offices to better support youth, but their recommendations have not been implemented and or their, rep their operations have not been adequately supported. In reports published as early as 2009 on gun violence, the district has been made aware that poverty is a main, if not driving cause of youth public safety issues and an involvement in a multitude of systems such as child welfare, delinquency, and human services. In November of this year, New York City partnered with Talkspace, an online therapy co uh, company, to enter into a three-year contract to put access to mental health support right in the hands of young people at no cost. This service connects youth with a licensed therapist through the app using video, phone, and text capabilities. Uh... Okay. In 2020, OVSJG released a report specifically focused on targeting truancy reduction and PINS youth, but not a single recommendation has been implemented despite how the city is now grappling with chronic absenteeism. The Police Reform Commission, the Jails and Justice Task Force, and the National Institute for Criminal Justice Reform have each published reports analyzing these issues and providing recommendations. Thank you. Don't worry. You don't have questions. Don't worry. It's okay. <laughs> Take a deep breath. <laughs> Marie? Good afternoon, Chairperson Henderson, Chairwoman Pinto, Chairperson White, members of the council and the listening public. Thank you for the opportunity to really testify at this joint um, round table. I am very excited that um, this is taking place because it's so needed. Uh, my name is Dr. Marie Morales Black. I am the CEO for MBI Health Services. Today, I am going to focus on a very coordinated, integrated program called High Fidelity Wraparound that is underutilized in the district that is offered by the DC Behavioral Health and soon to be funded by both DC Behavioral Health and Department of Healthcare Science, which will make it part of the fabric of the mental health system. Um, I want to share um, the we our approach to youth mental health is three core principles: recovery works, care must be family driven, and trauma informed practice are essential to achieving recovery. We believe that community-based and effective natural supports to achieve better outcomes for our youth. High Fidelity to Wraparound address 10 core principles, family voice and choice, teamwork, community integration, cultural competency, individualization of the plan of care, strength-based approach, persistency, persistency, we don't give up on our kids, and outcome-oriented strategies. These principles guide all of our services and ensure holistic approach to supportive youth and families. Let me share with you some specific aims. It aims to strengthen family capacity to coordinate their services and support, develop family-driven plans that promote self-advocacy, improve youth and family ability to manage their own services and support, strengthen the youth's family and natural social support, integrate 
I heard some of the previous panels talk about integration and bringing everybody at the table so coordination of care can happen. This program does that. Um, and I want to share in uh, DC recently funded um, this program in six schools, uh, Jackson Reed, Ballou, Dunbar, Jefferson Middle School, Johnson, and Walker Jones Educational Campus. Um, let me give you a little bit of outcome for this program. Um, it diverted 98% of the kids from psychiatric residential treatment, which is a very expensive service at about at a, approximately 200 plus thousand dollars a year per youth. It diverts that. It reduces criminal activities by 87%. 70% of the youth that comes to this program were judicial involved. 87% of them did not get a new arrest. 90% shows increased academic gains. 70% had a decrease in suspension and improved academic. Um, and it's built natural support. We have currently 85 slots available. We have 62 filled. Um, and the parents share that um, they are many. Um, they're very happy with the services. And so what are some of the challenges? We had this program before. It was taken away and parents says it's gonna take away, they don't wanna start it. But because now it's Medicaid reimbursable, it will be around for the long haul. And I want the public to know that. And I know that my time is running out, so I will stop and answer any questions that you might have. Great, thank you. Mr. Barr? Good afternoon. My name is Desmond Barr. I'm here as the very first emerging adult I'm an emerging adult fellow of the Justice Policy Institute. In the role, I bring my perspective of DC system impacted youth youth adults of JPI's work. I'm also a peer mentor with the Credible Messenger program. I advise the Credible Messengers on how to best engage their youth and serve as a youth to the mentors. I'm sorry, a youth to, uh, mentor to the youth. I lead weekly groups, create safe and healing spaces, and create and teach lessons to prepare mentors to become positive role models in the community. I first got involved in the justice system at the age of 13 and also ended at the age of 18. I was in another YC, New Beginnings, and when I was 16, I was placed in DRS Civil Oak Academy uh, in Kemar, Maryland, two hours away from my family in a place I didn't know and didn't have any access to my family. I later committed offense close to my 18th birthday and was held by the court until I was uh, until I turned 18 so they can charge me as an adult. I received positive sentences uh, with no consideration that I was still a, a developing young person. I returned to the community in 2020 at the age of 19. I was assigned a credible messenger, Mr. Curtis, who helped me and transitioned transitioned me back into the community. He kept me on the right side of the tracks and my most and my most vulnerable points to ensure that I didn't get rearrested. He served as a mentor, father figure, and a role model all in one. I looked up to him, and he inspired me to do better and become more than what others expected of me. He helped me uh, look for employment and provide other services. I restarted my degree at UDC. However, in December, I was in a car accident that left me paralyzed from the waist down. I was spent nearly uh, a year in a rehabilitation center and had to drop out of college. Yet, I was committed to getting my life back on track and remain active in all programs throughout the Credible Messengers. I was eventually um, invited to become a peer mentor based on my leadership skills, maturity, and progress. This opened the door for me to get nominated this year to become an emerging adult uh, fellow with JPI. The lessons I've learned um, that I can be a role model. Uh, my story can bring others from making the same mistakes I made, and also um, my voice is my voice and perspective is needed in these areas. Uh, my recommendations. Uh, I firmly believe that the district needs to take these act these four actions. Um, go to where the young people are. Hearing me and people my age should occur between should not only occur when I'm working with organizations and advocates. Go to where the young people are. YC, New Beginners, DC Jail, credible messenger groups, and go regularly. Uh, investing in more credible messengers. Credible messengers can be critical to guiding um, these young kids back into the community. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councilmember White, you have questions for this panel? Um, first, I want to start with Mr. Barr. Um, first of all, we're proud of you, man. Um, we encountered a lot of youth that have trouble uh, as a young person just trying to survive in D.C. And not all of them make it. I know because in my office, in my house, I have a, a bookshelf 
and I took some of the shells off and it's with t-shirts of a lot of funerals I've been through over the last 21 years. And I buried 438 youth in Washington, D.C. or young adults. Um, and so to see that you not only, not only took that pain and turned into passion, become a credible messenger is, is, is remarkable. Um, we need people like you inter intervening and, and empowering you to be a vessel, uh, to be, uh, for example, I heard you talking about you uh, leading groups, creating mentors, and that's what needs young people need to see people that look like them in front of them that had, you know, previous experience or not and doing the right thing. And so I want to thank you. I want to I want to not just get past that. And I know you've had some troubles with the accident and things like that. But uh, this is my first time really interacting in this at this capacity. But we want to we want to admonish the work you're doing and don't want to overlook overlook that. Uh, in brief, you talked about the work as a credible messengers, and you, one of your solutions and your four was to uh, hear from young people and have more investment in credible messenger messenger program. How how do you see that working? Are you working with the agency? Are you working in DYS? How are you serving as a credible? Yeah, it's CPCP. Yeah, CPCP. Yeah. You want to know the crazy thing about this? When I first started doing this work, I started working at ERCPCP, Reverend Donald Isaac. I don't know if right. you noticed, but you came to my graduation. Will you stay? You say you came to your graduation? Yes. Okay. What which which graduation was that? Uh 21. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh Reverend Isaac, uh, I'm from that community at the RCBCP house. And he saw me standing outside in the community. I wasn't on the block selling any drugs or anything. But he uh, saw a lot of potential in me and said, I was in college, I actually come home from college, and he grabbed me and I started doing work right there at ERCBCP. Um, what type of uh, supports do you think that credible messengers need, messengers need to be successful in reaching and advocating and supporting young people? Um, the more resources, um, let's see. Pull the mic a little closer. Can you hear me? <laughs> the more resources from uh, DOS, uh, more funding. Uh, let's see. It's a lot that the credible messengers on the front line, um, they don't really get support with DRS, you know, like far as like travel reimbursement, you know, they come out of their pockets and um, give us, um, not necessarily give us money, but give us resources that um, they don't really get back from DRS. That makes sense. I got you. And how do you, how are you meeting your uh, caseload of, of mentees that you work with? How, did, how does that process work? Um, it's different. I have to know my audience and know who I'm dealing with. I can't treat all of my youth or uh, my mentees the same way. Okay. So do you get referrals from DYS or you get them from your uh, ERCP? CP? ERCP, CP. And how, when, do you meet them while they're in the facility or when they come home? No. So I'm a peer mentor. So I'm uh, in this, on the street. Oh, you're on the street? Yeah. Exclusively? Yeah. All right. And th there are those who work with individuals while they're in. Do you interact with them at all? Val val violence hand. prevention, violence interrupters, credible messengers? Second hand. Second hand. Yeah. Okay. So that's part of the coordination we need to increase uh, council members uh, of those who are working with them while they're in versus those who are working with them when they come home because there's already, there are people working there as well. I'm stressed on my time, but I did want to jump to you, uh, uh, Mr. Ferreira. Um, you talked about prevention and intervention in the health plan. Mm -hmm. uh, can you elaborate on what that looked like? Yeah, absolutely. So Councilmember Pinto mentioned the CJCC report earlier, right? Yeah. We know that, for instance, 50% of the kids who come into contact with the delinquency system had reported cases with CFSA ahead of time, right? When we're yeah. thinking about a public health approach, we're thinking about prevention, intervention, and reaction. So a lot of the focus is on reacting. How do we better serve crossover or crossed over youth that are already delinquency system involved? We need to be better asking the question that if 50% of the kids are known to CFSA before they're becoming system involved, what can we do at CFSA to help young people heal and to better support their parents so there's the young people don't become system involved in the first place? But even better, and this is why one of the recommendations is adding parenting supports to the Medicaid plan, is what can we do with parents to reduce the incidence of maltreatment from the get-go so that young people experience less trauma and are less likely to end up in the child welfare system, meaning they'll also be less likely to end up in the delinquency system. So what we really need to be doing is focusing a lot more intentionally on that front end prevention piece. We know who the young people are who are coming into the system. In fact, we know often where they live. I think it's something like 
um, 25% of the kids arrested in the city come from 9% of the PSAs, right? So we actually know what neighborhoods we could go to in order to invest directly in youth and families before they get involved in the system. And you know what? It's a lot cheaper and it's a lot more effective to do it early than it is to try and do it on the back end. Thank you. And I'm over my time. Just one last question if I may, Chairwoman. All right. Um, and I, I have about eight more, but it's, it's not. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, Dr. Dr. Black, uh, I think the name of the program is, I know that High Fidelity Wraparound Program. Yes. Where is this currently operating and how do you recruit people to be in this program? The office is at MLK at the big chair. However, they work in the community, the staff that the care coordinators and uh, the referral today comes from um, the OAG, um, from the community, but it has to go through the Department of Behavioral Health for approval. However, which sometimes, um, and there's an, uh, an extensive application process, which sometimes can deter people from referring. We recognize that. And so the department and us are working together to streamline that process so we can make the referrals a lot quicker and faster to access. Okay. Um, this is my first time hearing the successes of this program. We'd like to take time outside of this environment and figure out what's working. Um, you talk about 98% kids. Uh, been diverted? I've never heard of that. So I want from psychiatric residential treatment, which mean unlike this young man who was sent away two hours from home or far from home, away and not getting treatment in the community, it diverts us from having to send kids in the community and work with their families, which is the family component that you're talking about, Mr. Ferraro, to really support the family system to get better. Thank you, Ms. Jennifer. I'll get to you later, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, thank you to the to this panel. Um, again, there's so many things I can go through. So I'll just start with Mr. Ferrer. So number one, yesterday, Committee on Health, we had a markup. We marked up home visiting for Medicaid. And so the council will be voting on that next week. Um, and we'll ask some questions of healthcare finance, who's not here today, about the 1115 waiver for Medicaid reentry. But the council was the one who started the hospital-based violence violence interruption program, which we've seen some really good work um, under. And I went earlier um, this fall to Howard, um, who um, Howard University uh, works with us on that program um, or is one of the partners. And they've had some really excellent outcomes out of that. But again, it's after something has already happened. So it's not, it, it's prevention of retaliation and cycles, but it is not prevention of the original incident. And so, um, we could talk more about that. Um, Ms. Cubera, thank you for your testimony. It's funny, you and Ms. Cuomo, uh, Sarah, Ms. Sarah, that's all I'm gonna say because I don't wanna butcher your last name from the School Justice Project. Mm -hmm. um, Y'all list out all these lists of projects, or uh, uh, reports. reports. Mm -hmm. We have reports on top of reports on top of reports. And so it's still always so funny when they're like, we need a task force. And I'm like, well, we already had one and we have the report, but we're not acting on it. Um, uh, yeah, y'all know how I feel about uh, uh, task force, working groups, et cetera. Um, but I'm curious, uh, you talked about New York City partnering with Talkspace. Very familiar with Talkspace. Anybody who listens to some of these podcasts, right? They are always, uh, if you're a listener help. of The Read, mm -hmm. uh, they're always advertising on it. Now, let's set aside Talkspace's um, issues in terms of, well, I don't know if it was them, but somebody had an issue in terms of privacy, in terms of the online piece of that. Mm -hmm. But has New York City released any data in terms of uh, the take up of that? Um, they haven't released data. So the program was launched last month, so in November. And um, what's what it looks like based on the summary provided by New York government is that the students are going to use it in the same way that the average client use it, uses it, but they're going to have a parental consent component. Um, so... They're going to go to Talkspace, put in their name, uh, address, and date of birth, and then they include their parents' email address to receive consent, and then they go through the screening and assessment. That's right, at the because beginning. Talkspace, you can only technically sign up if you're 18 or older. Yes. Um, and so this program is focused on uh, youth ages 13 to 17, um, specifically called Teen Space, NYC Teen Space. Um, they haven't, so they haven't released data yet, and I'm not sure of how New York plans to release that information, um, but it just launched last month, and it's one of a few that they are doing in jurisdictions, but I think the first that has been released publicly. Okay, 
I, I will sort of look into that a little bit further. It could help in terms of um, the workforce challenges that we talk about. Yeah. I, I don't know. As you said, every kid is different. Some kids might like a virtual telehealth environment and some kids might say, I don't know what's happening on the other side of the screen. I need to see you. I need to understand your body posture towards what I'm saying to see if I feel comfortable enough to sort of talk to you. Um, and it might take us three visits for me to trust you. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, the focus of that partnership is trying to get mental health in the hands of youth, right? So that's not the answer for every young person. Um, so we also have the school-based behavioral health program that is being implemented. And as you mentioned, has a 32% um, lack of uh, clinicians in the schools. It's an, it's an added resource to help address some of that um, lack in the schools. But partner together, it can be part of a toolkit that youth have access to to address some of their mental health concerns, giving them more, um, you know, as we're still figuring out how to fill the gaps is what I think that why I recommended that program in our testimony today. Okay. Um, interesting in terms of no one has sort of talked about yet, and maybe some other folks will, but again, I was like listening to a podcast and they were talking about what has been the largest difference for youth today versus youth who were in their teens in like 2000, 2001. And there was a researcher who basically was like, social media so is the if control for everything else. That is the biggest change in difference. And so exacerbated, of course, by the pandemic, I'm just like, has anyone figured out yet how to sort of crack this, right? I, I could give you all the supports and love and care in a school environment, an after school environment, and then you go home or on the bus home, you get on the TikTok and you see somebody say something about you and then it like, it, it unravels. So like, how do we, how do we deal? Yeah, I, I think Eduardo kind of touched on it, talking about investing in the families. So Council Member Pinto, Pinto mentioned um, about most youth being able to overcome the challenges that they experience once being exposed to negative factors. And so if we focus on those protective factors, I think that increased resources to those which are uh, stable family, caring adults, and a positive school environment could also help to address some of the impacts of social media um, post-pandemic as well. I'm over my time. Council Member Pinto. Thank you, Chair Henderson. And thank you all very much um, for your testimony and, and your powerful perspectives. Um, I want to ask you, Mr. Barr, and thank you for, for sharing some of your kind of personal experience. When you talk about the programs being effective for you and kind of helping you set on a different path, can you speak kind of very specifically about that first type of outreach and what made that first or second or third follow-up uh, work for you and be the the kind of messaging that was helpful for what you were, were needing and experiencing at that time? It wasn't the first, second, or third. I was pretty hard-headed growing up. So um, it was the consistency uh, from the credit messages from the staff of DRS. Um, my best thinking got me into the justice system. So what I needed was someone who had the experience that I was trying to experience and lead me in the right direction. Okay, thank you so much. And and when you say that you were trying to experience, can you speak a little bit more to that and kind of what what you were looking for that made that relationship most effective? Um, just experiencing life, uh, trying new things, um, just f figuring out life in its totality, um, not knowing what to do, trying to figure out what to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciate your comments about interventions need to look different for different people. We can't have a one size fits all approach. Human mm -hmm. beings are complicated. And um, so thank you for, for sharing that as well. Um, Mr. Fur, when you talk about parental supports, uh, can you zoom in a little bit on how we can make those supports most effective? I think sometimes there's a conversation around resources versus uh, consequences. And when it comes to, and I, you know, I heard other panelists talk about making sure that the familial environment is most supportive. 
what can or should we be doing differently when that's not happening? And we need to make sure parents are part of the process, um, but that we're meeting them where they are to to address some of the challenge that that they may be facing. Yeah. So I think that that point that you just made, meeting them where they are, is key, right? Just like with young people, supporting parents is about individualized support. So often in the district, we see multi-generational trauma. The trauma that our young people are experiencing is trauma that their parents experienced, that their grandparents experienced, and that we failed as a district on multiple generations to really address and support. And so with parents, it's really about trying to interrupt those cycles of harm. And that means not replicating the same cycles that they went through, which is often some level of system involvement, right? It's about investing directly in the family through direct cash assistance, reducing parental stress uh, through actually providing parenting support. So we see it in the district now with home visiting programs. That, that's really often targeted to kind of prenatal to three or four years old. There are hosts, there's a suite of parenting programs that we could be providing to families all the way through a young person reaching 18, right? And there's great, you know, triple P parenting is a great example that it, it in and of itself, it's a public health approach to parenting supports. It's got five different tiers of interventions depending on what that particular family needs in order to really support the parents. Parents can be a source of stress for young people, or they can be a source of protective buffering. And the stronger we make parents for their kids, the stronger kids we're also going to have. And so that's really what the focus needs to be on, individualizing support to parents. And that looks not just like you know improving their own parenting. It looks like healing the trauma that they've experienced. And then it looks like reducing their stress through direct cash assistance and other economic supports. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then I guess, and this can be for anybody, what happens when those supports fail in certain circumstances? I think if we do the prevention and the intervention right, we will see a much, much smaller proportion of failure in the child welfare system, for instance. And so are there times when child welfare system is going to get involved? Absolutely. Right. And we have, I'm not an expert on the child welfare system. I'll defer to some of my other colleagues who experience that and see that more uh, day to day. Um, but clearly it looks like from the data that we're seeing in the delinquency system and the number of young people who had prior child welfare system involvement, that there's a fair amount of work that we could be doing in the child welfare system to really focus on providing the supports and services that young people need to heal from the trauma that they've experienced while we're also helping parents heal and learn the skills and develop the capacity they can be or that they need in order to provide supports for their young people. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Um, thank you, Councilmember Pinto, and thank you to this panel. I just wanted to mention one other thing. You were talking about CFSA. Um, so last week, Councilmember Lewis George and I had a joint hearing of Committee on Health and CFSA talking about behavioral health supports for youth within the child welfare system. And it's very interesting because the providers say one thing and the CFSA some says something completely different in terms of capacity and like who's being screened. So we're we're trying to unpack what is going on here. Um, but thank you so much to this panel. Uh, we'll move on to the next panel. Uh, Amber Riki from um, Children's Law Center, Rebecca Strauss from the Federal City Council, Rachel Goodman from School Justice Project, and John Noble. Okay. All right. I know Amber. Are you Rachel? Okay, great. All right. So no Rebecca. No John. All right. Uh, Kalik Barnes. Nope. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, you all got to speak up just a hair. Um, Curtis Young. Okay, so we'll get started and then, okay, great. All right, Amber, why don't you go ahead and get started? Thank you, good afternoon. My name is Amber Riki, and I'm on the policy team at Children's Law Center. We work with DC children and families, community partners and pro bono attorneys toward a future where every child can grow up with a strong foundation of family, health and education 
and live in a world free from trauma, poverty, racism, and other forms of oppression. Thank you for the convening this important roundtable. Exposure to community violence is deepening the existing mental health crisis for young people. Symptoms of poor mental health, including depression and suicidal ideation, have been steadily increasing among youth nationally and locally for over a decade. Our behavioral health care system is broken and overburdened. My testimony today will focus on fixing this critical but under-resourced part of our community safety infrastructure. My written testimony goes into greater detail on how exposure to community violence impacts children and the gaps in our current behavioral health system, including workforce shortages, data challenges, and lack of coordination. Trauma is a word we've heard a lot in today's hearing. Trauma is not just an event. Many in our client community are exposed to violence in their neighborhoods, attending schools that go into lockdown, or losing peers to shootings. Even when the event ends, the impact of the toxic stress continues to disrupt development and functioning, influence behavior, and worsen long-term health. Violence can also interrupt activities that are protective of mental health, like sleep, relationships, being outdoors, and exercise. While we work to reduce violence, we must also increase services for children who are living with fear, grief, and trauma. We have emerging examples of effective prevention and early intervention programs like Healthy Steps and the School-Based Behavioral Health Program. But our system is especially under-equipped for more intensive needs, both inpatient and outpatient. Often when young people experience psychiatric symptoms, they need somewhere to go for care other than the emergency room. We desperately need services like intensive outpatient and partial hospitalization programs. For cases when youth need residential treatment or hospitalization, it's nearly impossible to find a place where they can go. There are no residential substance use treatment facilities or youth stabilization units. There are only a few psychiatric beds, no therapeutic group homes, and no psychiatric resident treatment facilities. Children are often sent to Maryland or Florida for these services. Even where crisis services exist, we see decline. CHAMPS used to be available 24 seven, but now the crisis response team, already overstretched with adults, will respond to these calls on nights and weekends. We urge the council to make transformational investments for an effective and accessible behavioral health system. It is imperative to fill these gaps for the health of our youth, families, and neighborhoods. Improved access to treatment for substance use and mental health is also significantly associated with reducing crime and recidivism. The right service at the right time can change lives. There is a lot we need to build, but we cannot wait any longer to begin. Thank you. Thank you, Amber. Rachel? Thanks. Rachel, if you could turn your mic on. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, committee members, for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Rachel Goodman. I'm a senior staff attorney at the School Justice Project. There, I represent older court-involved uh, students with disabilities who are involved in DC's criminal legal system. Recently, a client who had been pushed out of district schools asked me if he could go to a school where the white kids go. His question reminded me why I prefer working with young people. Despite our constant doubts in their abilities, young people tend to see things exactly as they are. This young black DC student with disabilities knows very well that the white children in DC get to go to good schools. He knows that white students generally feel safe at school and feel safe walking to and from school. And this is all my client wants. He wants to graduate high school and he wants to stay alive while doing it. Earlier this year, this same client was a victim of gun violence, not because he antagonized anyone, but because he was from the wrong neighborhood. And now he's terrified to go back to school. But despite his fears, he's enrolled in a community-based school, but the school is not able to keep him safe and meet his special education needs, leaving him right now without an education and without really a choice. And this is part of what I think is missing in the district's discourse right now, on crime and public safety. We need an acknowledgement from our government that the kids that they want to lock up have been witnessing and experiencing severe trauma throughout their young lives. And there are very few resources available in the community to address and heal that trauma. It is not hyperbole to say that many of these young people feel like they live in a war zone. And when my clients are vulnerable, and share what it's like to live in a war zone and ask for help to cope with all the things that they've experienced, 
there is no help to offer them. The same client I've told you about asked me for trauma therapy, yet I had no options for him. There are simply not enough community-based providers of high-quality, trauma-informed mental health care. The few that exist have extremely long wait lists and are often located in parts of the district that are very difficult for our clients to access. And I have yet to find a community provider that offers uh, accessible, evidence-based PTSD treatment for my clients, such as those that are available through the VA for veterans. So we need to invest in many more specialized treatment centers for trauma and grief in the communities that are most impacted by gun violence and also within our public hospitals. I'll also flag that we need more long-term drug treatment programs in DC with dual diagnosis options for both substance abuse and trauma. Because of these service gaps, um, my clients are, that's it. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. It's okay. <laughs> I know it goes by fast. Please provide us with your full written testimony. Yes, right. absolutely. Well, Mr. Barnes. Members of the council. My name is Khalid Barnes and I'm 11th grade student at Thurgood Marshall Academy. I appreciate the opportunity to speak before you today regarding the critical issues that was mentioned. As a black student in the District of Columbia, I believe that addressing intersectionality of public safety and behavior health is essential to creating a supportive environment for all youth. One of the challenges we face is the lack of adequate resources and accessible mental health services. Many of my peers and I encounter various stressors ranging from academic pressure to community violence, and the available resources often fall short of meeting our needs. I urge the council to invest in mental health programs within schools, ensuring that students have access to counselors and therapists who are culturally competent and sensitive to the unique challenges faced by Black youth. Many youth in our community live in a negative environment that prompts them to become a product of their environment. We see burglaries, prostitution, people being shot in front of us, and it is hard to live in an environment such as this. Most cases, youth who are involved with the crime often are thrown in, in jail behind bars and not given the opportunity to realize their wrongdoings when all they have done is try to protect themselves and live in a lifestyle of this. But due to the lack of mental health services and behavior assistance, this generation steers away from using communication skills to resolve conflict. It is crucial to foster positive relationships between law enforcement and the community. Unfortunately, there is a prevailing sense of fear and mistrust among young people with adults in law enforcement and those of government. Community policing initiatives that prioritize relationship building over enforcement can go a long way in establishing trust and collaboration between law enforcement and youth. In my area, law enforcement is called 12 Ops Feds in names of that, and this is because of the lack of trust and support. Many of you view all police as bad when that is not true. It's just due to what they see. I grew up afraid of police due to me seeing them harass and brutally beat people who look like me. But as I got older, I learned that officers are here to help. Additionally, I want to emphasize the importance of after-school programs and extracurricular activities. These programs not only provide a constructive outlet for our energy, but also serve as pr uh, preventive measures against engaging in ris risky behaviors. From the time I was in elementary school to now, many things have been stripped away from us, such as different clubs, different activities, and because of this, we have no choice but to be on the street. However, um, I do applaud Councilmember White for opening the new recreation centers but we normally see them facilitated by programs that you must be a part of, and you're unable to just go and play or get a bite to eat and have fun. In conclusion, by investing in accessible mental health services, fostering positive relationship between law enforcement and the community, and expanding after-school programs, the council can significantly contribute to the well-being of Black youth in the District of Columbia. I implore you to consider these recommendations seriously as you make decisions that impact the future of our community. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Young? How you doing? My name is Curtis Young. And I want to thank you guys first for letting me share my testimony. First of all, my I also have a CDLs class B, and I look forward to taking that advantage of that now and plus in the near future. So first I want to start off by sharing my story for us as a youth and growing up in a rough environment. Growing up in a rough environment was very hard and very challenging and very difficult. And it was very emotional with growing up without a dad and growing up without guidance to be a man. 
as I grew up in a rough environment, I made several mistakes trying to be a man and try to overcome my challenging obstacles. Far as like being in the juvenile system, selling drugs, rock, everything. And now I'm just in the process of my life trying to build and, and learn. I have a mentor three years ago. I came home from the juvenile system. I have a mentor named James Dunn. Helped me with everything as far as like my driver's license, obtaining my CDLs. And ever since then, I haven't just looked back. I'm just still learning and still making mistakes to become a man on my own, very independent. So last year, I feel as though that was actually my takeoff year. I bought my own vehicle from a dealership. I bought my, I got my own apartment. And it's just like, I'm still working on myself and uh, just trying to be better as a better man, learning from my mistakes, like, and like just build and continue to build myself in my future. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Council Member White. Yeah, so I don't have any questions per se for this panel for, for the sake of time. I do want to uh, thank you guys for coming today. I want to especially acknowledge Mr. Young and Mr. Barnes uh, for your leadership. Uh, this, this takes a lot of boldness. And we're having a, a hearing about youth services. And so we got to hear from the youth, right? Um, uh, and I want to thank you guys for your, your transition and being committed to first bettering yourself and also bettering your community um, and, and investing in yourself. Uh, there was a lot of discussion about recreation services, trauma therapy for youth, access to better programming, after school programming, mental health care and services in the school. So my staff and I are taking notes. We look forward to uh, figuring this thing out and putting our money where our mouth is. I believe that our budget as we all say, is a more document. And there's an old scripture say, well, your heart is that your treasure will be also. And we have the more, the most money we ever had in DC history right now, right now. But as you said, Khalid, but we have closed down uh, oh, wait, 10 wrecks in Ward 8 alone that has the most youth and the most issues in District of Columbia. So we have to do better and we're committed to excellence within ourselves and in the district. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember White. Um, thank you so much to the to this panel, and yes, Mr. Barnes and, and Mr. Young. Thank you guys uh, for uh, your bravery to even come down here to testify. Um, I want to ask a couple of follow up questions, but first, I want to say, Mr. Young, um, having a CDL right now is like gold. So I'm excited for your 2024. If your last year was your launch year, next year is is going to some to some heights because he, these CDLs are in high demand. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you for, for being here. Mr. Barnes, I wanted to ask, you said there have been a lot of different clubs and activities that have gone. I hear that often from young people, but um trying to understand if you could be a bit more specific because I know I get an email every week from DPR about Midnight basketball, come play video games, come do X, Y, Z. Is it, is it boys and girls clubs? I know we've closed some of those. Is it the YMCA? Like what do you, when you, when you say things we used to have are no longer available, what, what's your, what are you referring to? Um, I would say boys and girls clubs um, and mainly like recreation centers, just mainly areas that youth can come and just be themselves. Um, I don't see places. All you see is youth just probably in their front yard, not going out. And I wouldn't say it's mainly because it's not out here, because most times it is out here. However, we're not prompting them to go to it. Um, so I would say mainly boys and girls clubs, stuff like that, places where youth can be youth. And most of the things that are out here, you have to be, you know, registered a part of. You can't just go into it and access it um, from the outside. So. OK, so like a drop in type of environment, like, hey, I just. I don't know. It's four o'clock. I don't have anything to do. Yeah, yeah, just, I'm not ready to go home. So let me just go someplace else. And just talk, you know, lollygag. But they like um, I believe somebody said before, they rush you out. You know, you don't have the opportunity to just sit back, relax, engage with your peers. You come to school, do what you got to do. And instantly you have to go. Like literally my school, third go much. They tell you get out. Simple. Um, but they do offer a couple of things. You just got to, you know, register. OK. What time do they say you all have to be out of? the building by 3 30 no longer than 3 35 
All right. Interestingly enough, I, we had the mayor's public safety summit earlier this year, and it's like between 315 and seven o'clock is like the highest incidence in terms of crime in, in the district, which is like immediately after school. Maybe if we held on to somebody a little bit longer, we might see a little a little less activity that's going on. OK, um, Miss Goodman, you said you mentioned that you had a client who asked for trauma therapy, but you couldn't find one. Can you talk me through that process? Like, do you, do uh, the school justice project, do you all have a list of places? And then you called through to see if there was availability. Um, is one of the things that I have been sort of pushing with DBH and just for awareness, y'all, Dr. Bazaran is here and she has been here since the beginning of this hearing is that like, what's the dashboard look like? If I, mm -hmm. if, if, if I were a regular schmegular person and I saw a young person who I felt like could need some additional help, there is not one place I could go and say, okay, here's an organization that's close to us and, and do that. It's like, you got to do the hoops. You have to be persistent. Right. At, yeah. Right. So we usually start maybe with the WENT Center. Okay. Um, they currently have a six month waiting list and we've tried all different strategies to navigate that, but it's, I think they're doing the best they can. Yeah. Um, so then with this particular client, we then called the uh, city hotline for victims of gun violence. And uh, we got the name of like the women's center. And I explained that this is a young man and and that's kind of where that conversation ended. Um, I then reached out to my personal network and got a number of names. All of those people have wait lists. And then I found um, one provider um, who's connected to Georgetown University, but he only takes folks with insurance. And so the next thing on my, I need, this client is not insured at the moment. And so it's then helping him get insurance, but he also doesn't have photo ID. So there's just, so right now we're, pause trying to get photo ID to then pursue this opportunity at Georgetown, but got to get insurance he, before you could do the Georgetown. Exactly. So like there's a lot the of areas. steps. Yeah. And, and then getting him to Georgetown is going to be really difficult. Yeah. So I think we're, what my vision is and what I've heard clients express would be really helpful is kind of reproducing the went center model, but in the communities where gun violence is happening. So people can get to these places more easily. And um, there are specialized providers that are specifically trained uh, to treat trauma and to use these different kind of evidence-based practices for PTSD or similar trauma disorders, which are just simply unavailable to our clients right now. Yeah. Okay. This is, this is helpful in sort of talking about what are some of these barriers, right? You're talking about, you found one, they have insurance. I have a list of, and I had this conversation with the chair of the board of psychology. I have a list of providers who don't take insurance, right? Not Medicaid, not private, not anything, because they can make enough money from people who could just pay out of pocket, exactly. whatever the $300 an hour rate or is. And so how do we entice more? So needing to have that conversation about reimbursements. Um, but thank you. Thank yeah. you for your time. Thank you. Councilmember Pinto. Thank you, Chair Anderson. And I appreciated that conversation um, because I think these continue to be major gaps to work through. And so thank you for sharing the kind of practical next steps. Um, I was really moved, Ms. Goodman, when you talked about your client talking about feeling like they were in a war zone. Mm -hmm. um, and I know, Mr. Young, you mentioned just kind of growing up in a in a circumstance that was very difficult. I also hear from young people who say, we feel like no one cares because there's not response. And so as we as we weigh the complicated balance of making sure we have more investment in supports, economic resources, mental health, and appropriate response when we don't get there fast enough, I just was wondering if you can, we can start with you, if you can elaborate a little bit on what what types of things you saw in the environment growing up as it relates to um, violence and what you think a more appropriate response would have been once that happened? As far as like growing up in a rough environment, it's like, and I was speaking about it last night when I was on a, a Zoom call. It's like when you're in a rough environment, man, everybody around you is just doing the same thing. Like no one have no positive guidance. Nobody don't want to do anything. Nobody don't have support. So if you see one person in your environment doing it, 
you're going to do it the same thing and it's not going to stop. It's like generation, generation. It's a repeating cycle. So once somebody do it in generation and like it's no positive in your in your uh, community, I mean, in, in your environment, it's like it's no change in that. It's like it's a repeating cycle. Like it don't stop. Yeah. Thank you. Do you have something to add there? Um, I would agree with what he said as far as it's like a generation, but um, I believe we get to the point to where if we begin to look up to our parents and if we will hold the parents accountable to where this is what I see, this is what I'm dealing with. I grew up in an environment, it was a lot, okay, um, 6th Street Southeast, um, and it was a lot there, um, but I had a mother who shielded me from majority of the things that I saw. So because I had that mother and it created like a barrier and a standard, you know, it kind of, but still I'm going to a public school, still seeing all of this stuff. It kind of drew me near to that. However, my, I had my mama right there still bounding me and keeping me right there. So I believe we get to the point to where we hold parents accountable to where, you know what, allow these parents to just have them to honestly create a boundary with their child. Teach a lot of these parents to teach their child the right from wrong because a lot of a lot of people grow up in an environment where all they see is you know in the household weed alcohol all that stuff and because this is what they see this is what they do like he said because this is what I physically see this is what I'm in I might as well be a part of it I have no choice but to survive this is the way I survive people carrying guns knives all of this and because of this I gotta survive I gotta do it too I gotta survive. Thank you so much for that. Sure. Far as like the argument, what he said about like you getting raised by your mom, like like 90, 99% of boys or men out here are getting raised by moms. You don't have no type of father, father figure in your life. So far as like when you been raised under your mom and we was me and my uh, mentor were speaking about this earlier. Once you've been raised under your mom and you don't have that father guidelines in your life, you're going to be so emotional about the situations that you can't overcome so once you're so emotional you're going to take them emotions out in a negative way and st if you had that man in your life and far as like the mistakes you're making currently making that man can help you with that guidance and bring you up but far as like with a woman a woman can talk to you and that just brings emotions so once a woman just bringing emotions to you and you coming from a negative environment you're going to shoot them negative emotions out and that's and that's how it is Thank you for that. Um, and I just want to go back to, to something um, you said, Mr. Barnes, around accountability for the parents and that parents need to be providing these, these guardrails or supports for their kids. What does accountability look like to you? To me, accountability looks like when you see your kid doing wrong, don't ignore, don't like edge it on, but tell them about it. Accountability to me looks like you sitting there and talking to your child, explaining to them what they did wrong, how they can do better. And not only to telling them, but showing them the way how they can do better. A lot of people look up to their parents and all they see is them, you know, um, doing what they're doing. And because this is what they see, like I said, you know, this is what they do. And if we get to the point to where parents begin to honestly put on the example that they want their kid to show. Put on the exam. If you want me to be better and if you want me to do this thing, then I want to see you do it. Thank you. I'm out of time, but thank you all very much. Thank you so much um, to this panel. Um, and, and please, if we don't have your written testimony, please uh, upload that for the record. Uh, we're going to go on to the next panel. Uh, Ovid Gabriel. Again, apologies if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly. Are you Mr. Gabriel? All right. Uh, Michaela Deming. Uh, Zibdu Kintamore. All right. And uh, Carolina Miguel Hernandez. Carolina, I, I'm assuming. Okay. Um, yeah, that'd be great. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Um, Ovid Gabriel. All right. 
You just hit your mic. There you go. Okay. Last thought now? Yes, sir. Okay. My name is Good afternoon, my name is O.V. Gabriel. I'd like to share with you my experience as a system impacted young person and my recommendations to invest more in credible messengers and resources for youth in DC. Before I get started, uh, y'all should know that I am an artist. I've been uh, drawn since I was a kid. I grew up in Northwest DC. I went to Whittier Education Campus for elementary and middle school. And I always loved art class. When I went to Paul, I was taught realistic like faces and stuff. And that's when I really got into that. I started doodling all day in class and stuff. I got into trouble with the law when I was about uh, 14, 13. That's when I had like, I got into the trouble with the law a little bit before that, but uh, like 14, that's when I had like a long stint, like a couple months at YIC. And that's when I discovered how, really how good I was. I, uh, I did my first like real portrait of this refugee with like rags on his face that I seen. I got a book from the library. Then I borrowed a pencil from the, uh, the, uh, the classroom at YIC. And I did this portrait and before I knew it, all these people started coming to my, like other youth on the unit, they started coming to my window, trying to see what I was doing. Next thing I knew, I come out with a whole line, just looking, they just like, they amazed at what I could do. Me too, I didn't even know I could uh, do it that good. And then like through some, you know, talking to people, I got connected with some public defenders, one of them named Brittany Mobley. She uh, put me in a position to get an internship at the Smithsonian Art Museum when I got released. I was on track to doing that, but it got stopped due to COVID. And during that same time, I tried to apply to Duke Ellington and they didn't accept me for some reason. I think it might've been because of my juvenile record. I don't know if they have access to that or not. But long story short, a couple like in that, time frame, that two month time frame, I got locked back up and I got rearrested and sent to New Beginnings. When I came home, I, I got released. I went in when I was 17 and New Beginnings got released when I was 17. Yeah, I went in when I was 15 and I got released when I was 17. When I came home, I started doing tattoos, opened up my own tattoo studio in uh, Prince George's County. Uh, I didn't really know the art business for real. I had the skill set, but didn't really know the art business. So it was kind of a struggle. After that, I got shot eight times at 18 and arrested for carrying a pistol. During the time I was in the hospital, I wasn't able to contact my mother for the whole stint. And throughout my surgeries, none of that, because I was in police custody. And after that, I went to DC jail to recover for about three months, and then I was released. And more of a story, it hasn't been the, the, the straightest path that I've taken, but I'm working towards a better future. I'm working with Justice Policy Institute. I have a tattoo shop currently in uh, College Park, Maryland. I'm here today. I'm trying to be a positive influence in my community. My experience with Credible Messengers is like, they genuine, they genuinely want to see you do good. Like, these are people that been through the same situations that we've been through. They they passed down lessons. Like, I got really good relationships with a lot of Credible Messengers, especially when I was at New Beginnings. This uh, mentor, Boogie, uh, David Allen, Sean Cuddy, uh, they was working with me. I did a mural at New Beginnings, I got paid a stipend of $1,300. I was very grateful for that when I came home. Uh, they was working with me trying to get, they, they, they got me in the mindset for when I came home for me to start doing my business. I needed that support. Uh, my, my, my cut of a messenger, Petty, he came to see me every week, always support me, stay in touch, pick up the phone, give me positive, positive words, you know. 
their positive mode, they positive role models, they gone through the same experience we gone through. But this brings me back to my artwork though. So uh, I'm gonna explain this to y'all. This is a credible messenger. It's not finished by the way. I was trying to finish it by today, but unfortunately I got held up. Uh, and so basically, this is a credible messenger right here talking to some youth. And I did this all from my imagination, from my like memory, because this is my memory of new beginnings, like how the, how, the, how the unit was looking. And this is like kid, like youth in DC jail. Like he's talking to, he, he can relate to youth in DC jail. He can relate to all these different types of youth, females. We all going through the same, like the same type of struggles and situations and circumstances. He relating to all of them, they, they getting ideas. And it's like, we the future, like we really the future. Like we really got investments we need to be made in us so we can become these people, we become like the president, we become lawyers, astronauts, successful athletes. Right. Thank you, Mr. Gabriel. If we will have some questions for you. Um, Ms. Deming? My name is Michaela Deming. I'm the policy director of the DC Coalition Against Domestic Violence, and we're the federally recognized Coalition of Domestic Violence Service Providers here in the district. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today about the intersection of domestic and dating violence with youth safety and mental health. I also have a few uh, promising practices to share um, and uh, information about how the district can further support these efforts. Um, I have submitted my written testimony. There's a lot of data in there to back up what I'm going to say. Um, uh, but I won't share it all here uh, in these few minutes. So conservatively, we, we know that at least 10 to 20% of children are exposed to intimate partner violence every year, uh, leading to at least a third of children being exposed to domestic violence before they turn 19. We know that that has impacts on brain development and behavior and mental health, um, and that begins in utero before a child is born. Um, there are documented differences in their brain chemistry and development. We also know that uh, domestic violence is a leading cause of youth homelessness here in DC, uh, with 40% of homeless youth indicating that they've experienced domestic violence, and 55% of those saying domestic violence is the reason for their homelessness. Research consistently links the types of youth behavioral and mental health concerns being discussed here today with exposure to domestic violence and co-occurring child maltreatment in the home. While these struggles are predictable based on this data, um, they are exacerbated when children go to school and youth go to school experiencing violence, uh, namely dating violence there. Fully funding necessary resources uh, for the victim parent and the children to get and stay safe, um, along with evidence-based behavioral change support for the person who's doing harm is necessary. Um, we know that uh, youth well-being is experiencing a downward trend at the same time that teen girls are experiencing record high levels of dating and sexual violence. Among youth who have dated in the past year, according to one study, 70% reported experiencing domestic violence. And that shows us that we must do better with intimate partner and sexual violence prevention across the district. We also know that substance misuse uh, is correlated to domestic violence um, and it actually increases the risk of lethality for our young people and for adult domestic violence victims. And we know that dating violence and domestic violence are part of the gun violence epidemic. Um, so I will share that there are two things that we have done um, to work on what was called front end prevention earlier on about the public health model. Um, we do have a tiny bit of uh, CDC funding um, to help uh, do violence prevention in schools. Uh, that is the only funding used to implement the School Safety Act of 2018 requirements. Um, and we do have a curriculum for that that could use more support. Um, that could also be done through recreational and out-of-school programs. Um, we have also worked with violence interrupters um, and have seen some promise there as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ming. We have some more questions. Um, Ms. Kimmitor? If you just turn your mic on. There you go. Thank you. Good afternoon, council members. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Sibdu Kemtore. I am a Walpole resident, 
student at Bria Public Charter School and a mother of four, one proudly serving in the National Guard, one in university, and two in middle school. I have witnessed plenty of pride after Osman Children Middle School this year far more last year. I have also noticed that this year, the smell of marijuana has become very common. There is not a day that goes by that my children and I do not smell or see children smoking marijuana. Middle school children are too young to be so comfortable smoking outside with little no, to no consequences. What has happened in these past few years that has given little so much access to drugs to our children. Our community needs support. It needs to feel safe again. Children are smoking and thinking that ceiling is cool. Senegal's brain are not fully developed. They are being robbed of their full potential and think it is funny to skip school. How can we as community support parents who are trying to make ends meet and cannot afford to miss work to keep an eye on their teens. We refuse to accept this as a new normal, which is why we ask for more mental health service at our school to help teens deal with issues a healthy way. More after school programs that are low to no cost for families to send their teen to help with homework or burn energy before going home for a good night's sleep. How our teens and community deserve to feel safe again. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Ms. Hernandez? Good afternoon, council members. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Carolina Miguel Hernandez. I am a, a Ward 4 resident, a student at Brilla Public Charter School and mother of three two of whom are teenagers attending a DC public charter school. Every afternoon, walking back home from picking up my children, I see too many teenagers on the street smoking marijuana as they wait for the bus, walking into the stores and smoking like, like they are adults. As a mom, all I can think about is how this will affect their brain's development, the way they make decisions, and their mental health. I wonder what, what else are our teenagers are being exposed to. We cannot accept this as a, our normal. We, where is our sense of a community? It takes a village to raise a child in, and it takes a city founding to open more after school resources for parents who cannot afford this miss, to miss work to be with their children at the time of the dismissal after the school. What is the city doing to provide after school services to alive the number of teenagers on the street being, being exposed to drugs and other activity, activities that we as a parents will, wouldn't approve of? We need program, programs that, that, can, that can get our youth excited for college and bright future. Speaking with other parents, we think providing more affordable or free after school clubs or services that our teens can be excited to be part of without adding an extra bill to our households will be of, of great benefits to our youth in our city. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Councilmember White. Uh, yes, thank you. I have no um, particularly questions for this panel, um, but I did have a few comments. I did want to uh, thank you guys for coming and speaking. I think it's important that we hear from the public. I want to thank you, Mr. Gabriel, for being vulnerable um, and speaking to us and letting us know your story and what's working and what's not working. Uh, you, as we can see, you're a truly gifted individual. Um, I don't know if you are, you know about the, 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 uh, Arts and Humanities Commission. Okay, so DC has what is called the DC Arts and Humanities Commission that uh, some, has a lot of grant opportunities for people like you, not just to do artwork, but do murals, whatever it is. And we had, did a study and found out that a lot of the money wasn't going where it's supposed to go. 
And so they reprogrammed and, and reconfigured how they give out money to the community. And so that's something you can look into to get more funding to do what you do. Um, and, and I heard you say, I think you said you were in Greenbelt, Maryland, doing work, but well, somewhere in Maryland, College Park, sorry, right down the street. Um, and so I think that what you've been in the district, we should be able to help you right here. You shouldn't, even though you are, you shouldn't have to go anywhere to get the help you need. And I think that one of the previous questions was about the uh, recreation centers, uh, what's been closed in the last panel. So I wrote down a few um, in that uh, so we can know um, Hart, or Baloo, um, P.R. Hers, Anacostia, Congress Heights, Turner, uh, Number 11 Boys and Girls Club. This is a few. That's just in Ward 8 alone. I think that to um, Ms. Hernandez's point, we need more affordable after-school programming. And uh, we can't overemphasize it enough, but again, we have to put it in the budget and really uh, drill down on this. I look forward to supporting that from this council and the mayor's office with the incoming budget coming up starting next year to support us. And so I thank you guys for speaking and advocating. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember White. Thank you so much to this panel. Mr. Gabriel, first off, like the art, I don't know if everybody can see it, is incredible. But I want to drill down on a couple of things that you said. So you said that when you went to Paul, that's when you started learning faces. Oh, you turn your mic on. Just hit the button. There you go. Okay, thank you. So, yeah, uh, when I went to Paul... Uh, I, I remember this very clearly. It was my first time going to art class there. I just got reassigned or something, and she was teaching how to do, how to draw a nose. And it's like, I just picked up immediately. Like, the first day I was looking just as good as the teacher, so I was just fell in love with it. <laughs> so you were like, oh, okay, I can do this. Mm -hmm. Do you think of art as a therapy, a form of therapy for you, like an outlet? When I want it to be, I guess. Not all the times. It just it, it depends. But it, it definitely helps me cope. Mm -hmm. If you had more art opportunities, so like let's say if there was a full-blown art program at Paul that you were able to apply and getting to Ellington and then develop your art even further, do you feel like that might have changed the trajectory? If I had any like program that like, a, like that I felt like could like really, not even that I felt, if I had any program that had to do with art, then I would have took that opportunity. I didn't have nothing for real. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony and, and for being here. Um, no problem. Miss Deming, you know, I think what you brought up is a incredible point um, around how domestic violence interplays with overall violence, but also trauma and behavioral health and those pieces and the statistics that you outline, um, not just for adults, but also for kids, our young people who are facing it. And I even know um, we have a hearing tomorrow. The health committee has a hearing tomorrow on maternal health. And when you look at the maternal mortality numbers for the district, a, a number of the um, deaths or pregnancy associated deaths weren't hospital based. It was violent, like domestic situations outside that led to not only a cause of a death of the mother, but also of a child. Um, one of the things, and I think somebody else uh, earlier talked about um, a generation that, uh, I think this was Mr. Barnes, that we have a generation that doesn't um, know how to use communication to solve conflict. What would you say is a suggestion around how we help with this, right? It, it, it's not, I, I think it's a form of behavioral health, communicating. How do you communicate about your emotions and those kinds of things? We teach consent, sort of, but what other things would help to foster healthy relationships around communicating? Yes, thank you for the question. Um, and domestic violence is the leading cause of maternal mortality. It's more than the top three leading obstetric causes. Um, the what we know about conflict resolution and those types of of interventions that were were discussed earlier um, is that if those are not specific to intimate partner relationships, um, then we may be developing skills so folks can have a job, which is great. They can get through school, which is great. 
might see a little bit of a decrease in community-based violence that's not domestic violence related. We do not see any of that transfer into that interpersonal space. Hmm. Um, and so unless we have programming that is really specific to how are you relating to people that you are intimate with in your family, in your safe space, in your home, right? And those kinds of relationships, um, then we're not going to address those root causes that spill out into broader community-based violence that lead to uh, rising death rates of, of teen girls often, suicide rates of domestic violence abusers, um, and familicide. Um, and so there are programs. We have a program um, that we've got developed for school. It goes all the way down K to five. Um, there's no DC funding for that. Mm. There's a tiny bit of CDC funding. Um, and even I think uh, our budget platform asks for $400,000. I think 250,000 of that would go directly to this kind of a program to expand to hundreds more students mm -hmm. so that they can work on those communication skills, um, those uh, interpersonal relationship skills uh, that really make a difference on that domestic and dating violence front that does go out, right? So that does then go outward to prevent other forms of related violence. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. We'll follow up on, on thank that. You. Um, Ms. Kimator and Ms. Hernandez, thank you so much for your testimony. I was talking earlier with the students around like, what do we do for middle and high school students? And I think your testimony sort of underscore um, the lack of programming. What do your kids do after school? Do they... Are there clubs at their middle school? Um, they're middle school, so they're not going to a job, depending on their age. So what what is the after school like for them? For my children's school, after school, is uh, we are playing basketball, soccer ball, and nothing else. And, and nothing else. Okay, Ms. Hernandez? Yeah, my daughter, she, after school, um, she attends tutoring uh, mm -hmm. because we don't afford to pay after, after uh, clubs after, after school. So she decided to attend the tutoring and the classes she needs help. So that's what that's she does after school. Three thirty-five, she finishes school, and then three forty, she starts the tutoring. Okay. And then, uh, like five thirty, five forty-five, going home, and I have to pick her, pick her up because it's at that time it's dark already. So right, I, this is not safe for her. Okay. Yes. Um. Thank you. Thank you so much for for all of you being here. Um. We know that after school programs is definitely a, a topic of conversation, you know, like what do we do in that in between window, but thank you so much for your testimony. All right. Oh, yeah. All right. Uh, Buchera Samai, Isabel Tovar, uh, George Menembrimbro, Mena Bernino, I'm sorry, uh, and Roger Marmet. Okay. Ms. Samai, when you're ready. And good afternoon, council members. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Bushar Smai. I am a Ward 4 resident student at Prias Public Charter School and mother of middle schooler. On our daily walk to school, my daughter and I have been smelling marijuana. The smell has gotten so bad that instead of wearing our mask because of COVID, we wear them to prevent us from getting a contact high. To our surprise, the smell is coming from children in middle school, little girls and boys vaping before class and staying outside the school, even after class has already begun. This is not okay. As a community, we will not accept this. 
These are well, children whose brain are still developing and they have access to vapes and marijuana at such a young age. At this rate, they will be addicted by the time they go in into high school, lowering the graduation rate. Our youth need options and role models to aspire to, role models that will allow them to see how damaging vaping and smoking at their age truly is. We need programs that can get our youth excited for university and life with no addictions, providing more affordable or free after school clubs or services that our teens can participate in will be of great benefit to their lives and community. Please invest in our youth and their undiscovered potential. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. Ms. Tovar? Good afternoon, council members. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Isabel Tovar. I am a one, one resident a student at Bria Public Charter School and mother of a preteen boy. Mental health is something so important, but not always addressed. It could be because of lack of resources, shame, or fear, among other factors. Most of us know the pressure teenagers face from their peers to feel relevant in and out of school. Some teens try substances, stealing or fighting to fit in. It is not ideal, but unfortunately, some teenagers get caught up in this unhealthy mentality. Offering mental health support at the school to our teens can help prevent many tragedies. An alternative and or addiction to mental uh, health support can be physical activity. It is scientifically proven physical activity is a great for benefit to mental health. As a community, we have the responsibility to come up with prevent, uh, preventative options for our teams, a space for positive, impactful work that will steer our teams in a direction of a healthy lifestyle. It is an investment to the future of the individual as well as an opportunity and a family life. Insufficient physical activity can lead to chronic illness as well as mental health disease, which is why we ask you to offer more public space for physical activities, large capacity for rec centers to house activities for more community members without empty our bank accounts, providing free outdoor gyms or recreation centers throughout the city can help it is incentivizing our team to seek good habits now that the that, that now that will reap reward in the community in years to come. Enough teens have lost their lives for being on the street when when they could have had been a community center learning something or even exercising. Let's not lose any more children. Let our community be a place that will protect our kids, no harm than them. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Mr. Member. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Henderson, Chairwoman Pinto, Chair, Chairman White. Thank you for the opportunity to address this joint committee today. My name is Jorge Membreño. I'm the Director of Youth Advocacy at DC Action. I'm here to testify about the importance of embedded and mobile mental health services that meet the needs of youth experiencing homelessness and how our DC government agencies are failing our youth. As a social worker, therapist, and having worked as a provider for most of my career, I know firsthand how significant that impact is for our young people when they have mental health services available to them. Unfortunately, the systems we currently have in place are failing our youth. To give you a concrete example, I'll share the tragic details of a recent incident. On Friday, December 1st, one of our young people was murdered at Zoe's Doors, an incredible drop-in center for youth experiencing housing instability and experiencing homelessness. Janet, the executive director and her team do an impeccable job of providing a space for youth to come as they are and receive support services. Early evening that Friday, they observed an argument between three young people. 
They intervened as they're trained to do, but unfortunately, in the ensuing argument, a gun was drawn and one of the young people was murdered. The suspect fled the scene. One of the staff members was also injured in trying to stop the scuffle, and they have a few broken bones in their hand. It should go without saying that staff and youth who utilize Zoe's door services have experienced a great deal of trauma, and they fear returning to the space. In order to take care of the staff, Zoe's doors uh, has remained closed until security measures are in place. And that could be a security guard, it could be more mental health services, it could be a magnetometer. As an organization that's funded by DHS, Janet believed that she could reach out to them for support. Um, unfortunately, she was met with no. Uh, DHS has said that they cannot fund security measures or provide extra funding for support services. I'll also add that DHS asked that all press inquiries are funneled to them. So they have effectively stifled their support and their voice. As of this week, DHS has also asked youth homeless providers to look at where they can cut funding. That's all on the heels of a tragic incident that occurred. Zoe's Doors also requested that DBH send a grief support team in order to provide counseling to youth and staff. They were told that DBH was at capacity, not their fault, just the need in the city. I can't stress enough how much our youth homelessness system needs more mental health services, not just embedded in each program, specifically our drop-in centers and extended transitional housing, but traveling mental health services that can meet that can meet youth where they are. The district spends approximately 600 per day, 18,000 per month, and 220,000 to incarcerate a single young person. That's the salary of two licensed clinicians and a social worker that can meet with hundreds of people. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Marmet. No goal, no strategy, no leadership. You've heard a lot of that today from many of the panelists. And on this grim winter day where public safety and violent crime have played a leading role in all of our sense of abandonment in Gallery Place and beyond, uh, it's a day where we can't give up because public safety and reducing violent crime and serving the needs of every vulnerable and at-risk individual is what it will take for the city to rebuild. But to do that, we have to reinvent. My son, Tom, was killed at 22 years of age. He was born here in D.C., just as I was, and at his first job out of college, driving back from So Others Might Eat, he was killed when a bullet entered his car window. But the real story I want you to focus on is Tom's killer also 22 years old, also born in D.C. His mom died at five. His dad died at 12. He was abused in foster care. He dropped out of school. He was with DYRS three times and at 22 also incarcerated as an adult. When he came home, we failed him. I failed him because I'm from here. This is not government alone. You, you asked a really good question. How do we operationalize what we need? You've heard the answers. To address trauma, we need to change behavior. We need to meet people where they are, uh, geographically and mentally. I didn't flee to Alexandria after my son was killed. I founded Peace for DC, where we launched the DC Peace Academy. And so far we have trained over 120 violence interrupters on cognitive behavioral theory, a uh, launched in Mass General by an organization called ROCA, CBT for the field, if you will, boils down to helping individuals at the highest risk of violence, who we already know in the neighborhoods, uh, regulate their emotions and begin to uh, go out of the life of trauma in their limbic system and regulate their emotions. I urge the council today to help us privately funded and others who are funded through the city reinvent the system to reach every individual we need to with specificity and intensity and set a goal right now of where we want to be five years from now. We can do it. It gives me hope every day if we go deeper and and meet people where they are with the kind of care that they need. Thank you, Councilman. 
Thank you. Um, thank you so much to this panel. Uh, Mr. Marmet, this obviously is not the first time that you have testified and always appreciate um, your outlook on things that we can certainly change this with, with elbow grease. Uh, we have to continuously um, work on it, on those issues. Um, Mr. Bermembro, um, thank you for your testimony. I uh, obviously am troubled by the story that you told in terms of um, the drop-in center and, and, and what happened there. Um, it's all kind of connected in a variety of different ways. So the issues that you've talked about in terms of security there, <clears throat> at a meeting earlier this fall with Catholic Charities, they had a similar um, situation around lack of security at some of their low barrier shelters. <clears throat> and they're concerned that something is going to happen. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And then also going back to, they reach out for help and support around grief and trauma and then um, like others, right. Having to sort of navigate the system on their, on their own. Um, you know, we had a situation in um, in ward five with uh, childcare workers and students there, and they asked for assistance from the city. Um, we sent juvenile behavioral health specialists to help with the adults at that point, um, which it was like, no, that was the opposite thing. And so I, I called the Went Center and was like, hi, love you guys, love your work. I need some bilingual counselors. They actually they happen to have funding to be able to deploy folks immediately. And it's kind of like, I wish it wasn't a system where you have to know somebody to know somebody to know to, oh, hey, this is an organization that you can call and they already have funding that's sort of set aside for this one available thing. And so I think when we think about the continuums of supports, it's not just schools, it's also all of our other social services um, places as well. I don't know if you wanted to say anything more about the experience there. <clears throat> sure. So I think um, the tough part about this is not, this wasn't their first request for help, like you were just saying. I mean, they had been requesting more funding for mental health supports. That's not to line the organization's pocket. That's just to support young people. And that's across the board. That's just Zoe's doors. Every program I have worked with in the last few years of my career in youth homelessness has been asking for more funding for mental health supports because we know that the increase in mental health needs has grown as we have implemented more housing opportunities. Extended transitional housing was born out of a six-year idea to, to have folks for a little bit longer because they needed a longer runway because of potentially more needs, more touch points for mental health services. And so hearing that and then hearing that this week that they're also looking for cuts is just disgraceful to me. It's the system itself and DHS operates in a way that becomes very paternalistic, but in the same way, when then you reach out to your parent for support and they say no, I'm like, no, thank you then. No, no regulation for me. Yeah, no. Uh, I had a long hearing on on DHS before. DHS is not in my is not in, under the Committee of Health, but we have uh, a part of it because they are responsible for doing Medicaid renewals and then also our work around food access and security, they have SNAP. So all the things you're saying, around, I hear you, we, we chronically underfund, chronically underfund our public social safety net to a point where it's really, really hard when someone needs to tap into it for it to work the way it's supposed to. Um, but thank you so much for your testimony for being here. Uh, Ms. Tovar and Ms. Samai, thank you so much for being here and your testimony as well. Um, I feel like when we're talking about the conversations of youth and behavioral health, it's important to have parent voice at the table in the conversation. Um, and, you know, we don't have, <laughs> can't bring every eight, like I love bringing multiple agencies to the table. Unfortunately, we don't have the schools here because I feel like they're now part of the conversation um, around some of this. And so we'll bring up some of these um, in, in further conversations with them. But I hear you all around, you know, what does, safe spaces look like, particularly around the preteen, teen um, age group, um, which I think is often lost when we talk about out-of-school time. Usually it's, we're hearing from a lot of parents in the pre-K through the five space, but this is an important area as well. And um, I introduced uh, legislation this summer that was doing like a middle school pilot program. It was like a mini SYEP, but for middle school students, 
um, which is hard because I have like 13 year olds who think that they should be earning money to contribute to the household. And I'm like, but labor laws, you just supposed to be a kid. Like <laughs> you actually legally cannot work. None of our businesses could legally hire you, um, you know, for, for part-time or full-time employment. And so we're trying to figure out how do we give you opportunities to earn a little, I don't know. We, we used to call it allowance, but I guess pocket change works too, to be able to, so you don't have to turn to other types of activities just to survive. But thank you so much for your time and for being here. Okay, we're gonna go to our last public witness panel for in-person and then we're gonna switch to virtual just so people know, uh, cause we've been going for a minute. So we're probably gonna take a five minute break as we transition. Hold, hold on. Uh, so here's what I'm gonna say. I have four more people on my list. Now there were probably somebody in this room who didn't sign up or you sign up virtually and then you're here in person. All right. Okay, so I'm gonna call the four that I have and then we're gonna go and then we're gonna try to work it out. Great, okay. So I have Allie Bonnie. Is Allie here? No, okay. Uh, Warren Young. All right, we got one. Uh, Michelle Chapman. Okay, got two. Um, and then I have Asaya Timoney. All right, I got three. Okay. You wanted to testify, sir? Okay, hold on. Okay, got you. Number 26 on the list. Uh, we got you. Just come on to the table. Okay. Anyone else? Yes. All right. I only have four seats, but we can make it work <laughs> if everybody can scoot, scoot. Sure. Okay, so after after you testify, sir, why don't y'all switch seats and then y'all can all be together for questions. How about, does that work? Okay, great, all right. So, uh, Mr. Warren. Yes, uh, I wanna thank you. First, giving praise to my God for being here. Uh, we cannot have any peace until our God is seated at the head of the conference table. I sit through this, hearing and I heard a lot of things, but everything was over my head. Statistic this, statistic that. Don't look out the door. It's real out there. I can't even go to the ATM machine. My mother can't come from the Safeway. What are we going to do about that and changing? We don't need any new laws and the uh, National Guard. We need to implement the laws we have. Those of you that are responsible for those laws, implement them. You don't need anything new. You don't need no new pants. You dress very well. You are the purse string. You are the purse strings. I mean, I can't have at one o'clock. I haven't missed a beat. Chairpersons and what have you were not a stepped out for them and they had other interests. This thing is real. Two people was killed right up there where I work at last night. You could be killed. I could be killed. And it's okay. We come here in this closed room and ask for more money, more money, more money, more money. To do what? Without going any further, I want to thank y'all for passing the IRA bill. I am a member of that bill. I did some 43 years. And the men from IRA that y'all released are on the ball. They're the change makers. They go to work, they pay taxes, and they can make a change. This isn't going to make a change. Everybody's asking for money for what? I've been out here 11 months, very little. But I ran a program called PNP in the prison system, people needing people. Those guys still call me for prayer from jail. The men that's made it out still call me. What do you think, Mr. Young? And I'm giving glory to my God and Savior. I thank y'all for sharing, letting me share. Thank you. A year back. <laughs> I wouldn't wait. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Young. Dr. Chapman. Good afternoon. 
My name is Dr. Michelle C. Chapman, and I'm honored to give testimony today. The views I express are that of my own and not of the University of the District of Columbia, where I proudly serve as an associate professor in the Crime Justice and Security Studies program. I grew up in the neighborhoods of DC, and I'm an advocate for the well being of our city's youth and families, driven by personal experiences with the devastating impact of violence. In 1993, just a few weeks after graduating from UDC, I lost my brother, Abdullah Coghill, at the age of 17 years old to uh, gun violence. This profound loss become the became the catalyst for my enduring commitment to education and global youth development spanning now 30 years. Amidst the troubling surge in youth violence we've seen in recent months, I'm encouraged by the collective efforts underway currently uh, throughout the city and also the initiatives we're leading at UDC. In 2022, we launched a violence prevention and community wellness certificate program, a four week hybrid uh, delivery model that offers high quality instruction and evidence-based and experientially focused curriculum. So far we've trained 53 credible messengers, violence interrupters and other professionals from across the district. The post-training survey data are promising. 100% of respondents felt that their job performance would improve as a result of the training. 92% found the content relevant to their work as violent interventionists. And 80% deemed the training a highly valuable experience they'd recommend to others. As the new director of this initiative, I'm committed to assessing its impact and expanding its scope as our aim is to bolster the capacity of city stakeholders, parents, and youth themselves in creating a culture of health and thriving in DC. Since 2018, we've collaborated with various entities to support holistic youth development through mindfulness, adolescent brain development, education, restorative justice, college and career readiness. We contributed to a number of initiative, uh, contributed to a number of initiatives, uh, SYP, DPR, high schools, and so forth. And these efforts will expand through our applied research laboratories, the Mindfulness and Courageous Action Lab and the Interdisciplinary Research Lab. Violence prevention and best practices uh, research informs us that fostering safe communities requires a comprehensive multi-sectoral approach. Our young people are um, struggling in an ecosystem of poverty, youth criminalization and neighborhood disinvestment. As the city mobilizes resources to combat youth violence, UDC stands as a steadfast partner. Our diverse faculty in the Crime Justice and Security Studies program are ready to collaborate, contribute expertise, and work hand in hand with the city to address this pressing issue and bring healing for our communities. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Asaya? Good afternoon. Oh. Um, if, um, Sorry, Mr. Charles, there we go. All right. <laughs> no, it wasn't you. It's okay, we took care of it. Okay. It was your mic was on. Go ahead. Good afternoon. My name is Asia Tamimi. I'm born and, born and raised Washingtonian, a mother of three. All three of my sons are victims of gun violence here in DC. My youngest son was shot two years ago, six weeks after my husband was murdered. He is paralyzed and an artist as well as the young man we just saw here today. Um, I run an organization here in D.C. called Rock Now. Rehabilitating our community is key now. And I have to tell you, if you want to know how to be effective in stopping this violence, you have to put your foot, your boots on the ground. You have to get out there and speak with the youth, speak with the young men and women in the community and find out exactly what they need, exactly what's going on. Me running my organization, which is a life skills program for adults, I was able to sit with young men and find out there were literacy issues. A lot of them sat in my class, they were high, but they were high because they were pacifying the pain of the mental issues they're dealing with with seeing their homies murdered in front of them. A lot of times they're the first ones, first responders on the scene. So they see this person who they've grown up with since childhood laying on the ground. And I hate to be explicit, but with their brains laying beside them. So this is something that they have to deal with. So you're dealing with a lot, a lot of youth who've lost their brothers, their sisters to gun violence. So now they're growing up with the responsibility of trying to be the man of the house because the mom is out working two and three jobs, you know? So with my organization, I'm helping these young men who have never been on an interview how to master an interview, how to go out there and have that confidence to get a job, 
My son was in a hospital last month and he was in a hospital for 14 days. He actually coded. Um, while I was there, I saw one of my students who happened to be attacked at the hospital. And he said, Ma, I used everything that you taught me in class to get this job. And I got it just like that. And it's my first job. And it made me feel like, okay, if people just had that love and that sincerity, that trust, you have to obtain that trust with them. They have to know that you really, really care. Just to get out there and show them that you care and to offer what you have, the, 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 it could be the smallest thing, just kindness, you know, a positive word. It goes a long way with a lot of these youth. You never know what they're dealing with in the home. And I hate to say it, but our government has failed a lot of our youth. When you have kids who are dying in stolen cars, who have boxes on their legs, who's following these kids? Somebody should have been tracking that box. It should have never been dead. You know, I don't understand it. We're, we're losing our youth. And then they say it takes a village to raise a child. What if the village is toxic? What do we do? Thank you. Mr. Charles? Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jamal Childs. Uh, I'm a recent returning citizen. Uh, I was released September 12, 2022, 2022 after, after serving 25 and a half years in prison. Uh, I, was, I was incarcerated at the age of 21 uh, for a violent crime. Uh, my development got arrested so around probably when I was like 13, 14, uh, seventh grade dropout. Can't remember a teacher name besides for my sixth grade teacher, Mr. Clyburn, because I don't didn't have any. Um, uh, I'm self-educated from while I was incarceration, while I was incarcerated. Uh, I, I knew that I had to make some type of serious 180 or, or, you know, I would end up back in a place like this. Uh, all, all praise due to the creator that I was finally released under the IRA. And, uh, I, after me being 15, home 15 months as of yesterday, you know, um, I've spoke at several of these hearings. And one thing I keep hearing is statistics and percentages and programs and things of that nature. And I don't really believe that nobody collectively is taking our problem as dire as it needs to be taken because individually nothing can be accomplished. One thing I don't see is a synergistic effort to try to come back, you know, this juvenile crime, uh, poverty stricken families, uh, parent, parental accountability, uh, uh, anything. I mean, any anything that's plaguing our communities is not being done collectively. You know, uh, I, I, unfortunately, I have the intelligence to tackle this problem, but also I don't have the education to tackle this problem. However, individuals like yourselves do. And there's many individuals like myself that got released on the IRA Act that's willing and able to assist these youth out here right now, but they're not being utilized. I've reached out to many people, many council members, many programs and organ, organ, organizations, but it seemed like we only utilized to further their initiative, further their motive. Uh, we are suffering from an epidemic of violence, hate, self-hate, abuse, and it's been going on multiple generations. This is a this is a community problem. This is a society problem. This is an illness of society that we're suffering from that for some reason we don't want to say, look, the gloves are off. We need to start getting at this. They're locking up our children. And is everybody going to be selfish to just not include their own children because they made it? They got a good government job or they got some type of success because they're locking up our children. This is not just happening in Washington, D.C. Look on the news and local news in Baltimore. Look at in Atlanta. They're saying the same thing. We need to do something about these juveniles. It's no coincidence that they released all the elders out of prison all of a sudden. When I left my institution, three units was closed. It wasn't enough inmates. So all of a sudden, a year later, they're calling on heavier laws to lock up our youth and charge them as adults so they can spend the next 20, 25 years filling up their plantations. So I asked the council, 
Is DC one of their plantations for the federal penitentiary? Are we gonna we're gonna supply our kids to the federal penitentiaries? Because that's where they're going. It's no rehabilitation in those places. It's no education. I educated myself. Sitting up with a with a small handheld light in the middle of the night, reading book after book. The problem is that we have to look at ourselves and hold ourselves accountable because we failed. Every time I see somebody hurt, every family member that I've lost, and I've lost all of them while I was incarcerated, I felt responsible for that. So I sit right here in front of you all today to tell you that we have to act collectively. When you hear people get up here and they have these organizations, their names and the organizations should be recorded down and it should be some type of wire to wire pipeline where we can all connect together. We talk about these rec centers that's closing. They're closing because they're, they're, they're relics. The same things in the rec centers was in there when I was a kid. The same exact thing. Nobody playing no fool's ball no more. When last time you seen somebody play foosball, ping pong table? Seriously. I mean, seriously, who, who plays? What about a TikTok corner? You know, they, what the kids are into. This is why they're empty. This is why they close them down, because they say ain't nobody in them. But there's nobody in them because no, it's, it's, it's no concern. It's, it's nothing being added to make them stronger, to make them relevant. If we need to see, if we need or we want tangible change, we can't just want, we have to try because we all know nothing beats a failure but a try. Unfortunately, I know I'm over my limit. Unfortunately, but when I, when I get up here to speak, it just, it just I stopped what I was doing today to come here. I was on for all that and I said, now I need to come here for this. And I'll close with this. I started a program when I connected with my nine-year-old cousin, which is a, my cousin's cousins, and my cousin's daughter's son. He made it to 21 from me sharing letters with him, talking to him on the phone. Uh, he went into the Army, and now he works for the National Guard. He's a gun specialist. He works over at the D.C. Armory, and he sometimes goes abroad. He never committed a crime. Do I uh, claim responsibility for that? For not? Nah. But we have a connection that I only met him at the age of nine one time in public, in person. And I used to send him emails over the thing. And, and I used to always say to him, love you like you're my own. And, you know, I started putting it as an acronym, la la mo, la la mo, la la mo. And he one time responded and said, because what la la mo mean? I said, love you like you're my own. Because I know your father ain't in your life. I know you don't have a man in your life to actually care for you and want to see you succeed. Most of our youth don't even know what success is. They think success is not getting killed. Of ki it's killing the other person before they get killed. They think they're successful. They think they're successful when they, they finish a pack on a corner and don't get locked up. They, that's what they consider success. Arrested development is when you make $2,000 at the age of 13. And then 14, they ask you to sign up for a summer job where you make $200 in a week and you made $2,000 in a day. Thank you. It takes us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, all right, we have one more. Do you mind switching? Sure. Mr. Can you just say your name for the record before you start? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Javon Oliver. I'm the executive director for the Olive Tree One Care uh, LLC. We're a group of professional counselors, therapists, social workers, and marriage and family therapists who operate under DC 1115 waiver, the Behavioral Health Transformation Waiver Authority Transmittal from DHCF 1925. Olive Tree One Care is a registered LLC in Washington, D.C. We accept D.C. Medicaid, and we're contracted with uh, four D.C. MCOs. We found out there's another one, HSCSN. And we also accept several uh, commercial health insurances. I want to present D.C. government with the opportunity to be the nation's best innovative behavioral health system. 
During the pandemic, the world learned a new way to take on new challenges. Companies like Uber Eats, Uber Health, and DoorDash begin to look at the elderly and those who are affected with COVID, and they begin to build the bridge of IT to bring services across the social distancing gap and into people's homes. Healthcare wasn't far behind either, because during the pandemic, I was serving as the behavioral health coordinator at Department of Healthcare Finance. And we created telehealth policy that allows the use of behavioral health therapy and services to be delivered across the world of various health information technology formats. And now we could utilize that technology to address the immediate need for the Department of Juvenile Justice reform. As a result of the pandemic, many people changed the ways that they work and telehealth has become a routine way to access healthcare. At Olive Tree One Care, we found a way to use the telehealth to meet these needs. And um, I just want to look at my time real quick. Uh, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer questions as it regards, uh, as it pertains to this tablet. And I want to tell you a little bit about this uh, if I have the chance. Um, but I really wanted to dive into uh, DYRS um, in November 21. They submitted uh, to city council their strategic plan 2025. Um, and they have three uh, primary goals for behavioral health. And uh, they're found on pages 20, 35, uh, 20 through 35. Um, goal number one, they want to increase the district agencies providing services that are developmentally appropriate to provide trauma-informed and healing-centered restorative care. Um, that's on page 20. The district needs to increase community-based programming services uh, on page 35. Um, and currently there's partners to support. I know that I'm over my time. Um, but I do. I did submit my uh, testimony online. I did it late, um, as well as I submitted it to, to you, Marcia, just so we could make sure that we have it. Um, but we do have um, uh, many different ways that we could intervene at Olive uh, Tree One Care. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember White. Yeah, I'll yield some of my time, Mr. Oliver, to tell us a little about that pad, real quick. So part of the challenge that we note um, and delivering behavioral health therapy um, is, uh, well, um, telehealth therapy is uh, many persons who are uh, impoverished or on the other side of the poverty line don't have access to tablets like these. I went to Walmart, $39 to $59, and I got one of these tablets. I downloaded uh, the DC app that has uh, the access to Medicare, Medicaid, uh, the one app and um, other things that uh, is very useful in the district. It also helps us solve another problem that we have, a Department of Healthcare Finance would tell you, that we have a lapse for people who's losing Medicaid coverage. And with this device that I purchased, um, and I'm already experimenting it, uh, with it right now with our uh, clients that we're seeing, um, and we download all, the, all of the stuff that they need for the telehealth session on here, um, I just purchased an electronic health record with my own money um, to start our um, telehealth practice. So there's plenty of opportunities and ways that we could intervene. And you have investors um, as well as uh, group practices such as myself that are looking to come into the district and provide services. Got and you. I got to cut you off because I got to sure. thank you. I mm -hmm. take all the time. <laughs> um. I want to, Dr. Chapman, I'm very interested in UDC's uh, collaboration with our violence prevention programs. Uh, one of the reasons for this is that, as the mother said, that we have to get on the ground in the, in violence prevention. Um, and UDC is positioned easy to integrate being the, the different buildings across the city that you all occupy. Someone support that work and figure out what we can do to work work with that. I just said UDC three weeks ago for a group of youth from Anacostia doing a presentation there. And it was it was beautiful. Um, uh, Miss Mother Tamimi, I appreciate your work you've done. Um, I've been to some of your sessions with the young men in the community. It's been phenomenal, just so they can get some someone to hear, to hear them and see them emotional and crying. Some of these guys, the hardcore, yeah. you know, you're able to just 
listen and then uh, provide them opportunity see you all golfing. Mm-hmm. I have a youth uh, golf team. Yeah. And I just opened up my life skills program to the youth now. So I have one that I'm doing with the youth. And I find that a lot of our young men and women are hardened. So what I'm going to be doing with them is we're going to be preparing packages for the homeless. And we're going to be getting gifts and teddy bears for the kids who are suffering with cancer at Children's Hospital. Yeah, I think one of the things that uh, I've seen from the work you're doing is trying to get them employed. I know we worked to get one of the young men, I'm going to say his name, Mm -hmm. employed two weeks ago. And I hope he did well. And I talked to him about doing well just last week. Um, I have have quite a few of them that I took... um, they wanted to do the CDL program, but they okay. didn't even have a learner. So I took them to DMV and got them their learners. And, you know, I said, you got to crawl before you walk. But nobody's been there to do that. Nobody has ever put anything positive into them. So this is what, what I'm trying to do with them. Got you. I want to, I'm going to short on time, Mr. Childs. Um, I want to thank you for your, for your brilliance and your honesty. Um, and just one of the things you said, you said no one is taking this seriously. And I, and I've been ringing the bell for this for quite some time because I, I look at all the resources, time and energy we put into the pandemic. We used to do phone calls and meetings on Fridays. You know, it was a lot. Um, and I don't think we're doing this to address the critical issues of people of color in the district, especially around gun violence. Um, and so I agree with you on that. One thing I disagree with is that you, you said I don't have the education. You said I have I don't have the education. I have the intelligence. And I disagree on that. I think you have the education. Because there's life experiences that you say those of us with degrees or education have that overqualifies you to serve this population. And I work with a lot of our guys. I do a program over the jail at one o'clock on Fridays. You're welcome to join us. We also just two weeks ago started a program inside of DYRS uh, on Tuesdays and Wednesday night. I'm not sure when the last or next one is before you leave. Make sure you get my contact information because I know you said you have a program. You didn't say the name of it and what it do. I was waiting for that. But uh, I think that we have to get more people who uh, in front of these young people that they're going to listen to and that they respect to show them that that you don't have to do 25 years and just come home trying to figure it out that we have to value. I believe that the solution is in the problem. So if you was a problem, you need to be part of the solution. And my mother, mother Tamimi have been integral in doing that in her community. And we have to expand that. Um, In closing, um, I'm looking forward to working with council member Pinto to expand what we're doing with our our 2.0 because I think that's critical and allowing guys who went to jail when you were how old were you 17 21 so I'm sorry it's 21 and just come back home and there, there are thousands of them spread throughout the nation that are from DC that's disconnected from their family and as you talked about your family you lost a lot of your friends and family along the way and we could do more to really rehab those individuals and bring them back home to help them be an asset to the district because the solution is really in the problem. Uh, so I want to thank you all you guys for testifying today and speaking today. It's very vibrant information that we just can't hear. But like you said, we got to be serious and act on it. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember White. Um, thank you so much to this panel of witnesses and um, for well being here and testifying and sharing um, both uh, Mr. Young and um, and Mr. Childs sharing your experiences. Um, I want to ask something of this panel that I asked, I think on the first panel. If you had to pick one thing that we need to do right now, just one right now, what would it be? Don't wait on the change, be the change. Okay. Invest the million dollars in youth services, job training, education. Um, and, and remember that UDC is here in the city. I've heard collaboration and work with Howard University, Georgetown. We are the city's public four-year institution. Mm-hmm. And uh, our, our, a lot of our students come from the community. So an investment in our students is an investment in the city. Okay. Curtail the, the community beefs. Curtail the community beefs. Yeah, have somebody in, like... I'm working in my community, but nobody's working in the community that's beefing with my community. And then you have a community two blocks down the street that's beefing with my community. So, you know, if I if I can get them a job, a lot of the jobs are right there in the community, but they can't work them for fear that somebody's going to see them outside working construction and kill them. I mean, we had four homicides in two weeks one time. So, I mean, and we had a, a mass shooting and, and it was like a, a shooting every week, like two and three people. Mr. Oliver. So we 
we're aware of what the challenges are. We're aware of what the issues are. We haven't really seen an action plan that describes that. And that we have the annual reports. We have a whole bunch of documents. We have communities that come together. Let's bring ourselves together in a format to where as we sit down and start working on it instead of talking about it. Okay. Just, I'm sorry, instead of just talking about it. Mr. Charles? Like I said, you all, as the council members, actually with these programs, Ms. Chapman, I would love to speak to you after this as well. And like that's, I mean, that's that's dedicated to seeing this thing through. Like you know, like like uh, like uh, Mr. Warren said, we need boots on the ground. You know, some people are just not you know uh, fit to to be there. I, to be yeah, there. I know. We're fit with confidence, and that's that's what I think. I just it needs to be more collective. If we're going to give you, if we seriously trying to tackle this thing, everybody has to, you know, constantly be in contact with one another. And when, and when meetings are held, not like this, more informal, mm -hmm. you know, where we can communicate with one another and, and really start trying to get some tangible results. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I, I want to say like, um, we have these oversight hearings to check in with agencies because council members, we appropriate money. We make legislation, Mr. Young, you said, implement the laws we already have. Right. But what I'm saying is, from our perspective, our agencies are the ones who are supposed to be granting to organizations on the ground, um, doing the hands-on work. Um, you know, I think Councilman Bright had a hearing before I was questioning the DORS director about why has your medical director position been vacant for over a year? How do you not have enough behavioral health supports when you have X number of young people at YSC who are on psychotropic medications? Who was checking in to make sure, right? So that's kind of, that's also important as well. And um, also we invest a lot of money as council member White said, we got a lot of money in this city and yet we're not seeing the needle move in the way that other cities are seeing the needles move. And so- it's incumbent upon us as a legislature to interrogate what is not working and to push the executive to shift where it needs to be. Oh, you're on that. We have some people at this table that can make the change. These uh, young people here as well, and the brother that I've served time with, these men are dynamite. Y'all let us out, they haven't stopped moving yet. Oh, look. They haven't stopped moving yet. Every person who's been an IRA recipient who's come and we testify. Thank, we thank God for you. Have been incredible in terms of the work that they have been doing in terms of giving back to the to the community. Um, I, I want to ask one question, and I, I know I'm about to be over my time, but you talked about the community beefs. It seems to me that sometimes the beefs are generational and that Sometimes the kids don't even know why it all started. Well, it, it, there has been a beef that's been going on now for, I know, since 2020. And it started with MPD, uh, somebody who's working with MPD. They put out a note, uh, a letter that they had incarcerated such and such person for the homicide of such and such person. They didn't know, the family didn't know that this is the person who committed the crime. So the neighborhood, when they found out, this person don't even live up W Street anymore. They moved from there a long time ago, like maybe about a year and a half ago. But what they did was they came up to W Street, shot up the parking lot two weeks straight, killed one girl, shot her in the head twice, killed one of the guys in the community who was a sweetheart shot and killed him, and this has put blood on the ground. So now you have this community beefing because you killed my brother, that community is beefing because you killed my sister, so it's going on and on. And I asked them, what can we do to stop this beef? And they're like, mom, it's too much blood on the ground. I said, but when you go to prison, you become homies. So why can't you all squash this beef now? You know, so, but this is what starts it. It's not just generational. Now it's because so-and-so has killed so-and-so. So-and-so has offended so-and-so 
in the drill music on, you know, the internet, stupid stuff, you know, and exactly. innocent people are being- So is it like communication interpersonal? I'm, you know, we could talk all day about the folks at DRS and YSC, but at that point, I'm not saying it's too late, but I want to prevent you even getting there. Yep. And so as we talk about the behavioral health side of things, some of what you're talking about is um, like a better way to have handled that situation in 2020 would have been MPD coming together with community organizations to share the outcomes of an investigation and then try to pr- like, well, let me, let me explain. Something maybe, or maybe not. I was at, I was at the, after I'm there at the crime scenes, usually to comfort the families when their loved ones are murdered. So I'm at the mass shooting that we had on Gahope 16th and Gahope road. And the community was, coming to me and they are saying, Ma, the police sat there and did nothing. So the trust is not there mm. with the community in, in MPD right now. So it's hard to get them together to try to, you know, solve a solution with this. We need to get somebody into so, some of those opposing communities and try to alleviate, because we got enough people in my community. You got me and about two other people working in my community. So they've pretty much kind of handled them but you have two or three other communities uh, opposite of my community who's beefing with my community. And so they're killing whoever, they don't care. You can be walking by a grandmother. You can get it too. Too many too many firearms on the streets in the hands of youth under the age of 24. The, the, the mind hasn't even gotten to a point where it can make sound decision-making until the age of 24, but you got an AR-15 in the hand of a 12, yo. I'm a firearms instructor, by the way. So this is something that I take very serious, Mm -hmm. you know? it's Councilman Boyd. Yeah, I want to say part of my hope that I thought that we, the government, was going to use those dresses was the building blocks, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, It's supposed to be an emergency declaration where we we were going to cover the over-resource 151 blocks. It's supposed to start in your community. Right. It started there and stopped there. I haven't heard much about it in two years. It's, and it, it, well, we have the highest it's amount over. of... Yes. It's over. The city of it's over. And it's, and it's been more, more homicides this year we had in the last 22 years. So mm-hmm. I don't know how it's over, but I know. Uh, I was hopeful in that, so I'll go back and... Now, Office of Gun Violence Prevention, they are the ones who have pretty much kind of helped me along the way with many grants. And I'm, I'm doing it with a mini grant. I don't have a $50,000 grant or anything like that. But I'm running three and four programs with a little bit of money that I have because it's not about the money for me. I needed to run it. Of course, yeah. I want to do that. I want to get golf clubs for the youth. You know, um, I want to, you know, offer other things, take them on trips, take them to the Harriet Tubman house and things like that. You know, open them up to other things. But, you know, um, I don't know what happened with that Uh Council member White, I don't know what happened with that, but I have been begging for somebody to get into those other communities and to do in those communities what I'm doing in mine. Because if I'm fixing my community, what good is it, you know, to help my community if they still a target? It's just not right. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you so much. I, and this is part of the questions I have for the executive. So, you know, we asked pre-hearing questions and one of the things we were checking in with the ones office was on some of these programs that was supposed to be under building blocks, like people of promise, which I'm sure you've heard of, right? It was supposed to be identifying at-risk individuals, going to give you help, you know, intensive right. support, et cetera. And my staff sends me the chart and for FY23, it has one. And I was like, is that a typo? No. One person of promise for an entire fiscal year. Wow. So we're going to ask some questions, but thank you so much again to this panel of witnesses. Thank you for all the in-person um, witnesses. We need to take a five minute break because we've been. I can run on, be on my phone. I signed up virtually. Oh, okay. I mean, no. Okay. Yep. So thank you. Thank you. We're going to hear from this one more person and then we're going to take a break and then we're going to go back for virtual. Wait, Okay, um, just what's what's your name? Oh, Tara Liebert. I'm no, I'm the second to last on the virtual. Oh, from Fremont. There you yes. go. Go ahead. Great. All right. 
Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, uh, Councilmember Henderson, um, Pinto, and Councilmember White. I'm so grateful that this is happening. I'm Tara Liebert. I'm a proud Ward 1 uh, resident and co-founder and current executive director of Free Minds Book Club and Writing Workshop, a nonprofit in D.C. that has worked with over almost 2,000 incarcerated and previously incarcerated um, youth charged as adults, as you all know, for the past 20 years. So today I'm here just to share three simple solutions and recommendations for the urgent crisis of violence in our city. We are, as you said, Chair, um, Chairman, uh, Chairwoman Henderson, we're on the back end. So once youth are charged as adults, we see them at the DC jail, we follow them in federal prison and when they're home and reentry, all, we are probably one of the only organizations to do pre-release and post-release. So we, everyone who's an IRA petitioner, IRA recipient is a member of the Free Minds Network, which is a powerful movement. We use the simple tools of bibliotherapy, and that's why I'm here today for Behavioral Health to tell you it can work. It does not have to be in a carceral setting. We've done it in um, DYRS, in homes, in schools, in shelters. It is seeing yourself on the page with relevant uh, literature, protagonists that are going through the same challenging issues that you are going through, discussing it in a group, and the healing from trauma that I have personally witnessed in 20 years is profound. My And I would love to train anyone. We have, as you said, 32% vacancy. I'm here to say that there is an easy program we can introduce right away. We can do train facilitators to be bibliotherapy um, facilitators, reading books and discussing. Second, we're part of the Arts Education Alliance. It's a new group called the Arts Institute for Creative Advancement. Right now, there's a um, graduation ceremony for youth ages 18 to 24, and we're hoping to expand it to work in technical theater. It is an incredible success. It is the creative economy. That is where we need to have employment for youth, for jobs. They were saying they're afraid going out. There are digital jobs, there are multimedia jobs. And then finally, community healing circles. Not restorative justice, but grassroots on the ground. Our IRA members are leading it, and it's working amazing for those who have committed crime, I mean, who have caused harm, and those repairs harm. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Liebert. Councilmember White, do you have any questions? I don't I don't have a question, but I do. Ms. Liebert, I want to thank you for your service. Um, I know so many people that came through Free Minds uh, that uh, you, able, you guys were able to tap into a part of them that no one able to tap into um, through poetry, through reading, through writing, um, even teaching pe people got more courage and more their self-esteem was risen because they was, they was able to express themselves in a way they've never never done before. I don't know how you do it. And I've run into you over the years, probably been 20 years. Uh, I know I don't look that old, but it's been about 10 minutes of time. Um, and I just want to say thank you for the work you're doing. Keep with the great work. Anything we can do from the council, we want to do that to keep you engaged with uh, the men and the ladies uh, who are coming home trying to figure it all out. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you. Well, it's not me. As you know, it's a network. We're a yeah. membership organization. It's only as strong as the members, the ones James, Warren, Jamal, all the members. They are connected into a, a movement. And that's the key is that they're with each other using the tools of reading and writing. It's a it's a really simple, simple, but really transformative model that I just, as you know, am championing nonstop. So thank you for your support over yeah. all the years. Thank you. Um, Ms. Lieber, a, a couple of questions for me. What age group um, do you feel like is most appropriate for bibliotherapy? What group is? Age group. Anyone. That is what is so powerful and amazing about it. And you do not have to know how to read. You don't have to have any literacy. It's literally the power of what's on the page. People can read it aloud. We work with as young as third grade. We use graphic novels. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there's a lot of therapists that use art therapy. But this bibliotherapy, there's an international association. It's you find the issue that the youth is dealing with, and you find a, a book, a literature that matches that. So whatever it is, we have many times in the book club where you don't have to talk about 
what you're going through because it's too traumatic, but you can talk about what the character is. Mm -hmm. So whether you're being molested at home or there's really horrible things happening, you can work it through what the protagonist in the book is saying. So if you have a skilled facilitator, doesn't have to be a credentialed social worker, license. It is so, it, I've seen it. Mm -hmm. How many schools years? are you guys in? What's that? How many schools? Uh, well, right now we do outreach with our poet ambassadors. So we not maybe five. I mean, it's okay. we're mostly in DYRS and the jail and our reentry book club every week. You're welcome to come. We have members home and reentry, but we've done it with um, the family shelter, CISOSA. I can give you a whole list mm -hmm. of the groups every time. But the main thing is we train librarians. They're an incredible resource. You can train anyone who loves it, who's really, you know, wants to read the book and facilitate. We can do anything. I'm just saying it's like a really good stopgap instead of like all this vacancy and all that. You can just do it right now. You have to create the safe space yeah. and the trust. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for your testimony. I really appreciate it. Um, all right. We're going to take a five minute break and then we'll be back. Thank you.
All right. And we're back. Okay, so we're gonna, we're turning to our virtual witnesses. We're going to call panels of eight. Um, and so uh, for those who haven't done hybrid hearings with us, you have to affirmatively accept our invitation to be elevated as a panelist. Um, so Brenda Lee Richardson, Gail Event, Ashley Ruff, Commissioner Ruff, Beverly Settles-Reeves, Jackie Carter, Judy Shepard-Gore, um, and Beverly Smith. All right, I only see two people. Hang on, yeah. so I'm gonna give it a second. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to call more people. Um, more May Paskashani, Sojin Kim, and Jamila White. Again, you have to accept our invitation. So when it pops up on your screen, if you hit decline, we can't uh, promote you. All right, we'll keep moving. Uh, Nura Green, Megan Chandler, and Cynthia Robbins. That's I ca I've called everyone on this page. Um, and after this, I'm just I'm going to start. So uh, Ms. Richardson, I see you. So why don't you go ahead and present your testimony? Thank you, uh, Chairman Henderson. Good day. My name is Brenda Lee Richardson. I'm a Ward 8 resident and the coordinator of the Anacostia Parks and Community Collaborative. I was astonished to learn that teenage girls are using maize and tasers to now rob people. Considering the collective trauma that our young people are intentionally or unintentionally exposed to, it is clearly a manifestation of their poor behavioral health. I am here to support more social workers in the judicial system, counselors in the schools, and family liaison therapists in the home. The social obstruction of menacing behavior has gone beyond violence interruption. Um, DC's behavioral health dilemma stems from a lack of good old community organizing and social work. There is no sense of connectedness in disinvested neighborhoods. I do want to do a shout out quickly to those folks that are working very hard at it, especially in the middle schools, the after school all stars, Miss Tut over at Washington Highlands and public housing, Right Directions, and the uh, Exodus over at Woodland and the Friends of Anacostia Park. Our beloved youth continue to be barraged with the perils of generational trauma in, our, in and outside of the home. The wholesomeness of authentic parental care, parenting with care and love, has been abandoned. Crime and violence are contributing factors to malign indoctrination of poor values and morals. Anxiety, anger, brokenness, and rage are accepted casual forms of behavior that is incredibly prevalent in disfavored communities. Can we blame young parents who do not have the proper coping and parenting skills or tools to parent and care for their children, especially after the crack epi epidemic and the pandemic? Our nation's capital has a growing population that continues to be in a state of fight or flight. The only way to address this issue is to create a sustainable form of stabilization in the home, the school, and the community. The answer right now is a massive deployment of social workers, counselors, and family liaison therapists in the judicial system, the schools, and the homes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Avant, Avant? Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Chairperson. Henderson and distinguished council member, 
My name is Gail Aitman. I'm the executive director and founder for Total Family Care. We are a family-run organization. We are a nonprofit. I'm a resident of Ward 7. Our organization is located in public housing, Potomac Garden. We've been here for nearly 20 years. So we've seen a lot. We've seen a lot when it comes to what, what happens to parents, what happens to children. So I advocate that we don't blame the parent for not understanding how to be be more effective parent, because I'm not gonna say they're not a parent, but how do we help enrich and expand their skills as parents? And that is provide parent support. And that's what I'm advocating. And here's one, one conversation, one incident I had with a family. My, my concerns is family. And one, my big concern is about how do we increase school attendance? So I visited elementary school during the spring of this year to understand why children are not attending school and what, what, what is, why a parent is not understanding how to, how to be mindful of how to be, you know, operate on the radar, uh, not get no 10 absences to be referred to child welfare system. And I found this, parents do not understand how to implement what the school rule is. What is the difference between unexcused absences and excused absences? So I can say from working with behavior health and being on a lot of meetings where I support positive family engagement, I was given a, a call to action. Give me a concrete example of what can help reduce uh, unexcused absences. And what I came up with is I'm in the process of doing a pilot program, which is going to be launched in January. And we chose elementary school because elementary school is where a child has the full complement of understanding how systems work. If you look at the child when he's in um, uh, the pre-K, they still kind of come from home, but when they're in elementary school, they get the full complement of how system work. So we are gonna be launching this. We need support. We want to empower parents. I think the secret sauce lies with having parents understand how they can be good parents. They don't have to be shamed and blamed about what they don't know, but get parent support on how to enrich their parenting skill from people who have lived experience like this organization. So thank you. Thank you. All right, Ashley Ruff. Don't see Commissioner Ruff. Beverly Settles Reeves. Don't see Dr. Reeves. Jackie Carter. All right, Jackie, I see you in the attendee room. I'm going to send you an invite. Please accept our invitation. And we're going to the next person. Uh, Judy Shepard Gore. Don't see her. Beverly Smith. Don't see her. Morme Pashkani. Sojin Kim. All right, Sojin, I see you in the um, attendee room as well. Again, you have to ex affirmatively accept our invitation. Jamila White. Let's see her. All right, I see Sojin now. Miss Kim. Yep. There you go. All right, you present your testimony when you're ready. Good afternoon, committee members. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Sojin Kim, and I'm a junior at school at the Wall Senior High. I'm here as representative of the Young Women's Project, a nonprofit that advocates for the rights of DC youth. This year, as one of the initiatives in our mental health campaign, which seeks to reduce stigma and strengthen school-based mental health services, we sent out a district-wide student mental health survey. So far, we have received preliminary results from 16 schools with over 600 responses total. The data we've gathered paints a picture of students who are often unable to access some of the most basic mental health resources. 57% of surveyed youth do not know the name of their school counselor, and 73% have not received any mental health supports in school. 
Additionally, 78% reported having received either less than an hour of mental health education in the last academic year or none at all. Speaking from my own experience, the vast majority of students at my school feel incredibly disconnected from mental health staff and as a result, rarely engage with them. Most are unaware of where to find our school psychologist and social worker or what services they offer. While we do have a mental health club, it is largely inactive and few other means of outreach have been conducted. The occasional presentations on mental health related topics we do receive simply repeat the same tired, out of touch advice and most students rarely pay attention to them or take them seriously. I myself cannot remember a single time that students themselves were asked how they feel about the mental health resources currently available to them. This lack of awareness is especially concerning in the light of a growing mental health crisis among young people in DC. 76% of youth surveyed ranked their stress levels as high, and a majority also reported consistently receiving less than the recommended eight hours of sleep per night. Furthermore, rates of suicidal ideation and depression remain significantly above the national average, with 14% of students having considered suicide in the past three months, and 17% having considered self-harming. The first step towards alleviating these issues is a relatively simple one. Start listening to students. The majority of young people we surveyed have demonstrated an interest in a wide variety of mental health supports. Online appointment scheduling, lists of the services offered, and counseling sessions during lunch and after school, and individual talk therapy were all ranked highly by over 60% of respondents when asked what initiatives they would like to see implemented at their own schools. The best way to improve school-based mental health supports are by going to the people they actually affect. I hope my testimony has been able to provide a clearer perspective on the state of mental health resources and education in DCPS. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. Don't go away. So I have some questions for you. Nora Green. Okay. Megan Chandler. Thank you, Councilmember Henderson, Pinto and White, committee members and staff for considering my testimony today. My name is Megan Challender, and I'm testifying as Network for Victim Recovery of DC's Director of Legal Services. Since 2012, MVRDC has supported over 9,000 crime victims and survivors in the district through free, trauma-informed advocacy, legal, and therapeutic services. Three years ago, when Break the Cycle was forced to close, MVRDC filled the gap in services for youth survivors of crime. MVRDC now provides both intervention and prevention services for youth, providing advocacy, therapeutic, and legal services to 13 to 24-year-old survivors of crime in the assertion of their crime victims' rights, student survivor rights, and in civil protection orders. We aim to prevent these needs from occurring in the first place by providing healthy relationships and consent education to youth and training for adult professionals who work with youth. Last year, MVRDC served 51 youth survivors of dating violence, domestic violence, sexual assault, and stalking. The DC Youth Risk Behavior Survey informs us that one in 10 middle and high school students have been physically hurt on purpose by an intimate partner just in the prior 12 months. And a similar number of students were forced to have sex when they did not want to. Students with marginalized identities, such as youth who are part of the LGBTQIA community, face higher rates of such violence. What we must realize is that when youth experience these instances of harm, they are experiencing developmental trauma, which can adversely affect youth's biological, social, cognitive, emotional, and spiritual development. For these reasons, it is critical to maintain funding for organizations like NVRDC to do prevention and outreach work at local schools. We have programs at Anacostia and Roosevelt High Schools where we go in and engage directly with youth provide confidential spaces to ask questions, and provide free resources and support. However, it is equally important to equip teachers and school staff with the education and tools to understand and navigate the trauma that students may be experiencing. This is why NVRDC provides trauma-informed education to community members, but strongly advises the council to consider mandating the type of training, this type of training to schools throughout the district in addition to supporting youth-specific resources. NVRDC wants to stress that these resources are not only important for the youth that may identify as survivors or victims, but also to the youth that are causing harm as well. We know that most people who cause harm and complete crimes have a history of trauma and adverse experiences. Youth who experience violence are more likely to feel unsafe and skip school. So it is unsurprising that high school students who experience abuse are twice as likely as other students to have grades 
of mostly Ds or Fs. We know the numbers, the risks, the impact, and we believe that we are not alone in believing that the true solution is to prevent this violence from occurring in the first place. Our approach is to provide education for youth, all youth, on what consent is and what both healthy and unhealthy relationships look like. We view education as key, not only for youth, but professionals who engage with youth. And the RDC strongly believes that to create truly trauma-informed communities that also break cycles of violence, everyone should receive education on trauma. This is why we have urged the council to take make DC a trauma-informed jurisdiction. Ms. And we'll continue to advocate for funding both intervention and prevention services. Finally, Ms. and I know I'm just barely over time, just, we, we would all- <laughs> Hold on. We would, I, I'm, I'm really sorry. I'm, I'm going to cut you off because only I've done that for everyone else today. So if I let you go on for another minute, then you're two minutes over and it, it creates a, a, a effect. I'm going to ask some follow-up questions. Um, so thank you all um, so much for, for your testimony and for being here. Um, I, I, uh, Ms. Event, I want to start with you. Um, you talked a lot about parental involvement and doing it in a way that is not punitive or in a, in a shaming manner and mechanism. And it's interesting. One of the things that I was thinking about when you were talking was around like Harlem Children's Zone and how they start with parents before you even have your child in terms of parenting courses, what to do, what not to do. Um, and I'm not, we have some programs like that in the district that are, you know, very unique or, or niche. But when you talk about parent involvement, are you saying like at what stage in the game is the best time to have these types of conversations? At the earliest stage possible, because that's one of the things, even from my, my own personal experience, it was like I was not valued as a parent. It was only the child. And that's why I started an organization for people to understand it's okay to work with that child, but if you say parents is the problem, then why are you not working with the parent? Why are you afraid to work with the parent? The parent need help too. And 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 think about this: these parents that have you know that have these children, and you guys have wonderful youth program. They didn't get any support while they was coming up. So what they wanted to do, they want to be a parent. They want to have children. And what they most parents say, I want a child to love me. But the first thing I know that a parent has to do is understand how to love themselves. When they can love themselves, then they can have, they can learn how to be supportive to, they, to their children. I hear too often about children, about a, a lady came into my office today talking about how she wanted wraparound services that she didn't get. Her son is on a trajectory to be removed from the home. And she said, I don't want him removed from the home. She was, she acknowledged she has mental health issues. So if we don't address the whole, uh, these problems holistically, we always gonna have these safety meetings talking about youth violence, gun violence. Why we can't have a meeting talking about parent support? How we helping the family as a family? Why this city has a has a problem when it say when it comes to family? I hear countless stories. I even have stories too. My son, my son was killed in two thousand six, gun violence, mm. victim of a robbery. So, but that didn't deter me. It empowered me to be to want to work with other families. We do work in homes. We, wherever the family is, that's where we are. We was one of the first Thank family you. Run organization to work on the DC Youth Link contract with DYS provide and introduce to them the importance and the, and the um, benefits of improving outcomes when it comes to juvenile justice. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, thank you for sharing your story and for the work and service that you've done. Um, in terms of the community, I, I appreciate your testimony and your feedback there. Um, Ms. Kim, I, I want to turn to you. You know, obviously we have a, this is a hearing that's focused on youth and um, you are in the youth space and the Young Women's Project always, always does a really good job in terms of trying to elevate the voices of your peers and your classmates. You mentioned around, um, I think you said something around talk, um, like a, a, a virtual 
something. Mm -hmm. Um, There was a witness who talked earlier around an initiative that was just started in New York City where they, um, you know, partner with Talkspace to make that available to young people. Are you familiar with Talkspace? You know what I'm talking about? Uh, I haven't heard of it. No, sorry. Oh, okay. Well, it, it, it's um, it's essentially like an online platform where when you sign on, you're connected with a mental health specialist provider who you can have conversations with immediately, right? Like right on your phone. Um, when you talk to your peers and classmates around some of their thing, like what do you feel like would they would say would help them the most? I think I agree that having that kind of service would be very helpful because the environment that I've at least personally witnessed is that mental health services at my school are just something that isn't talked about because there's just been this very prolonged history of student voices not really being considered in what actually would be helpful. And I think there is also definitely an element of stigma about others finding out and the social aspect of it. Mm -hmm. So I think having that kind of space where students would still be able to access mental health services and supports through their school, but maybe not necessarily in the building or in not such a confrontational manner, I think that would definitely be very helpful. Okay. Um, I'm uh, over my time. But thank you. Thank you so much for being here and for your testimony. Councilmember White, do you have any questions for this panel? No, Chairwoman, I don't. Thank you all for participating. All right. Uh, thank you all. If you can, if we don't have a copy of your testimony, if you can make sure that you upload it, um, that would be very, very helpful to us. So thank you. I'm going to go on to the next panel. Uh, Ricardo Rivera, James Carpenter, Nehemiah Martin, Katie Donnelly, Lee Beers, Shannon Battle, Tia Bell, and Nikki um, Steinsick. That's eight. Let's see how well we do this time. She a woman? Yes, Mr. White. Oh, I don't know if you heard me on that. Oh. Um, you just did not? No, I didn't hear what it. Oh, no, I was just saying I don't have any uh, questions uh, for this panel. Yes, I heard that part. Yes. Okay. Yep. Okay, we have more folks who are coming in, but I um, I see Ricardo. So why don't you go ahead and get started? All right. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Awesome. Greetings and salutations to the D.C. Council. My name is Ricardo Rivera, and I'm a clinical social worker representing the See Forever Foundation and Maya Angelou Academy Public Charter School System. Since graduating from the historic Howard University in December 2018, I've had the opportunity to work with D.C. youth and adolescents through various employment opportunities like Friendship Public Charter Schools, the D.C. Public Charter Schools, D.C. Children and Family Services, and other roles. In the last two years, there has been a sharp increase in violent crimes and arrests among juveniles. The Metropolitan Police Department reported that 326 juveniles were arrested for violent crimes in 2022 and 363 during the first six months of 2023. That is approximately a 47% increase. Now, here we are at the end of 2023, and there has not been a day where a DC youth has not been in the news or charged for a crime. Times are changing and new solutions are needed to combat the rising crime rate of our youth. As a social worker, I often hear about the upbringings, home and social environment of our youth and their daily challenges for survival. Many of our youth have not dealt with their adverse childhood experiences, which can have a tremendous impact on future violence, victimization, and perpetration. In Washington, D.C., nearly half of D.C. youth have had adverse childhood experiences, and more than 25,000 D.C. youth, one in four, have experienced two or more ACEs in their lifetime. Adverse childhood experiences can involve being the victim of abuse, physical, sexual, or emotional, being the victim of neglect, 
physical or emotional, dealing with an incarcerated member of the household, and even growing up in a household where there are adults experiencing drug or alcohol problems or even mental health problems. One of the newer challenges that impacted our youth, our youth mental health, it was COVID-19. Prior to the pandemic, one in five DC youth, more than 20,000, were reported to have mental, emotional, developmental, or behavioral problems. The pandemic seized all services in our youth, missed out on two years of consistent mental health services. Since 1998, the See Forever Foundation and Maya Angelou Public Charter School System has been bridging the gap between providing support for DC youth prior, during, and after their juvenile justice involvement, and continuing to work towards making that transition easier. As a primary resource, the See Forever Foundation and Maya Angelou Public Charter School System continue to offer all disconnected youth in, D in the DC area a place to engage in full-time, rigorous academic programs with innovative wraparound services that youth need to succeed. In the words of my assistant, Principal Melissa Genty, we often talk about the school to prison pipeline, but Maya is the prison to school pipeline, which ensures that justice involved youth have a seamless route back into the school system. Sorry, I, I ran out of time. Okay, we'll ask you some questions and I'm sure we'll have your written testimony for the record. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, James Carpenter. Don't see. Leah Maya Martin. Don't see. Oh, oh, wait. Okay. All right, I see James Carpenter is in the attendee room. Ours is Katie Donnelly, who are the two next people on the list. So you guys have to accept our invitation to become a panelist. Okay. Um, while we work, wait on Mr. Carpenter to figure it out, Dr. Donnelly, if you want to go ahead. Uh, good evening, Chairperson Henderson, uh, Chairperson Pinto, and uh, Chairperson White. Thank you so much for uh, having me here today. Uh, my name is Dr. Katie Donnelly, and I'm an emergency medicine pediatrician and the medical director for the Youth Violence Intervention Program at Children's National Hospital. The Youth Violence Intervention Pro Program, or YVIP, is a proud feature of Children's National that aims to identify and screen pediatric victims of community violence and provide mental, emotional, and behavioral support to help disrupt future cycles of violence. Uh, in 2023 alone, the Children's National Emergency Department reported 220 cases of children injured by community violence, including 41 injured by firearms. Of those patients, YVIP has screened and enrolled 109 in our intervention and case management services. It is critical to underscore that we know that many youths who use violence do not have a mental health diagnosis, and the majority of youths who have a mental health diagnosis do not use violence. We also know that after a violent injury, the number of children who experience post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD rises substantially, as well as healthcare youth for mental health and substance use disorders. These children also have high risk for violent revictimization and cumulative violence exposure. Supporting survivors of violence with mental health support is needed to stem the tide of violence in our country and local community. Recognizing the need for many of our patients to be connected with mental health resources, our team has made that a priority focus. Yet despite our best efforts and in conjunction with community partners, we still struggle to connect our identified patients into mental health treatment due to a surplus of systemic barriers. Uh, the need far outpaces the supply of high quality and accessible treatment options for children with public health insurance, especially in Ward 7 and 8. Accessible mental health services include those that are geographically close to the family, that accept public insurance, are culturally competent, offer times during evenings and weekends, and offer treatment for the entire family. There are several steps DC can take to overcome these obstacles and improve the health and well being of DC children and families. Many of these recommendations are reflected in the 2020 REM report, A Path Forward, Transforming the Public Behavioral Health System for Children, Youth, and Families in the District of Columbia, which Children's co authored with many partnering organizations in DC. Specifically, the report highlights the urgent need to implement strategies and incentives to create an adequate labor pool of diverse behavioral health professionals for children. 
We are passionate that the labor pool should be strengthened in numerous and diverse settings, tailored to individual needs, and accessible at varying degrees of intensity across the continuum of care. Additionally, our A Path Forward report advocates for enabling integration of peer specialists, community health workers, and other non-traditional behavioral health professionals across settings. Lastly, it is crucial that the city create a cross-agency and cross-sectoral strategic plan for children's behavioral health with both community and stakeholder input. I have seen firsthand the devastating effects community violence has on children and families in our hospital, and I believe that we can break future cycles of violence with the proper services and support. Thank you so much for your, the opportunity to testify this evening, and I welcome any questions you may have. Thank you, Dr. Donnelly. Uh, Dr. Beers? Hello. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so good afternoon, Chairperson Henderson, Chairperson Pinto, and Chairperson White. Uh, my name is Dr. Lee Beers, and I'm a professor of pediatrics and the medical director for community health and advocacy at Children's National. Uh, additionally, I'm also here as the co-director for the Early Childhood Innovation Network. I'm also a former president of the American Academy of Pediatrics, where I served on the board of directors between 2020 and 2022, and as president, led our organization's declaration of a national emergency for children's mental health. I also want to start by clearly stating that while it's essential to consider the behavioral health needs of youth and their families in any discussion of public safety, the two topics are distinct. Not all youth with mental health concerns exhibit criminal behavior, and not all youth who exhibit criminal behavior have mental health concerns. That said, we know that adverse childhood experiences increase risk for both mental health concerns and involvement in the juvenile justice system, and an estimated 65 to 75% of youth in juvenile justice probably even higher in DC based on numbers we've seen, have a mental health condition. It stands to reason that if we do not have a strong system of pediatric mental health care that affords access to the treatment and support needed by youth and their families, we will amplify and exacerbate public safety issues related to youth, whether as victims or perpetrators. As a pediatrician, I care for children across their lifespan, including health promotion, well child care, and management of acute and chronic illnesses. It's with that lens that I'd like to share a few recommendations. While the district has made strides in many areas, we still experience multiple gaps and inadequate capacity in our continuum of behavioral health care across the city. An effective and complete continuum should include promoting behavioral health, early identification, treatment, recovery and rehabilitation services, and long-term support. Financing promotion and prevention strategies through programs such as Healthy Steps is crucial to promoting the well-being of young children at risk for developing behavioral and developmental disorders. Additionally, DC complete, currently completely lacks critical services, such as intensive outpatient programs, as well as partial hospitalization programs. While there are bright spots in our city's behavioral health system, generally services are siloed, poorly coordinated, and inadequate to address the tremendous need that has only worsened over the past several years. This concept is highlighted in the 2021 report, also referenced by Dr. Donnelly, that was developed with key partners, a path forward, transforming the behavioral public behavioral health system for children, youth, and families in the District of Columbia. To address this issue, the report emphasizes a need for an updated strategic plan for children's behavioral health that should be developed by all relevant government agencies in collaboration with non-governmental stakeholders. While there's much to be done, we also have many strengths as a city. There are many examples of best practices we can lean on and concrete solutions, such as those in the Path Forward report. However, it will require that we act with intention and urgency to address this crisis now before it escalates further. My team and I would be delighted to partner together with you in this effort. And thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, Dr. Beers. Um, I now see Mr. Carpenter. Good afternoon. Oh, good evening, rather, uh, members of DC City Council. My name is James Cobb. I'm here today as a concerned Bolden resident in D.C. and a member of 525. I wanted to make a few suggestions towards issues that affect young people and their families. I have met many young people who have expressed an ambition to finish school and obtain trades. Unfortunately, they don't feel safe to do so because of the violence in their community. These are the young people who, through no fault of their own, live in neighborhoods that historically have been in conflict with other neighborhoods in the city since I was a kid. These, these kids could benefit from a relocation program that will provide support for those who are trying to do the right thing. Families who have been victims of crime could also benefit from relocation. This is a very complex issue and I'm offering only one of many solutions today, or many that need to be implemented. 
please consider this in the strategy to make our city safe. And also want to mention the um, bringing guys home back from the, 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 the BOP so they can get some of the rehabilitative services that some of the people spoke about earlier. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carpenter. Uh, Sharon Battle, don't see Thea Bell. Hey, Chair Henderson. Good evening, uh, Chair Pinto and Chair White. I am beyond blessed to be among you all as I feel like I've been fighting for this day. Uh, sorry, my name is Tia Bell. I am a, I am prevention. I am an advocate. I am a disruptor. Um, and I am a, a, a resident of DC, a product of what protection um, and, uh, looks like. And so today I'm really excited to um, speak in the midst of grieving the loss of, of youth that I love and fight for. Also in the midst of just being deeply frustrated and traumatized over and over and over by the neglect uh, to truly treat gun violence as the public health crises, burden, and challenge that it is. In D.C., we're facing an endemic of overdoses um, and gun violence. And right now, those two things, along with truancy, um, are all being treated as crime. Today, I'm excited because we combine health with public safety and, and, and have an opportunity to truly model the creative, collaborative coordination it takes to heal our people. Right now, we see in legislation and policy, we see our people being punished and misunderstood and there are gaps that are attempting to be filled, but they're creating larger gaps. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. The first homicide of this year was a young man that I loved, only grew to love and had the opportunity to support for about six months. He was introduced to me by a healer in the community um, who brought him to the in gun violence conference that we run as an organization modeling a public health approach where we include every system in the youth ecosystem on gun violence awareness day to come up with preventative solutions the cdc defines preventative solutions as acts and supports and events that are done before the trigger is pulled right now we see a large investment as well as a disinvestment in all of the systems, including violence interruption and violence intervention in the hospital, which are both treatment and intervention. We see a zero true investment in prevention. And until people who overdose or participate in using drugs recreationally, or people who shoot to deal with a problem or deal with a trauma or deal with a beef or deal with a fear, until we are viewed as sick, versus just only as criminals, we will not survive. There are many gaps in our system. Again, trying to support the young man while he was here, there was no coordination. I aim to work with OGBP, with the ones, with the public safety uh, deputy mayor uh, and community organizations that supported this young man after he was shot to support his friends, to just get them in school, get them in healing. Do you know that references and meetings went unattended? Young men are locked up right now that could have been avoided. Young men have been shot since then that could have been avoided. They've lost more friends since then that could have been avoided. And until we have a, 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 an, an all-encompassing approach, until the Department of Health and Behavioral Health, because gun violence is a behavioral disease, until they are at the front of the charge, we will continue to die until we see a long-term investment, like investing in, in, in the school year internship program as economic opportunity to protect them, using school as a protective factor, not as the source of chaos or criminality. Stop criminalizing us. Recognize our trauma, the history, and yes, the culture. You do provide us with a wealth of resources and maybe breaks. We don't have the capacity to go there. Trigger meets youth where they are and individually prepares a path to prevention and supports them with or without a dollar. A mini grant on top of a mini grant on top of a mini grant. I called the ones office to get support for a, a parent to move 
and they said the grant ended last week because the fiscal year was over. But if our grant ends, we figure it out. We need collaborative coordination. We need to put community at the front. Yesterday was the issue with truancy. If we send community to homes for home visits, they won't feel like it's criminalized or intrusive. Let's build us up economically, uh, um, um, spiritually. We need healing, not just healing services. Please okay. invest in the people. I digress. Thank you, Ms. Tia. I, I will have some questions. Just hold on. Um, Nikki? Um, so good afternoon, all. My name is Dr. Nikki Steinzeck. I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist and serve as a resident fellow representative on the executive committee of the Washington Psychiatric Society. I care for children as young as four years old with emotional and behavioral concerns. In addition to considering medications and individual therapy for my patients, I believe in the importance of supporting their caregivers as home environments and relationships have the largest impact on developmental outcomes, including mental health. In my office, parents are often asking for support, for resources, for knowledge about how to be a better parent for their child. In response to their requests, I would love to be able to refer families to evidence-based parent training programs. Parent training programs teach caregivers how to respond effectively to challenging child behaviors to keep things calm at home. Studies show that positive, consistent, and supportive parenting, especially during the first three years of life, can lead to superior cognitive development and lower levels of child problem behaviors and child abuse. Unfortunately, in my experience, there are several barriers in D.C. to referring families to parent training programs. First, even as a mental health physician, it's hard to find what parent training programs are currently available. Second, the majority of the programs that are available are restricted to specific at-risk groups. Third, there's limited to no insurance coverage for many families in need of these programs. I care for a seven-year-old boy who has autism and anxiety and often has difficulty following rules at home. He lives at home with his grandmother, grandpa, grand, grandmother, grandfather, two uncles, and his mother, all of who actively participate in his care. His mother has repeatedly expressed that the family would appreciate guidance on promoting good behavior and discipline. I provide suggestions. However, the family has difficult with application of these skills at home due to a lack of practice and active support, which could be provided by a parent training program. Because this boy has a diagnosis of autism and anxiety, his insurance covers some of the parent training programs that are available in D.C., However, due to structural barriers, work hours, transportation, and income, his mother has difficulty with assessing these, um, accessing these programs. Mom also believes that all of his caregivers should be able to participate in the program. This patient has a four-year-old brother who has similar behavior difficulties at home, however, does not have a mental health diagnosis and therefore has no insurance coverage for parent training programs. I point this out because, because in this case, to access a parent training program could prevent mental illness. DC is in need of policies and infrastructure supporting a continuum of care, one which includes prevention efforts as well as treatments, one which reaches families at home and in the office. Improved access to parent training programs in DC can be achieved. One approach already used by the 17 US states is to ensure Medicaid coverage for a broad spectrum of parent training programs, even for children without mental illness diagnoses. Medicaid funding allows for programs to be more easily uh, delivered in the pediatric primary care setting, reaching children before behavioral problems escalate to the point of needing mental health specialists. The district can also explore methods for scaling pre-existing programs and educating professionals on what programs are available and how to access them. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I welcome any questions, but I have to step away and see a patient. So I hope you all have a lovely day and please reach out with, uh, via email if you need anything. Um, thank you, Dr. Steinzik. Um, and thank you to this panel of witnesses for your testimony and for being here. Um, I honestly don't even know where to start because there's like lots to un unpack um, from all different sort of angles and things like that. Okay. Um, so I'll start with Dr. Beers. Um, your colleague, um, Dr. Donnelly, talked about, you know, the interventions that are done in an in a emergency room in a hospital setting. But one of the things I'm really interested in is um, something that Tia Bell was talking about, which was around investing in prevention. And, you know, from the pediatric standpoint, what are we missing here? Um, like, you know, uh, an, eight, an 18 year old who has done 20 something carjackings, that didn't happen overnight. Um, and in many cases, they might have been exhibiting some type of behaviors, usually, it, it, not usually, but sometimes it's something that could have triggered. Um, and so how can we 
I guess, lay the steady groundwork foundation? What should we be doing differently? No, thank you so much for that question, um, because I, I think it really does get to the heart of the issue. Um, you know, I think you, you know as well as anyone that that certainly our public health systems, our health systems are designed to pay for treatment and not prevention. So I think that's one really important piece is thinking about, you know, across all t- types of settings within within healthcare, but also um, uh, within within community based settings, early childhood education centers to ensure that um, uh, people working with families can be reimbursed and supports, you know, supported for that time, community health workers, um, peer support workers is a really important um, workforce uh, that 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 can do that. Um, uh, we know that that 90% of a child's brain development happens in the first five years of life. So some of these parent training and parent support programs are incredibly important as well. And we need to make sure that those are available and accessible to families. And we also know that families don't live in isolation, right? And so we need to think about what are the supports that the family needs across the board? What, what supports do they need around housing and income and employment? Um, because if we're not doing those things, we are not cultivating an environment where a child can really grow and thrive. I think I'll also comment on some of the the things that I was uh, hearing um, uh, in earlier testimonies um, around adolescents and high school students and your your observation that much of the crime is happening in those hours after school. And I think the more we can invest in after school programs and supports for children um, and teens to really give them good and positive and constructive things to do if they're doing things that they love and that they enjoy and that they're, that they're excited about, that's what they're going to do. They're not going to be on their phones. They're not going to um, doing other things that we 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 would hope that they they won't do, and so we really need to invest in in things that build up our youth um, and give them really positive opportunities. Um, thank you for that, um, Miss Bell. You talked a, about or you brought up mini grants, and that was something that came up earlier. Um, uh, Mama Rock brought it up. Yeah, yeah, but, Mama Rock. But brought I was. It up. I was talking about different mini grants because again, I I feel like but the concept of mini grants still oh, yeah. exists, right? And so, um, you know, one of the things that when I hear when I talk to nonprofit organizations, they they want to they talk talk about the need for consistency and predictability. Mm-hmm. And would multi year grants be more helpful in your work? That feels like a trick question for me um, because my my first response is yes, like prevention deserves sustainability. Um, But my raw response is that the grant needs to come on time, like the disbursement of the funds needs to come with time to spend it because it's criminal to give us a grant and say is you have to spend it all in three weeks and or it's due back. You know, that's that's yeah. being reactive and saying, hey, let's get this money out instead of proactive. Um, I remember Council, Councilman Trayon said DBH gave back three million dollars in the pandemic. Like if that if we're able to front that money to to community and I know the community and government relationship has been severed with money. through, And I, I only know through the stories I hear, you know, but the true investment in community is truly the only way we are the remedy and the solution. And even when Dr. Donnelly calls me and has a referral of a young person that she thinks Trigger would be great for, they can't offer resources. So to answer your question, yes, we need money. I don't want to. We don't. I, we cannot turn away funds, but we need it in the in a respectable, professional way that we can manage it and um, not be, you know, not be judged on what these grant makers think the community has capacity to do, but truly really given us a chance because grant outcomes don't always fix the problem. It, it You got to go around the grant. Like when I worked to, to help Tez's friends not go to jail or die, the cure team couldn't do anything because they had a fixed budget. They had yeah. a fixed budget for the year. So I just it, the grant has to be, it has to be trusted yeah. Uh, unrestricted, no. like within the realms of really helping to prevent whatever it takes to stop the despair. Yeah, no, I, I hear you that. And that's something it has been a consistent um, thing. in some of the hearings that we've had over the last couple of months is that, right, like 
when our grants say you can't purchase food, but somebody needs to eat, you know, that causes a, a an issue. Um, when, um, and I, you know, these agencies know it frustrates me to know in how we wait until October 1st to write a re- funding proposal, like to write the grant proposal for availability. Cause y'all have known for months that the money was coming available Why we wait until October, which means that you don't get it out until December, which means the money is not dispersed till February. And then you say to me, exactly. oh, it has to be done before, you know? Yeah. So we're, we're, we're going through that right now. Can I speak really quickly on Dr. Beers? Um, if 80% of this city has been exposed to the disease of gun violence within, within a half mile radius, so if we could allow pediatricians, um, and, 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 and Dr. Donnelly knows where I'm going with this, but to like screen for exposure, let's fund research. I was trying to, I'm trying to work with the NIH right now, but we don't have the clinical translation language to go for the grant, but we got the solution, you know, right now in, in public health research experts are people with PhDs. But I have a PhD in lived experience. I've been preventing gun violence since I was 10, before I was 10, because my sister's father was killed before my mother was shot. And then my mother's best friends was killed. And then my friends started getting killed. And then I started hearing about the killings in college. And then I came back home. And then youngins I love started getting killed. Mm -hmm. The exposure is how let's look at people as exposed, even if we want to see who gets in the SYIP first or which is the school year internship program. Only a thousand students can do that. That's criminal. It's 12,000 high school students. Yeah, no, I. I, Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. Um, Kelly Williams, who spoke on our earlier panel, talked about we need youth and behavioral screening of every kid as like part of your back to school Yes. Get a mental, get a behavioral, get a social, get a physical. That's what we, we call them. We call them socials and mentals when we do our check-ins, but do you, you have to, we got to really assess everything. The soil, the soil is blooming a flower of gun violence because it is not nourished and rich and watered. We got to look at the soil and it's very offensive to keep seeing our government come up with so many initiatives. Even today, we saw a bid on a business move, but we're starving as a city. It's hurting us. We need to heal. We need to heal. It's parents that students are chronically absent and not going to school, but students, parents were harmed by the school system. Like we 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 need y'all to help meet us in the middle and heal, and you all have you as chair have I think I don't know I th- I believe you have the power to figure it out creatively and what it looks like in policy. I, I appreciate that vote of confidence. I'm trying to collaborate because I don't think I'm an expert in all of these <laughs> things. So I appreciate all of you being here. Um, I'm gonna turn to Councilmember Trayon White because he's still on to see if he any, has any questions for this panel. Um. Uh, first, I want to thank everyone for speaking today. Um, to Tia's point, I think she made some critical uh, statements, and so have others. But one of the things I wanted to hone in on was the the internship program, some uh, internship program to DOES, um, and not just the, the thousand people that are eligible that get access to do it, but a real investment in the pay. Uh, we heard the gentleman talk about the other day, I mean, earlier today, that we are offering kids to earn $200 over the course of a week or so when they are able to make $2,000 doing something destructive. Um, and so we really, if we really value it, we have put our money where our mouth is. And so there are a lot of things that I think that we have started to do, even in creating more access to recreation space. I know we're building five new recreation centers in D.C. That's good but I don't know what's going in them. And so I've been in conversations with DPR Director uh, Freeman about allowing people and organizations to get access to that space while the staff there may or may not have the capacity to do certain types of programs. We know we have other individuals in the community who have skill sets, who have organizations that can't, maybe can't afford to rent a space in D.C. with the high mortgage and rent that it costs in D.C., but because this is their community, it's actually their record because we pay for it with their tax dollars, that their organizations in their community are, and in close proximity to be able to access these facilities. And so we're working to do that and provide them with access to grant opportunities. Um, I think last year I put together a bill 
that gave grants out for the first for for the first time uh to some of the uh organizations for the first time in a long time some of the organizations I think I want to expand that this year with the help of my colleague uh and we have the wherewithal to do, to do it and mm -hmm. I, I don't have many questions at this point because I think that the panelists are making some very valuable information. It is my hope and my prayer that we act on it. And we, we, we're running out of time because, as I say, it will not affect us directly now. It will affect us directly or indirectly today or tomorrow because the, the, the issues are spreading like a virus. And so I appreciate the conversation about a public health approach to addressing it. Um, and we don't have all the, I know people think the council members, we don't have all the solutions, um, especially on these many topics, but we depend on the public to give us the input and expertise in their eyes and ears and what they see and feel. And I'm on the ground, you are, you guys, I'm on the ground in trenches every day. But even in that, it's still about coalition building. It's still about figuring out that didn't work, this didn't work, let's try this and getting the executive on board. And, I, and I, I'm disappointed to hear that the Warren's office have run out of money for housing people, because there was another thing that came up two pounds ago, um, getting people out there in the environment, because at some point they got to go home or they got to go back to that same environment that's toxic, that's abusive, that's uh, violent, a lot of violence, a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety, and sometimes the victim becomes the perpetrator because they're in that environment. So um, we're listening, we're learning. I just want to thank everyone for taking time out to add value to this conversation. Thank you, Councilmember White. Um, thank you to this panel of witnesses. Again, if you haven't submitted your written testimony for the record, if you could please provide that <clears throat> to us. All right, we're going to go to the last and final panel of public witnesses. Um, Ariella G Gavins, Carol Cabrera, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Irison, Nadia Goldmart Moritz, uh, Hillary Reyes Rubio, Tara Roberts. Samaya Young, Carla Reed Witt, Maya McCowan, Dr. Maya McCowan, and uh, Belinda Taylor. <clears throat> All right, I see Ms. Gavins, if you wanna go ahead and get started. Ms. Gavins, if you're speaking, we can't hear you. Ms. Gavins, if you're speaking, we cannot hear you. Okay, thank you so much. I just, I'm like, so glad to be here with you today. There you go. We can hear you now. Thank you, um, Chairperson Henderson, Pinto, and White for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Aurelia Gavins, and I'm a 30-year child and family development specialist an educator who serves as the Director of Early Learning at the Early Childhood Innovation Network, ESIN. Additionally, I serve as Faculty Director for the Family Leadership Track. And as a parent educator, families have sh shared um, increasing needs for behavioral health and mental wellness supports. And parents and community members have also shared their stories of increased stress, community violence, and struggles in managing child and youth behaviors. Eason has long recognized the need for expansive mental health supports in community settings. And Eason has partnered with national and local experts, including DC family run organizations and Georgetown University School of Continuing Studies to create the Certificate in Infant Early Childhood and Family Mental Health Family Leadership Track. This certificate prepares youth, parents, community members, and professionals to become frontline community mental health workers. And these students learn the foundational competencies of community health work and take a deep dive into competencies specific to mental health and well-being, thus garnishing our phrase, community mental health workers. Participants in the certificate track gain a robust skill and experience in social emotional well-being, mindfulness, and healing-centered mental health in early learning, educational, healthcare, and community settings. The certificate program aims to diversify the mental health profession and produce skilled paraprofessionals with lived experience to provide child, youth, and families with behavioral health resources and supports. Financing of paraprofessionals is reflected in the 2021 A Path Forward report, which Eason co-authored with many key DC partners. Specifically, the report highlights the need to integrate peer supports, community health workers, and non-traditional behavioral 
health path, professional pathways. There are too few training programs that lead to employment opportunities for youth parents and community members in the mental health space. Additionally, diversity in the mental health profession is paramount to promote racial equity and social justice throughout the education and healthcare systems. Creating pathways for community mental health workers will advance systemic changes that will help eliminate health disparities that impact children and families in our most vulnerable community, communities. And many financing and policy opportunities exist to support these pathways. Eason stands ready to partner in this area. Now more than ever, we need to support high quality behavioral health services that entrust youth, families, and community members to be the architects of behavioral health solutions that create healthy communities in DC. Thank you for the opportunity to share my testimony and I welcome questions you may have. Thank you. Carol Cabrera. Okay, uh, Dr. Irison. Yes, hello, good evening to the council. My name is Elizabeth Ierson. I am a primary care pediatrician here in D.C. and here today representing the D.C. chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. Thank you for the opportunity to speak and for hearing from so many stakeholders today. I would like to share a few of my patient stories that further illustrate gaps in our system for children who have experienced trauma. There are several children I've cared for between the ages of 8 and 12 years old who are already greatly impacted by trauma. These are children who have experienced violence or witnessed violence against loved ones, children who see violence in their community on a daily basis, and children whose parents may have unmet mental health care needs themselves. Many of these children develop depression, anxiety, or PTSD. For some, symptoms of their trauma might present as behavior perceived as defiant or aggressive. My patients struggling with these issues are frequently taken to the emergency department in moments of crisis. Most EDs are not designed as therapeutic environments, nor are they designed to promote trauma-informed care. One patient's parent recently told me that their visits to the ED are a cry for help. This patient's mother and therapist have both been advocating for increased psychiatric support and inpatient crisis stabilization. They come to the ED hoping for those services, but that doesn't happen. Each time they're sent home because we do not have sufficient mental health treatment capacity to meet our patients' needs. For families whose children have experienced the mental health crisis, we need to be able to offer immediate, long-term, and therapeutic support. A few weeks ago, there was a shooting just outside my pediatric clinic. One of my teenage patients walked past victims lying on the sidewalk bleeding on, their way to, on the way to his appointment with me. I expressed how scary that must have been to see. He shrugged, shared that he had seen things like that before, and we moved on. Many children now consider exposure to community violence a part of their daily routine. In discussions on gun safety, I have heard young patients describe how they will respond in a violent situation when, not if, that happens to them. This trauma exposure has lifelong impacts on health. We need to change that trajectory. I care for another teenager with complex mental health needs who is a survivor of sexual abuse. I've been collaborating with psychiatry colleagues, community referral programs, and this family to identify psychiatric support for months. This family does not speak English, which limits their treatment options. While our search is ongoing, this teenage patient is struggling to focus in school, suffering from severe depression, and engaging in behaviors that put their health at risk. The patient stories I shared today demonstrate an urgent need for community violence interventions and behavioral health support programs for youth in DC. Effective programming like this requires funding, dedicated leadership, and systems to monitor the impact. I spend every day talking to kids about their health and safety. DC youth are experiencing these crises firsthand. Their input, such as hearing from the youth who have presented testimony today, is imperative. While it may not be the case today, DC's children deserve to feel safe and families deserve to know that appropriate support is available when mental health needs or crises arrive. We are asking that DC Council and Mayor Bowser prioritize funding and development of trauma-informed mental health services that are physically, financially, culturally, and linguistically accessible to all children in DC. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you. Nadia? Good evening, Chair Henderson and Chair White. I'm Nadia Goldmoritz, and thank you so much for the opportunity to present the testimony, and thank you for your leadership on this urgent issue. Um, I'm the Executive Director of the Young Women's Project, and we develop youth leaders in DC public schools and um, put them to work solving community problems. So they work as organizers, they work as advocates, data collectors, you've heard from Sojin in terms of our preliminary survey results. And this year they are in the school providing mental health education, also working as 
wellness coaches. So that's something new in addition to the educational materials and virtual work that we did last year. I am here today to talk about mental health in the school, but specifically the need to expand our frontline resources. I'm going to start with the low-hanging fruit, the libraries. We are very lucky to have so many beautiful libraries open till eight at night. And YWP, as an organization that does nine trainings a week, uses the libraries a lot. However, there is not a system where organizations can actually register to reserve library space. You have to do it as an individual. And we have many librarians who are who love young people and really work with us to provide the um, rooms. And we have some people who really don't want young people in their libraries. So we are asking the committee um, to consider a directive and to consider working with the um, agency to create an opportunity. So organizations can sign up to use library space. Number two, DPR. You know, I think this is an this is a time when we are all desperately looking for more res how to mo how to mobilize more resources to the front line. DPR offers 41 programs. Three of them are open to older youth. Uh, none of the fitness programs are. That's an, an opportunity to expand that in order to create more opportunities for young people to engage. I think we also need to take a close look at our youth serving agencies and what percentage of the staff are actually frontline working with youth. Usually it's disproportionately um, folks who are not, who never come in contact with youth. Lastly, mental health. <laughs> I included our survey results in my testimony. I know I'm running out of time. Um, they're preliminary, but they show a continued high stress level in need of school-based counseling and services. Look forward to talking more about this and sharing more of our work with you directly from our young people. Thank you. Thank you. Hillary? Good afternoon, Sherry Henderson, Sherry Pinto, and Sherry White. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Hilary Reyes Rubio. I am a Ward 7 DC resident. I'm a sophomore at DC International School. In September of 2023, I started, I started as a youth advocate on the mental health campaign at the Young Women's Project. The Young Women's Project builds leadership and power of DC youth so they can improve systems and services. Today, I want to bring your attention to the lack of communication DCI students receive from their counselors and a solution to this problem. I hear from a lot of students complaining that our grade counselor is never in her office and that she tends to look at messages we sent her but takes a long time to respond, usually a week or more, usually a week or more to respond, or she just doesn't respond at all. This can affect students' mental health because they're not getting the necessary support that they need. Students don't feel comfortable going to her because they feel judged or that she just doesn't care because of how long her response time is. This can lead students to <laughs> this can lead students to having emotional instability, intense anger, sadness, or feeling of depression. These feelings can tend to lead to social isolation and impaired judgment, which leads to aggressive behavior. We can see the rate of youth violence increasing because the root of the problem is not being addressed. One solution for this issue is to ensure easy access to counseling services and mental health professionals in schools and communities. Schools should teach Schools should teach stress management techniques like mindfulness and relaxation exercises. So when you, when our youth has intense feelings, they can practice mindfulness instead of resorting to violence. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Hillary. Tara?
Sarah. Uh, Samaya. Good afternoon, Chair Henderson, Chair Pinto, and Chair White. I'm Samaya Young, a War 6 DC resident and a senior at Jackson Reed High School. I'm here today as a youth advocate on the mental health campaign team as a, at the Young Women's Project, where we deeply are engaged in addressing mental health issues among DC youth. YWP Mental Health Campaign, launched in 2019, focuses on enhancing school-based mental health programming, reducing stigma, and expanding access to mental health education. Currently, we have 80 dedicated youth advocates across 16 schools. Working tirelessly to improve systems and services as youth advocates, we undergo extensive training in stress management, resilience building, traumas, and system changes, and then actively engaging with our schools to gather data, educate our peers, and connect them with the necessary resources. Last year alone, our efforts led to 45 testimonies presented in the DC Council, educating over 4,000 peers and the establishment of student online support, SOS virtual wellness centers in 13 schools. We're compensated through the, the DOS School Year Internship, SYEP, allowing us to contribute effectively while learning and growing within the critical field. However, re recently within DC's, with, recently with NDC, Mayor Bow's recent declare, declaration of public em emergency highlights the severity of the opioid crisis and the rising youth violence, necessitating immediate and comprehensive responses. The, the statistics are stark. Fatal opioid-related overdoses in D.C. have more than doubled between 2018 and 2022 with fentanyl accounting for 96% of these cases in 2022-2023. To combat this crisis, Mayor Bowser Emergency Declaration authorizes expedited procurement and co coordination among various departments, including the Department of Behavioral Health, DC Health, and DC Fire and EMS. Simultaneously, the surge in juvenile crime rates demands urgent intervention. The increase in Arrests of juveniles for serious offense like robbery, carjacking, and the involvement in violent crimes is deeply concerning. Mayor Bowser's emergency order aims to address this by increasing capacity within the Department of Youth Rehab Rehabilitation Services. While these measures are crucial, the viewpoint from YWP and various stakeholders underscores the necessity for the multi-pronged approach. Behind reactive measures, we advocate for proactive programs, community support, counseling, and long-term solutions that empower the nurture of youth. There is a need to balance immediate interventions with sustained efforts aimed at address addressing root causes and nurturing the well-being for our youth. In this period of emergency, it is imperative to not only address immediate concerns, but also lay groundwork for sustained community-driven solutions. Our commitment remains steadfast in contributing to the well-beings of DC's youth, and we stand ready to collaborate and support initiatives that prioritize the mental health and safety. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, I don't see Ms. Reed Witt, um, but I do see Dr. McCowan. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. My name is Dr. Maya McEwen, and I'm a pediatric resident physician in Washington, D.C., and a member of the D.C. chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. I want to talk in detail about my perspective as a doctor taking care of kids who've experienced gun violence and the urgent need to prioritize well-coordinated and community-led violence prevention strategies. I want to tell you about a sweet patient I took care of in the hospital, Kiesia, who has chosen to use a different name and is generously allowing me to share her story. Over the summer, Kiesia attended an outdoor birthday party where gunshots rang out and struck her in the lower leg. Thankfully, she survived, but her road to recovery has been long and challenging. She has had breaks in multiple bones that required multiple surgeries with many pins and screws, a skin graft due to blast wounds damaging surrounding tissue, and physical therapy, which she continues to this day. Our psychologist also noted during her hospitalization, she was already showing early signs of PTSD. As we chatted, I learned that Kiesia enjoyed doing hair and lashes and was excited about the mayor's youth summer employment program. She and her mom also told me how they were nervous about returning to their home since Kiesia was not the first of her family or friends to experience gun violence. In fact, her mom was shot two years ago, just a few blocks away from their home. The medical and public health community recognizes violence as a chronic disease with multiple systemic triggers like poverty, housing insecurity, community disinvestment, and racism. In medicine, we talk a lot about safe discharges and making sure patients are set up for success once they leave the hospital. Despite Kiesia's mom sharing their safety concerns and history of violence exposure with the city, Kiesia's family didn't qualify for temporary housing, relocation services, or even a home security system because the more recent crime did not happen specifically in her neighborhood. 
As a doctor, I feel like I'm working with one hand tied behind my back. I can do my best to address the medical and mental health care, but I'm discharging children back to a community where they don't feel safe and which has already significantly harmed them. We cannot wait until a child is rushed to an emergency department to intervene. Violence prevention is a life or death matter. I go into further detail in my written testimony, but our children deserve strong citywide coordination, communication, and investment into key city agencies with appropriate leadership, trauma-informed staff, and sufficient funding. Keisha's mom still struggles to access crime victims' compensation that would help offset medical and mental health expenses as well as lost wages while taking care of her daughter, and she feels re-traumatized every time she calls. We desperately need the city to address well-known social drivers of violence by increasing access to SNAP benefits, parental support, and employment opportunities, as well as affordable housing and relocation services. We need quality education with violence interrupters directly at schools, working on the ground with youth ambassadors. This work needs to be place-based, consistent, and supported with other key services like social work, mentorship, and mental health providers. Having roughly one social worker for every 200 students and one school psychologist for every 400 students is unacceptable. We must listen to children when they say they feel safe and need more support. In summary, please listen to the children and families and community members who've experienced this horrific trauma and act now to implement solutions. Our kids desperately need a well-coordinated, well-funded approach to violence prevention and youth mental health that meets families where they live, work, study, and play well before they get to us at the hospital. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. Um, I don't see Belinda Taylor. Um, so we have reached the end of the list. So I want to thank everyone uh, for their testimonies. Um, Ms. Uh, Dr. McCowan, I, I want to ask a follow-up question. Um, you know, you say that we need more social workers. We need more there, but we need more. What's, what's the solution for our workforce challenge, right? I um, We have fully funded our school-based mental health program and I still have 32% vacancies. Um, I've got nurse vacancies. We have school therapist vacancies. I have charter schools who are like, we're trying to find people, um, in the same vein, I have all of my social service agencies who are looking for social workers, case managers, et cetera. Like, where do we get the workforce? You know, I don't have a Great answer to your question, but I think we do need to train from within. The folks coming from the communities understand the problems best and are um, best able to address students' and families' needs. So there's definitely a shortage. I think there has to be some incentives included, um, but we need this to be place-based. So services, as many have said before, need to be accessible um, financially, physically, um, like including language access to. Uh, it's definitely an issue, but we need to work within communities. You know, there's so many advocates that have spoken here today that have significant personal experience um, and can really be great mentors. Even that is a building block towards um, improving youth mental health. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, I want to thank the rest of the panel for your testimony. Unfortunately, the part, the, the sad part coming at the end, a lot of <laughs> a lot of people have said some of the similar things that you all have said, which is helpful to sort of reinforce that message. Um, and I want to particularly um, thank um, Hillary and Samaya. It's always good to have youth voices at hearings that are about youth. So I appreciate you all being here. I don't have any further questions. Um, Councilmember White, do you have any questions for this panel? No, I'm just excited to hear from the young people. Um, you know me. Uh, I think they add a tremendous value to the conversation. We have to listen to them more. And I want to thank you uh, Councilmember Henderson for your leadership on this and having this hearing. I'm now I look forward to hearing uh, from the government witness and even hear them respond to some of the things they heard from the residents of the District of Columbia throughout the day because I know Dr. Bazaron is there in person. There are a number of other government witnesses tuning in and government leaders. So I look forward to the government witnesses. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So what we're going to do is just take a, a brief break. And by brief, I do mean brief. It will be five minutes. Um, so we have five uh, government witnesses. Um, I, I want to welcome my colleagues from other, uh, clusters. So Dr. Bazaran knows this well, cause she's testified before the committee before. Um, I don't know what my colleagues do, but we do put our government witnesses on a clock. You get 10 minutes. So let's take this five minutes, review your testimonies. Um, it's already been a very long day. We're going to get started right around six. And so if you can stick to your time, that would be very well appreciated. All right, thank you. We'll take a five minute break.
You are free.
Okay, and we're back. Um, so we we've got a lot of government witnesses today, and probably because um, we learned that sometimes. When we just only do a single agency, they say, oh, no, 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 it's not us. That's somebody else. And now we have everybody here so we can sort of get down to um, some of the meat of the situation. Um, but we don't have enough seats for everybody. So we're going to do this in two panels. Um, so we're going to start with um, our government witness from the Public Defender Service and the Office of the Attorney General. And then we will transition to our government witnesses from Department of Behavioral Health, Department of Youth Rehabilitation Services, and the Office of Neighborhood Safety and Engagement. Um, so I want to thank you all again for being here. Um, but before you begin, as a um, custom of the council, I need to swear you all in. Um, so what we're going to do, I'm going to do this as a joint thing for everybody right now. So if you are going to testify or you may be speaking, so that means if you're coming up to the table, you might answer a question. Everybody raise your right hand. All right. Do you swear or affirm under the penalty of law that the testimony you're about to provide to the Council of the District of Columbia and this committee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. All right. So, Ms. Simonova, why don't you go ahead and begin? Thank you. Good evening. I'm Katerina Semyonova, Special Counsel for Policy and Legislation at the Public Defender Service. Thank you very much for convening this roundtable. With me today to answer questions are Hannah McElhaney, Deputy Chief of PDS's Juvenile Division, who has spent more than two decades representing youth and supervising their representation in juvenile court, and Claire Kruger, a longtime staff attorney in PDS's Juvenile Services Program. JSP has provided support and legal assistance to youth since 1982 by staffing legal rights offices in the district's detention facilities. While JSP provides an essential legal service to youth, it is not an oversight entity. It does not inspect DYRS facilities. The council directed PDS to create JSP to address the horrific deprivations that children faced at the district's juvenile detention facilities of Cedar Knoll and Oak Hill. JSP's continued access to youth detention facilities and role in serving incarcerated youth is codified as a result of legislation championed by Council Member Treon White. This hearing is an essential counterpoint to the many conversations being held about so-called youth crime. This hearing offers insight into the fact that children are being pushed into the delinquency and criminal legal systems by the district's failure to offer timely and effective behavioral health screenings and services. And even when children finally are in those systems, they are still being denied the basic care that they need and deserve. Deficits in accessibility, continuity, and depth across DC's behavioral health system, magnified by deficits in coordination and care in the juvenile legal system, combine to produce heartbreaking results for kids who are struggling. While in some parts of city, while in some parts of the city, schools and providers are handling kids' anxiety, depression, and social isolation with outreach and treatment. In other parts of the city, parents face daunting wait lists, a dearth of qualified providers, and incarceration in, in place of support. We cannot keep asking why our teenagers are acting out without taking responsibility for the failures of the agencies that are supposed to provide for their health and safety during their childhood and adolescence. Youth who become court-involved face numerous challenges, which can include a lack of stable housing and homelessness, a lack of educational and economic, economic opportunities for themselves and their caregivers, and commitment to CFSA. Nearly all court-involved youth in the district are Black, and they also shoulder the burden of race-based disparities in health, evidenced by a 15-year difference in life expectancy between Ward 8 and Ward 3 residents, and a COVID death rate that meant that 75% of all district residents who died from COVID were Black. Court-involved youth frequently have caregivers who have their own serious medical and mental health problems, and nearly all court-involved youth have been exposed to violence and trauma. To be clear, it is not that court-involved youth happen to have these challenges and have happened to have these experiences of violence and trauma. Rather, it is because the youth face these challenges and have these experiences that they become court-involved. Juvenile court is supposed to be about rehabilitation, but there is little opportunity for rehabilitation if the responsible district agencies are not providing behavioral health support for youth who are in acute need of services. PDS's testimony will focus on the ways the district has failed to address the mental health needs of youth who have come into contact with the juvenile legal system. Beginning with securely detained youth, securely detained youth in the district are held at the Youth Services Center or at New Beginnings. The Youth Services Center is primarily a placement for youth who are held pretrial, although there are many youth at YSC who are committed to the custody of DYRS and who are there awaiting placement to various settings such as group homes or out of district residentials. Some youth stay at YSC for months, others stay for days or weeks. The fact that children who are held pretrial may leave at any time following a court decision presents challenges in providing these youth with immediate and consistent access to mental health services. 
That said, every pretrial youth has an assigned probation officer from court social services who should be working on connecting the youth with community-based services, ensuring continuity of care once youth are in community, and helping DYRS to facilitate treatment while youth are at YSC. Youth who are at YSC for weeks or months, including youth for whom DYRS can predict a likely release date, have extremely limited access to any mental health services other than medication. All children see a psychiatrist within 24 to 48 hours of arriving at YSC, and they were very frequently medicated, with a large number of children being prescribed sleeping pills and antidepressants like trazodone. But children, be despite being prescribed psychotropic medication, do not receive routine therapy. At best, they receive what could be labeled spot treatment. A therapist employed by DYRS may walk through a housing unit and ask if anyone wants to talk to them. If a child says that they want to speak to a therapist, they are pulled into what is called a game space where all the other children on the unit can see them. Meetings with a DYRS therapist in the game space can be brief and are always irregularly offered. When population numbers are high and therefore mental health needs are also high, these meetings often take place through a cell door. While DYRS and the court system all agree that nearly all youth who are court involved have been exposed to trauma and need intensive therapy and grief counseling, these, get, these youth get nothing more than spot treatment. Youth who are lucky enough, who were lucky enough to have been receiving therapy in the community stop receiving those services because providers refuse to come to YSC. During their stay at YSC, youth may also be discharged from community-based programs as a result of their detention. One issue is, is that currently community providers cannot get reimbursed for seeing youth in detention settings. This is an issue that could be remedied if the district applied for a pilot funding stream, which is now available through Medicaid. While youth at New Beginnings receive better mental health treatment than those at YSC, DYRS is not fully meeting the needs of those youth either. At New Beginnings, there is, there is a mental health staff member assigned to each unit, and children see that provider weekly. Some youth have been able to establish a therapeutic relationship with the provider and have benefited from those services. DRS has also attempted to do family therapy at New Beginnings and some families have accessed those services. However, there are still too few modalities of therapy offered and there is too little focus on grief and trauma. Turning to court involved youth who are in the community, there is an absolute failure to deliver services to them. Youth who leave YSC after a judge orders release leave with no discharge planning beyond having a five-day supply of medication. Regardless of whether the youth is placed initially at YSC or released pretrial to the community, Court Social Service conducts a mental health screening of all youth at the inception of every juvenile case. Part of that screening is administering the Connors, a screening tool that provides information about whether the child needs follow-up mental health care. When the Connors suggests the need for follow-up care, court social services should alert DBH that there is a family that would benefit from services, and then DBH should offer to connect that family with desired services. None of that currently happens. For committed youth, when they are first released to the community, DYRS completes a youth level of care and case plan, level of service and case plan, which uses a risk and needs assessment and case management data to determine the youth's level of placement and treatment plan. DYRS also releases some youth with nothing more than a community placement agreement, a document that merely details their release conditions. The community placement agreement will typically require youth to get mental health treatment, but will not necessarily provide more information about how a family should set this up. The youth level of care and case plan will also call for mental health services, including trauma and grief counseling. However, these services are largely aspirational and any access to them is poorly implemented. DYRS sometimes schedules services without communicating about those services to the youth and their parent, or the services will have long waiting lists that are impossible for the youth and family to monitor. Under the best circumstances, DYRS caseworkers may schedule an intake appointment for mental health treatment, but it is left on the youth to find their own way to the appointment and complete it. Even if the youth has an intake appointment, they will still normally spend weeks and sometimes more than a month on waiting lists to start treatment. Because they are minors, youth's access to treatment almost always depends on a parent being able to take them, despite the likelihood that the parent has been impacted by similar trauma and the likelihood of having competing demands from employment and other children on their time and transportation resources. While the court or DYRS may order that a youth receive grief therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, or family therapy, there are just not enough providers operating under these different modalities. The Wendt Center is the district's only provider of grief therapy and has a waiting list that is more than six months long. Court-involved youth without private insurance primarily use Medicaid managed care organizations for treatment. With these organizations, it is hard to determine what services each offer, uh, provider offers 
There are few, if any, appointment reminders, and there is no information provided to youth and families about the services that the youth may receive and what is therein entailed. There's also no continuum of care for youth. As Disability Rights DC stated in a recent report, the district provides at most a limited array of services on a limited basis with limited effect. Um, experts and advocates have attested that there is a serious lack of, of a continuation of services and that, that as a result, children cycle in and out of institutions between hospitals, residential facilities, and detention. The system's limitations include a lack of partial hospitalization program, the failure to create a day program for youth, and the lack of inpatient substance abuse treatment. There's also no transparency for youth, their parents, and for the social workers and lawyers trying to help them. DBH does not have a dashboard that people can consult to see how many providers are available, the type of providers and services available, and the length of wait lists. Everyone who depends on DBH, including judges, is in the dark about what treatment is truly and immediately available and how it can be accessed. The one tool that helped, the Access Helpline, which could be called to schedule intake appointments, is now, according to DBH, going to close. Instead, families and youth will be given a long list of providers that they must call individually to ask about um, intake appointment availability. Contrast this with the, contrast this lack of transparency about the availability of mental health care with the information being pushed out about leaf collection, and it is stark. Um, I see that I'm at time, um, and so I only had a couple of sentences to wrap up, um, and they are this, that in closing, instead of calling for accountability in the form of more incarceration and pretrial detention for youth who have so little power over their circumstances, the council should be calling for accountability for DBH and DYRS and the other agencies that have failed to provide the necessary services to these youth and their families. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify and we welcome any questions. Thank you. Ms. Weiser. Oh, yep, there you go. Let me try again. Good evening, Chairperson Henderson. I'm Elizabeth Weiser. I'm the Deputy Attorney General for Public Safety from the Office of the Attorney General. Thank you for the invitation to testify here today and for addressing this very, very important issue. Um, your joint effort and the collective focus of your respective committees with Councilperson White and Councilperson Pinto are extremely important and it's consistent with the whole of government approach we need to address this very pressing problem. Thousands of district children have mental and behavioral health issues, including trauma, anxiety, and depression. Left untreated or undertreated, these illnesses contribute to truancy and juvenile crime. We hear far too often from parents that their pleas for help for their children go unanswered until the child gets arrested. This makes DC less safe. To drive down the rates of juvenile crime, we need to provide more and better mental health resources for our children before they get arrested and prevent them from committing crimes in the first place and after they get arrested to prevent them from reoffending. The district, like the nation as a whole, is facing startlingly high rates of mental health and behavioral health issues among children. A 2021 report from the Children's Law Center told us that roughly 22% of DC's children, more than two, two, sorry, 20,000 youngsters, have a mental, emotional, development, or behavioral issue. And 47% of district kids have experienced an adverse childhood experience that can lead to behavioral problems. Approximately a third of DC high school students have experienced symptoms of depression. And a 2022 study from Mental Health America estimates that 41% of depressed youth in DC do not receive the mental health services they need. A 2022 report from Disability Rights DC noted that despite the increase in the number of youth needing services during the pandemic, the number of DC kids actually getting these services decreased. That all adds up to an alarming number of children in our city who have depression, anxiety, hopelessness, trauma, and a lack of self-worth with seemingly no effective outlet for help. So how do kids get the help they need so that they have healthy outlets to address their trauma and do not create disruptive, unhealthy patterns that lead to committing crime? At OAG, our commitment to solving these problems extends beyond exercising our prosecutorial authority. Our Child Support Services Division works to secure the necessary financial support for children to experience responsible parenting, family self-sufficiency, and child well-being. 
our Family Services Division works on behalf of abused and neglected kids to get them into safe and supportive environments. And our Public Advocacy Division has sued private corporations who have contributed to addictive and unhealthy behavior in the district's youth, including Juul for marketing its highly addictive nicotine products to district's youth and Meta for knowingly designing social media platforms with features that cause harm to kids' mental, emotional, and physical health. OAG also invests in working to keep kids in school through our two truancy prevention programs, Attend and I Belong Here. Do all of this because we know that untreated behavioral or mental health needs can lead to a child becoming involved in the juvenile justice system. Our office has said many times before, Prosecution is by definition reactive. A parent or teacher struggling to get a child help should not have to wait for them to commit a crime to receive services. They should be able to seek those services proactively to prevent the crime from happening in the first place. But when all else fails and a child ends up in the juvenile justice system, we approach the case with two goals in mind. Number one, how do we keep our community safe and number two, how do we get troubled youth back on track so that they don't reoffend? The answer varies as it should on a case by case basis. Sometimes we can divert a youth from prosecution and refer them to much needed counseling and social services. In appropriate cases, we refer kids to Hope Court or to the Juvenile Behavioral Diversion Program. For more serious or repeat offenders, we ask the court to commit the youth to the district's custody after which we expect other district agencies to seize the opportunity to rehabilitate that child. Unfortunately, we often see that district youth do not have quick and easy access to quality behavioral and mental health services. There are too few programs in DC and those that exist often have long waiting lists, many of them ineffective options for people trying to get kids the immediate help they need. We need more mental health professionals more access to treatment, and an inpatient psychiatric treatment facility for children here in the District of Columbia. When a youth is experiencing an acute mental health crisis and needs hospitalization, our only option is a private psychiatric hospital that has about 10 beds for children from the District of Maryland and Virginia. In the absence of a facility in DC, kids have been sent to inpatient facilities hundreds and thousands of miles away. This makes it difficult for kids to stay connected with their families and communities and increases the difficulty of coordinating transition services once a kid is discharged. Our city needs to fund and operate an inpatient psychiatric hospital for the district's children. We need a central facility in the district that has the capacity to quickly conduct forensic examinations for children in crisis, to provide inpatient treatment and to be a hub for referrals to community-based resources so that families and children can be supported in a meaningful way when inpatient treatment is unnecessary. We must provide more behavioral health support, including counselors, social workers, restorative justice facilitators, and mentors to children in school. Our teachers have a bird's eye view into the lives of our children. We should be listening and learning from them and responding to their pleas for more behavioral health resources. There's no denying that accountability up to and including secure detention is a key component in reducing juvenile crime, but prosecution does not treat depression or trauma and is no substitute for effective and efficient mental and behavioral health treatment. To truly make the district safer for children with behavioral health needs, we need effective prevention interventions, accountability, and rehabilitative treatment. Thank you again for the invitation to testify here today and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you. Um, and thank you to this panel of witnesses. We're gonna do um, 10 minute rounds. We'll see where we go from here. But I, I do appreciate all of your testimonies and um, <clears throat> um, for for PDS, I, I wanna start, um, gosh, there's so many places where I could start. There were, your, your testimony was incredibly meaty in terms of talking about some of the challenges that we're having, but I want to try to approach it from some of the solutions and sort of some of these pieces. So um, I forget which hearing it was. We requested information or we we looked at a report around the number of youth at YSC who are on psych psychotropic medications um, and who hadn't had the 
uh, appropriate follow-up um, within the appropriate amount of time, resulting in some kids having side effects to the drugs that they were on. I think there was one kid who like um, uh, uh, took on like 80 pounds um, and no one thought to be like, wait, <laughs> how does someone gain 80 pounds uh, at YSC um, in, in such a short period of time? Let's look in terms of um, whether or some other things, but um, your testimony about there not being routine therapy offered is something that I think would be very um, surprising to folks because the agency is called the Department of Rehabilitation Services. So if we're not doing routine therapy, whether it be group, individual, or otherwise, um, are we missing an opportunity to help heal in that moment? Okay, if you just introduce yourself for the record. Um, my name is Claire Kruger. I'm an attorney with the Juvenile Services Program within the Public Defender Service. Um, yes, I think the answer to that is yes, we're definitely missing an opportunity. And I think part of the issue, for example, at YSC that Katya touched on is that while it is a transient population of young people there, so I understand why it is hard to provide consistent therapy, there are young people there who are there for more than two weeks, three weeks. That there's kids there that are there close to a year. So those are kids that we can target as needing consistent therapy and shouldn't be treated the same as the transient population. With that said, I also think even for the transient population, it's an opportunity where there are kids in secure detention who have undoubtedly come there due to trauma, poverty, mental health concerns, a variety of issues that could be treated by consistent therapy. And so the process even if they're there for a few days and they can't receive consistent mental health support there because they're only there for a few days, again, it's also about a continuum of care and mm -hmm. figuring out how to provide access to continued therapy after they've touched the, the juvenile court system. But yes, at YSC, what I have seen um, is a lot of spot treatment, um, lack of consistency with the same therapist, um, and a lot of treatment in public spaces where kids can be seen having a conversation with a mental health provider, which obviously is stigmatizing. So. Yeah. I imagine a situation though, if everybody had to go talk to the therapist, then it's not a stigma because oh, everybody's going, this is your little time slot or this is your day to go. Um, it just becomes routine as norm, um, which is interesting. So if you had to say what, what are the biggest barrier for your clients um, as, uh, accessing appropriate behavioral health services, what would you say is that? So in our testimony, we separated this out into youth who are detained, securely detained, and youth who are in the community. So I think that that's one separate point, and I'll pass it. Good evening, I'm Hannah McElhenney, head of the juvenile um, unit within the trial division of the Public Defender Service. Um, with respect to, I actually think this is true for kids across the board, but certainly with respect to kids in the community, it's two problems. It's that there aren't actual services available for them. There isn't grief therapy, even if you want it. There isn't real trauma-informed therapy, even if you want it. There aren't enough therapists who can do the therapy in your home when your family has access issues in terms of getting, so it just isn't there and it's not transparent. If I wanna make an appointment at LabCorp for myself for a blood draw, there's a website, I can just see which days it's available, see what times they're there. Mm -hmm. it, there. There are no barriers to me figuring out access for my own healthcare. But my clients and their parents, you have to go through this very difficult access helpline and then you make an intake and then they let you know whether there's a provider and then you're weeks in before you find out, oh, there actually isn't grief therapy for you. And you've been managing your whole life in the interim. So I think it's both that there is no there there and that we don't have sort of a transparent, I heard you speak earlier about the need for a dashboard or yeah. how helpful that could be. We would see what we have and don't have if we could all see what existed um, and we'd be more able to fix it and clients and their families would be more able to know whether pursuing it would be fruitful. Okay, I think the dashboard, I don't know, we'll ask Dr. Bazaran, I think it's under works or something that we have been thinking about or talking about. Um, but the transparency of a process, I think, is something that's super important in terms of um, folks not feeling uh, or 
being daunted by it. Um, you know, Miss Weiser, I wanted to ask, um, obviously you're seeing um, kids and their families on the other side after something has already happened from a um, prevention treatment standpoint. If there is a young person that you all, OAG wants to do a diversion with, and you believe that they could um, benefit from some behavioral health supports, is that a um, a divert? Is that something that you can request from the court? Like, um, <laughs> this child needs to attend therapy for like twice a week as part of their condition of release. So, by the nature of diversion, diversion means we're not involved in court at all, right? So that means we've made the decision that we can treat, we can help this young person without penetrating the justice system. So we would refer. Our, our resources, the Department of Human Services and the ACE Diversion Program. And okay. so we would refer to ACE directly. They would do an intake of the young person and the family and, and identify the treatment needs for the child. Okay. If a child is charged, yeah. I think this is going to your, to your question more precisely. If a child is charged and is under the supervision of the court and the court sets conditions of release, we can ask for assessments, we can ask for curfew and school attendance, and we can ask for court social services recommendations to be implemented in the release order that the court gives to the young person and the parent. And that includes, can include a parent participation order that asks the parent to agree to participate in getting services for the young person. Okay. But in order to do that, you need to know what's available as an option, right? Yes, and I would I would suggest that that our prosecutors standing up in court are not the experts to figure out what is needed for a young person. So we do defer to court social services, who does the intake evaluation of the young person, and meets with a family in order to determine at least initially after the Connor screening, as Ms. Seminova mentioned, and after interviews, at least makes an initial assessment of what the young person needs, and then informs the court of those needs. Okay. From a timeline perspective, how long does this take? How long does it take to go from an intake review screening to someone actually seeing a provider? I would defer to the public defenders. And I think I know that Ms. McElhenney probably has a better idea on that than me. If it's a child who's never been connected to a core service agency, if it's from intake to being connected to a provider, I would estimate like eight weeks. Eight weeks. Because- the recommendation gets made often without regard to whether the services that are being recommended exist, but you should engage in therapy. You go home, you make the intake appointment. The intake appointment isn't for another two weeks. You do the intake appointment and then you're connected to the core service agency and they refer you to a provider. And then it just depends on whether the provider has availability. Then how can this be a triage option if we don't even do intake until two weeks after an incident has already occurred? really challenging. Okay. And it's, it's, as Ms. Weezer said earlier, a lot of times by the time I'm meeting a child, it's a parent who has wanted help for their kid for months or years. Has been because, asking like, yes, right. They shouldn't be coming to the court to get mental health ser services for their kid, but they are often expressing exhaustion and frustration that this is where they've ended up because it's the place where they're getting help trying to find mental health services for the child. I'm reading a book now. It's called Uneasy Peace it's by a professor from Princeton. And he's talking about how one of the things in terms of trust of the trust of any criminal justice system between the trust of the system and the trust of the community is swift justice, right? Or swift action. Um, and when folks don't feel like the system is going to work, that is when they take action into their own hands. So if I'm thinking about a situation of, we're going from intake to provider, and it could be an eight-week process before you even have an opportunity to talk to someone to process whatever it is that you're going through. In that eight-week period of time, if you see the other person, you're going to retaliate because that is your opportunity to seek justice because you don't feel like justice is being sought or anyone is actually helping you in that moment. Um, so I want to dig more into this timeline question, um, but I'm over my time. Councilmember White. Yes, thank you. 
and thank you to uh, the public defender service. I, I have a question because on the vein of intake, I guess for, part of my frustration, and I don't know if it's accurate or not, I can only go by what the youth told me while there, is that the extended stay in intake uh, at DYS beyond a normal period of time and the amount of trauma is causing them to stay in their cells longer than normal. Um, and I know I don't know if you heard this or not, but some were saying they were in their cells for 23 hours and, and let out for an hour. Um, and I want to get your perspective on that, if you heard or saw that, and their ability to get uh, adequate services during that time, if true. Good evening, Council Member White. Um, yes, so I work um, inside of, uh, we have offices inside of both YSC and New Beginnings, and there was a period of time um, in the past month where for, I would say, at least three of the weeks in the month, there were youth being held on intake um, daily and for multiple days at a time. So what I mean by that is there were every day there were youth being held on intake who were there for two, three, four, five days. I know one young person who was um, there for almost three weeks um, well, while they were on t intake because that's not a programming unit. They were not outside of their intake cells for more than an hour at a time. And when they were out, that was usually to access the shower or the phone to call their family. Um, the What I heard from them and what I saw is exactly what you heard. There was limited programming. The education was inside of their cell and not in the classroom. Um, limited access to mental health. Um, and many of the youths, um, as you would imagine, their mental health was significantly deteriorating in that time because they were confined in a, in a cell for um, 23 hours a day. So yes, I saw that as well. And I um, definitely think that if we're talking about trauma for young people who come into this facility traumatized, that only exacerbates trauma and um, leads to increased mental health concerns. As an aside, there are um, I've seen a much higher level of kids being on SPS, which is suicide prevention status at YSC. Um, and they continue to deteriorate. Their mental health continues to deteriorate at YSC. And they do have access to the mental health providers there, but um, they continue to be on SPS for months. So clearly um, that support isn't working. And something besides incarceration needs to be done. But yes, um, to answer your yeah. council member white, that that is what I saw on intake at YSC. And in addition to the time spent in sales, uh, I do want to also go and ask about the time there because it was intake as I know it, it's supposed to be 10 days, but we have some individuals that's been there for three weeks, five weeks, even up to two months. Have you seen or heard that? So, um, it said why this was at YSC. So, so how I, you know, I'm not DYRS, so I don't want to speak to their policy. What I, what I can tell you is what I see. And what I see is that the process is supposed to be that when a youth um, is arrested and then gets arraigned and comes to YSC from court, they will be on the intake unit, usually for a medical evaluation, a psychiatric assessment, um, and then they'll be assigned to a unit. So the common protocol I've seen is that kids are on intake for uh, less than, uh, a day and then they go to their unit um, and they might be what you might be thinking of is sometimes they do have to quarantine for five to 10 days, but usually that's done on a intake unit, um, but not an intake itself, which is its, its own separate part of the facility. Um, and so this recent stint of kids being held on intake, which is its own separate part of the facility where the kids are coming in after being arrested, um, that is a newer thing I've seen that uh, seems correlated to uh, overcrowding at the facility that was happening previously. But usually kids come into intake, are there for less than a day, and then transition to an intake unit. Okay. Now, someone mentioned that, men that the mental health services are often provided from door from the door of a cell, uh, who mentioned that? And did did do we know if DYS gave an explanation of why that is? 
my understanding was that there was a period of time and from what I saw where there were um, there was a lot of overcrowding at the facility. There was kids being confined in their cells as a result um, of understaffing and overcrowding. Um, and as a result, because there, there was a lot of cell confinement and kids weren't being able to come on the floor altogether, mental health staff had to go to the door to check on the youth through the door. Um, I saw that happen multiple times. I don't know what DeWiris' response was to that. Okay. Um, I do know there has been some allegations uh, in reference to, how do I word it? You've not been able to access the, 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 their parents and their legal teams. Um, and a lot of what I found out later on was a lot of times it's doing critical incidents where if it's a, a brawl or a fight, that day or that night, maybe the next morning, or certain um, untraditional circumstances. Uh, are you all hearing or seeing any of that as far as you've not able to access their legal services and access their phone calls? I'm going to turn it to Hannah regarding the legal access because I know she's had um, some experience with that. I will say in terms of family access, there, I ha there have been times in the past where due to, um, you know, due to facility, it's my understanding that it's, you know, what I said before, overcrowding and understaffing that family visits have had to be canceled for weekends and kids haven't been let out of their cells to make calls to their family members. Um, I have seen that happen. With regards to legal access, I'll turn to Hannah. Thank you. We have not resumed pre-pandemic legal access to the facilities. So lawyers used to be able to go in and see their clients at any point during the day up until about nine o'clock at night without making an appointment in advance. And we could also call the facility directly and talk to our clients. None of that's the case anymore. Everything happens by appointment now and only in the afternoons. Even when you have an appointment, if there's an unusual incident, they won't let any lawyers in the back to see clients. Plus lately we've had some um, COVID quarantine. So there's definitely been a restriction on legal access to clients in that it only happens by appointment. Family visitation, I think DeWires has expanded their family visitation lately, which is fantastic. Um, but similarly, when there's unusual incidents, they won't let anybody where the kids are. And so families travel and come see their kids and then can't get back to see the kids when there's a security incident within the facility. And I've heard of that happening probably twice in the last month. All right. The quick question is, this, a student educational attorney is often what knowledgeable. Uh, about the students' mental health needs and resources, in, mo in most cases, not all. Uh, do you know if the school-aged youth are provided access to the educational attorneys while detained? I'm happy to take that. The answer to that is yes, with the same restrictions as their delinquency attorneys. You have to make an appointment at least 24 hours in advance, and it can only happen after between 3 p.m. and 8 p.m., but the educational attorneys can visit their clients in the facilities under those circumstances. Do you have any advice, or you guys have any advice on what we can suggest to DYS to shorten their intake process uh, and the process of being able to access their legal uh, services for the young people? Yes, it's like my Christmas wish list. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, I, in terms of shortening intake, I think that's an overcrowding understaffing problem. So I think that's just, that's difficult because DYRS has to have enough staff to handle the residents and then you don't have as many unusual incidents. And in terms of legal access, I would love for us to go back to the pre-pandemic system where lawyers could come during the day. A lot of lawyers don't work in the evenings um, and it just makes it really hard to see the client. So being able to call the facility and talk to your client on the phone and being able to come without an appointment, which also requires enough staff, would be things that we would love to see. Got it. I'll digress back to the chairwoman. Um, thank you, um, Chair White. I, I just have a few more questions for this um, um, panel. trying to um, sort of place it adequately here um, is, well, let me ask this. Okay. So once a youth is currently 
if they are committed, um, they're no longer eligible for Medicaid or it's sort of put on pause. One of the things that we've heard a challenge with with DC jail is that it takes a long time. Well, not a long time, but the there's not seamless coordination in when someone is being prepared for release in order for Medicaid to be turned back on. So if they had been on medications while incarcerated, it's now taking two to three days for them to be able to have access to do that again. Um, is that an issue in the juvenile population as well in terms of being able to you all communicate with Department of Healthcare Finance in order to get this young person's um, Medicaid services back? Get back to you on that. Okay. Uh, just trying to, it's supposed to be seamless, but we're hearing that that is not often the case. And then you have um, instances of yeah. backsliding and, and, and other things. We have social workers that work very closely with the lawyers who represent the clients and with the clients. And so I think we probably have access to the to how that is working for our clients. So we will follow up with the committee. All right. Um, to what extent, so we talked a lot about how um, when you're dealing with young people, you're also dealing with their parents. For better or worse, otherwise, it's part of the process. Um, and especially when we're talking about treatment of young people who might be exhibiting some behavioral health challenges, et cetera. Um, it is sometimes the case that the parent also needs help too. How do you all navigate that situation when that arises in cases? We try to do it thoughtfully, I think is my answer. The juvenile behavioral diversion program that's run through DC Superior Court has specialized staff, the judge, the probation officers, the um, prosecutors from the OAG who are trained in and more sensitive to family issues that sort of you know pop up in every generation. And that program is pretty effective, but it's also very limited to relatively low level offenses and kids who don't recidivate. So that's a very limited set of people. Um, we do a lot of training at the Public Defender Service mm -hmm. on how to handle generational trauma and generational health issues. Um, but we also only represent about a third of the kids who come through delinquency court and the rest are represented by private attorneys who take appointments from the Superior Court. And beyond that, I can't really speak to whether those attorneys the judges, the prosecution staff that's not assigned to the behavioral diversion program have particular training or experience in doing that. But I completely agree with you that it's a real factor in almost all of our cases, both in terms of behavioral health and just in terms of trauma and experience with the neighborhoods they live in. The parents are coming from the same perspective the kids are. Yeah. So I, I agree it's an issue. Uh, Ms. Weezer, you talked about the ACE diversion program. How many slots is available in that? I think that I have some stats about how many referrals we made this past year. I think um, okay. we we sent about a hundred and I'm sorry, 120, sorry, 159 delinquency cases so far this year. And for our, our truancy kids, we sent about 61 of those children. Um, so I think that their capacity is up above 250 to 300. I think that's sort of the range. Okay. Because then I have to ask the questions around what is their capacity around providers, right? Obviously in the diversion program, there's a lot of other wraparound services that are being provided. But um, again, it's sort of like this wait list or, or just the the waiting of time. I had a, right. um, a friend of mine who was a public defender in Atlanta and she used to lament that um, there's always wait lists for diversion programs. There's always wait lists for rehabilitation programs. There's always wait lists for substance abuse programs. There's never a wait list for jail. And I was like, yep, you're right. And so it, it begs the question of what is like the, um, is the system even set up in the way that can help or is the system designed the way that it is designed for a particular reason. And I just want us to be able to do something different um, on, on all, of, all of these fronts. 
but I know it, it is not, it's a workforce challenge issue, et cetera. Um, I want to ask for the two attorneys, you have conversations with your clients. Is there ever a point of reflection around if I only had X, I wouldn't be here right now? What's the X? Yes, we have that conversation all the time because what got you here is what will get you out. I mean, sort of knowing the, the circumstances and causes is absolutely how we change your trajectory if we can. My clients are so insightful about I wouldn't have been here if not for these factors. They Kids know when people care about them and kids know when people are trying to help them and when they're not trying to help them. So all the time they say some version of nobody else is trying to keep me safe. And so I'm trying to keep myself safe or I can't act in this particular way because it'll bring on all these other consequences for me out in the world because there is no... There is no therapist in my school. There is nobody helping my mom out so she's not stressed out when she comes home. I don't understand what's happening in any of my classes, so why am I going there? They absolutely see. I mean, Council Member White earlier said, you know, where your heart is there, your treasure will be also. I just mm -hmm. think, yes, we, we show kids how much we care all the time, and they know. So I have kids who are at YSC who are saying, I am trying to manage this by myself. What got me here and the situation I'm in now, and I'm trying to teach myself coping skills, because here in this facility, there's nobody to do that for me. Kids say it coming from the outside, but when a kid is already here, it just breaks my heart to hear it. Because I think, well, to your point, what are you here for if it's not for that? Yeah, I echo everything Hannah said. And um, every time, you know, I work directly with kids inside of the facility and every time it's the same story. It's um, I'm just trying to keep myself safe. I don't feel safe going anywhere or I just need a money. I just need a job because school doesn't work for me. Now that's a different question about why school is not working for yep, them. Yep. Right. But, um, so I think it's this, like just this dearth of resource, this lack of resources in their communities. And as Hannah said, the kids know it, they feel it. And I think it's, they know what they need and what's happening is out of desperation because of the lack of all of these things, but it's mental health support, money, education, potential, you know, relocation for some of them, um, support for their parents. Um, yeah. And as Hannah said, they're so insightful and they know all of that. Um, I don't have any other further questions for this panel. Council member white, did you have any other questions for this panel? I'm going to assume not. So thank you so much. And we'll go on to our last um, government witnesses. Thank you. Okay. So now we will hear from the director of behavioral health, D department of um, youth rehabilitation services and the interim director for the office of neighborhood safety and engagement. I'm going to um, implore my partners in this brevity so we could just get to discussion would be very well appreciated. <laughs> All right, Dr. Bazaran, are you ready? Good afternoon, uh, Chair Henderson and council members and council staff. I'm Barbara Dr. Barbara J. Bazron, Director of the Department of Behavioral Health. In the interest of time, I will abbreviate my testimony. I have submitted my full testimony uh, to you. Currently, the Department of, uh, of uh, Behavioral Health offers a wide range of treatment and support services for, district, uh, the, for the district's children, youth, and their families, including specialized evidence-based practices um, for ongoing uh, treatment for recovery from trauma, emergency, em, em, emergency care, uh, through a network of certified community-based behavioral health providers. Ongoing treatment includes individual, group, and family counseling, diagnostic assessment, medication management, and family support. Our certified community providers within the Department of Behavioral Health's network provide substance use disorders and support for both teens and youth. 
In addition, we operate a children's clinic at Howard Road. Uh, we provide school-based behavioral health services in public and public charter schools and manage uh, an alcohol, tobacco, and drug prevention program and awareness campaign called Drug-Free Youth DC. I'd like to begin my testimony by emphasizing that there is not a direct a correlation between behavioral health disorders and a youth's propensity to commit a crime. The department does not want to stigmatize this population or promote the idea that because a child or youth is diagnosed with a mental health condition, they are prone to engage in unlawful activity. A more plausible correlation is the lack of protective factors supports and healthy coping mechanisms that lead to poor choices, psychological distress, and physiological stress res and res uh, responses that ultimately um, cause adverse mental health uh, outcomes. Many district youth are experiencing significant life difficulties. The causes of the stress are due to internal factors, which include homelessness, housing instability, food insecurity, and external factors like exposure to violence, area level poverty, adverse life experiences, unemployment, and poor access to health. And I believe you, we've heard a lot of that throughout the day today. According to the literature, if a child or adolescent's basic needs are not met, there's an increased likelihood that he or she will experience distress, which impacts their mental well-being and may result in involvement in juvenile activity. Ensuring youth's needs are being met supports the development of mental wellness. Fulfillment of, of these needs requires collaboration and cooperation of families, that includes parents and guardians, community organizations, and all branches of government, including specialized agencies such, D, such as DBH and DYRS. This is a complex issue that can only be addressed through a collaborative approach. No one agency or organization can do this alone. DBH provides a full range of prevention, early intervention and treatment services to assist youth to address their trauma experiences and to strengthen life skills such as conflict resolution, resiliency building and adaptive coping skills and social emotional learning. It is with these evidence-based and evidence-informed prevention and early intervention efforts, along with our continued collaboration with other district agencies, that we will be able to meet the needs of the youth and their families, improve public safety, health, and education. As a result of our combined efforts, we will realize the goal of providing youth with the support they need to embrace pro-social behavioral norms and avoid involvement in unlawful juvenile activity. I now want to take a moment just to highlight a few of uh, the, the efforts that we have and the services that we have uh, underway. We do have some specific services that address the needs of youth in the care and custody of DYRS and those who are involved in violent crime, and I will highlight some of those. I'll, I will conclude uh, my testimony with the description of the work our agency is doing in collaboration with other district agencies to improve the outcomes of our youth at risk of uh, uh, unlawful juvenile behavior. First, I'd like to say that um, a range of specialized services are involved to, uh, to our youth. Uh, for those who are experiencing distress, trauma, and disruption in family functioning. And this includes a whole suite of trauma-focused evidence-based practices that are designed to strengthen family life, improve family functioning, and avoid more complex long-term challenges of family members who have experienced trauma. We want to get upstream. And we do through some of our efforts. We have uh, an early intervention program, which is called the Parent-Child Interaction Therapy or PCIT, which serves families and children ages two to six years of age. The parent is uh, behind on, on the other side of a two-way mirror 
There's a therapist behind the mirror who provides uh, information to the parent regarding how to reinforce the positive behaviors of their children and address uh, the negative behaviors in real time. As I have watched these uh, sessions, I have really been amazed and very pleased with how parents have become more involved, more engaged with their children, and more confident in their ability uh, to manage the child's behavior and have positive and affirming interactions with them. We have two PCIT labs. We do not have a waiting list. It is available uh, through our our um, Howard Road um, Center, and so um, any parent or parent can really go there. We also have trauma focused cognitive behavioral therapy, which serves uh, youth ages three to eighteen years of age and their family. Another uh, program that we have that gets upstream is our Healthy Futures program. Healthy Futures is an early childhood mental health consultation program that provides consultation not just to the staff in the Child Development Center, but also to parents and provides um, uh, supports for uh, the, the child. Prior to the implementation of this program, we were seeing preschoolers suspended from child development centers, suspended uh, from kindergarten. Since the inception of this program, we have seen measurable improvements, including a significant increase in positive child uh, interactions, a lower expulsion rate, actually none, and a significant decrease in negative indicators uh, of classroom client. It, we have also worked with the staff so that they know how to better manage their interactions with the young uh, people, uh, including not shouting at children and how to do better uh, behavior management. We have a full suite of crisis services, as you know, both our CHAMPS program for uh, our children, as well as our community response team. These services are available every day of the week to address behavioral and mental health crises. Earlier in the, in, in the testimony today, you heard about high fidelity wraparound. This to me is a critical uh, service. Um, uh, when I, uh, came back to the Department uh, of Behavioral Health. That was one of the first things I reinstated. Um, it has been very successful in providing um, that collaborative uh, opportunity for all agencies to work together on behalf of a child and, and family. And it has um, reduced uh, the uh, the, the uh, the number of kids who are taken out of their families and placed in psychiatric residential treatment uh, facilities. Uh, this is a well-known, well-evidenced program and we are delighted to have it. And now it is a part of Medicaid, so it is entitlement service. So we don't have to worry about how much we have in our budget to fund it. Anyone who needs it can get it. And we do have space in uh, within our, uh, our providers, um, uh, ability to serve. There is no wait list for that program. Prevention services, however, uh, in my estimation, are, are critically uh, important. We do provide prevention services as a part of our school-based behavioral health program, uh, and we are ensuring that all of our school-based behavioral health clinicians are trained in two group good uh, for violence, which focuses on uh, teaching children and youth conflict resolution strategies, in addition to trauma-focused, um, uh, the trauma-focused evidence-based practices um, that are included in our suite of services. Okay. Uh, Okay, <laughs> lastly, I want to quickly say that uh, we do work in collaboration with the courts. Um, I think earlier you heard of some of the services, so I won't go through them. We have three main uh, efforts with the court. 
the ACES program, which is all our alternatives to court experiences, the Juvenile Behavioral Diversion Program, and Hope Court. These three programs divert young people uh, from the juvenile justice system and provide them the opportunity to have mental health services. We cannot do this alone. Looking moving forward. We have to work together with the other uh, aspects of government, and we are really poised to do that. With that, I will conclude my testimony, and my team and I will be ready for questions. Thank you. Dr. Abed? Thank you, Chairperson Henderson and uh, Chairperson White and Chairperson Pinto, if she's still here. Uh, I am Sam Abbott, Director of the Department of Youth Rehabilitation Services. DYRS is thankful to Mayor Bowser for her leadership and vision supporting the well-being of district youth and promoting public safety. This vision is focused on ensuring that every youth who is in the care of DYRS is held appropriately accountable and provided the critical behavioral health services that they need. Thank you for having me here today to share with you DYRS's work to implement that vision. DYRS recognizes that a holistic approach to public safety requires that we provide every young person in our care with the treatment that they need. When a young person comes into our care, we provide high quality behavioral health services to assess their needs, connect them to appropriate services, and provide support. This three-tiered three -tiered behavioral health service delivery system ensures that DYRS youth have their needs identified, are matched with the right level of treatment, and have ongoing support after they leave our care. The first tier of our behavioral health service delivery system focuses on assessment. All youth in our care receive a behavioral health assessment using a validated instrument that aids our behavioral health team in developing individualized treatment plans. Utilize the assessment as the first step because we know that one size does not fit all and for behavioral health treatment to be successful, it must be designed to be responsive to each youth's unique needs. Second step in the process focus on connection. Staff use individualized treatment plans to then connect youth to the appropriate services and supports. Our behavioral health team provides access to services that include restorative justice program, programming, uh, individual, group, and family therapy. Uh, in addition, for those youth who need specialized care, that same team provides access to substance abuse treatment, psychiatric evaluations, and medication management. When needed, DYRS Behavioral Health also partners with providers and with the Department of Behavioral Health to place a youth in an appropriate therapeutic setting. Third tier of DYRS's Behavioral Health Service Delivery System is focused on ongoing community support for the youth. After a young person completes a treatment program and leaves DYRS care, it's critical that they continue to access the services and supports that they need to be successful in the community to facilitate a successful transition back into the community and ensure continuity of services, DYRS develops an aftercare plan for each youth released. Part of the aftercare planning, DYRS works with core services agencies and community providers to make sure our young people have a continuity of care and continued support so they can continue the positive progress that they've made while in. Thanks again to Mayor Bowser, Deputy Mayor Lindsay Apia, and uh, for their commitment to supporting DYRS youth. I'm grateful also to the DYRS behavioral health team for all of the critical services that they provide every day to our youth. It's an honor to lead an agency committed to ensuring well being of every youth in our care through delivery of behavioral health treatment that assesses youth's individual needs, connects them to the right services, and supports them when they return to the community. Thank you to the council for providing me the opportunity to share this important work. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Um, Director Sneed. Good evening, Chairperson Henderson, Chairwoman Pinto, Chairperson White, members and staff of the Committees on Health, Judiciary, Public Safety, Recreation, Libraries, and Youth Affairs. I am Quelly Sneed, Interim Director of the Office of Neighborhood Safety and Engagement, also referred to as the ONES or 
ones. Thank you for having me today to present testimony on the behavior health services offered to our clients from the scope of gun violence intervention. ONES was created to address gun violence reduction in the district while assisting the community with the trauma caused by these incidents. The mission of the ONES is to foster community-based strategies to help prevent gun violence to increase public safety. ONES programs provide important services and engagement for students and middle school age to adults at the age of 35. ONES operates programs and initiatives that focus on targeted prevention efforts and provide family support after an individual succumbs to gun violence. Our programs and initiatives include ONES Leadership Academy, or fondly known as OLA, which is located within our targeted middle and high schools. Pathways Program, a program for individuals at risk of participating in or being victims of violent crime. Violence Intervention Program, a program designed to work with community-based organizations to reduce violent crime throughout the district. Family and Survivor Support Program, which is a program which serves residents of all ages who have experienced a traumatic loss or hospitalization caused by gun violence. Each of these programs and initiatives provide support unique to program participants. For example, 64 district residents graduated from the Pathways program in fiscal year 23. One component of this program is providing behavior health support to participants and conducting weekly wellness sessions to address their current behavioral health needs. Services include weekly one hour in-person individual therapy sessions, conflict resolution, and substance abuse counseling. Emergency psychiatric services are also provided within 24 hours to participants who have experienced a traumatic event. Psychiatric evaluations and assessments are also provided to determine the specific services that are required to support an individual's tre treatment needs. At ONES, we utilize case management to effectively tailor support to the needs of the individual. This is critical and courageous work by our agency partners, our providers, the ONES team, and our participants who have successfully completed our programs. I thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today, and I welcome any additional questions you may have. Thank you. All right, let's uh, get to it. Okay. Um, so the mayor has a juvenile justice advisory group. Which of y'all are on it? I think DBH is on it. Is you are are you on it? Is the one's yeah. office on it? How often does it meet? It's monthly. It is monthly. Yes. It's monthly. It's monthly. Okay. Um Chairwoman, who said they were playing? I'm sorry, Councilmember White. Who responded they were uh, They all did. They all said it was monthly. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, so it is actually kind of surprising that it's still meeting monthly as opposed to more frequent since the emergency. I know that's not something that you all control. Um, but in the advisory group conversations, is behavioral health a conversation that comes up? Okay. My understanding is, yes, it is a conversation that comes up and particularly to look at um, what kinds of improvements need to happen uh, in order to provide more effective and efficient services. Okay. To population. So I know that you all have um, mm -hmm. designees who attend this meeting, but what's one thing that has come out of that group in the past year, like a change? Um, I'm just about to start five months, uh, Madam Chair. Yeah. Um, and uh, I had some interactions with that group uh, around the uh, curfew center. And they had a lot of questions around the curfew center and its uh, uh, legal standing. And I was able to engage with them and go through the uh, federal rules and show how we were certainly in compliance. Uh, and that's been the, the, the thrust of the interactions that I've had with them. Okay. 
I just wanted to correct the record that uh, ones does not sit on that particular committee. So ones is not on that. That is correct. All right. So here's the thing, right? I we talked to um, OAG and PDS, and I kind of feel like Director Veet, you're kind of the the middle piece here. Kind of, kind of, sort of be with them because um, you're not really prevention. At, at, at once get youth get to you, it's now a treatment rehabilitation, whereas ones and DBH can do the prevention work. Am I seeing that right? Do you all see that in the same in the same vein? Okay, great. But I feel like okay, there is a piece of prevention that we do, um, and that is the the Oasis uh, Reserve. And that's a program that we work with uh, the education system to identify youth that are not involved in the justice system and to provide uh, mentoring supports uh, and a respite from uh, their, their everyday lives. So what we do, tutoring uh, with those young people. These are uh, kids in middle school uh, that are identified as having struggled, struggling academically or behaviorally or both. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we have a high ropes course uh, on the Laurel campus uh, that we uh, and their families. So there is some work that we do in, in around prevention. the prevention space. Okay, I have it. So the OASIS program, how many young, how many slots are available in that? Uh, we have uh, cohorts. We've gone through two cohorts. Uh, I don't know exactly how many kids are in each cohort, um, but I, I can get that information back to you. Okay, that'll be helpful to to kind of know. Again, I, I'm trying to be solution oriented in terms of how we boost and and support and and better um, do things. But I, I, again, I would say for an advisory group that meets monthly in the middle of a juvenile justice emergency, she declared it. Um, we extended it. And just with the ongoing things, I feel like there should be more happening there but none of you are the deputy mayor. So I'm going to, I'm going to sort of move on from that part. Um, Director Bazaran, I wanted to ask if you had any um, thoughts around the fact that we've heard from several people today, not just even government witnesses, but public witnesses earlier saying, we don't know what's available. We don't know who to call. We have to call three or four people in order to even see, does a, does an organization have space? What's your thoughts on that? Well, first of all, there are a couple of ways that people can uh, identify whether and what services are available. We do have um, all of the services listed by core service agency on our website and also Access Helpline does have information regarding what services are provided by what agency. We are currently in the process of actually m moving to even greater improvements of our access helpline under the direction of Dr. B. Bout. And, um, and they also will stay on the line to connect a family to services. Uh, and, and we hope that that really works uh, for them. In addition to those individuals who are in the court system, mm -hmm. uh, we have staff physically in the courts, the three uh, that I mentioned, and their job is to coordinate uh, services and also to provide whatever consultation support is needed by the court in terms of what the, some next steps might be, particularly in terms of diversion. Um, the Department of Behavioral Health was at the table and critical in developing the JDP program, the Juvenile Diversion Program, as well as other programs. So we have put some things in place. We could always do more. The other thing we've done, uh, I had the pleasure actually of, um, of meeting with um, uh, one of our up and coming uh, residents, a, a, a high school student who is really leading the charge in terms of how we might be able to ensure that uh, young people in schools know better how to uh, obtain behavioral health care services. So let's talk about that. Yeah. The council funded That's a right. grant program That's for right. peer to peer That's mental right. health program. What's the status That's right. of that, that grant? Yes. And so we are working on that. Grant. We, we've actually had our planning meetings and so forth with the young Did you know what I say? Second yep. semester. Yep. Second semester. Hello again, <laughs> Megan Sullivan, um, interim deputy director for child and adolescent family services. 
Nice to see you guys again. Nice to see you. Um, so, um, as Dr. Bazaran mentioned, we've been um, meeting with our co-chair of the Family and Youth Committee, getting feedback regarding um, the educator peer pilot and making sure that that RFA is getting ready to go out um, so that we can um, have our vendor on board. And as Dr. Bazaran mentioned, really get input um, from the youth, obviously within that legislation, there are specific um, things like training the youth, but also mm -hmm. we would really like those youth to help us get insight, but also better learn how we can um, better market or get youth to access our services. Mm -hmm. We've been hearing from Young Women's Project and other students for several years, right? Mm -hmm. So um, again, we're looking forward to um, getting that out so that we can get a contractor in place and, and okay. start that, yeah, start that program. Okay. Is that like, Dr. Bazarang, you've heard me say this already, but I'm going to say it again for the record for the new people in the room. Okay. We funded a pilot. It is for the school year. Mm -hmm. The school year ends in June. If the pilot doesn't start till February, how do I know if the pilot has worked or if I should fund it again when I have to fund it again in April? Like, I, this goes to, I think we heard a lot of public witnesses talk about today, like the grants have to get out the door in a appropriate fashion without having just three weeks in order to say spend it. Cause that's how I go to some of these things now. And I'm like, wow, y'all have a lot of swag. Oh, wait. Purchasing swag is the quickest thing you can do in the last little bit of a time, as opposed to doing the direct service supports. Well, first of, of all, in, in terms of this particular program, we will be collecting data. Yep. And so you will have information that will say what's working, whether, whether it, it actually resulted in increases in knowledge among the young people, whether there was uh, more outreach to young people and so forth. And so uh, it won't be that, oh, well, we just start and we don't know what happens. So right. that's not the way this is being put together. And that's one of the reasons why we've been spending the time with the young people to say, what would success look like? That looks good. Um, uh, Ms. Simonova said that the access helpline was closing, but your testimony access was that you are closing. redesigning it. No, access helpline is not closing. Uh, access helpline will uh, be there. Um, I think what they were referring to is the fact that we are in the midst of a transformation, as you know. We are moving um, the behavioral health services to managed care. Mm -hmm. And so when those services go over, uh, then the managed care companies uh, will be the conduit for getting uh, those particular services. Okay, so, but then what happens if I am a person with private insurance who's looking for help? If the number goes away, then who do who do I go to? Well, it's not that it's not that the number goes away. It's that you would be contacting the managed care organization directly. Yeah, but I don't have Medicaid. Why would they take my call? I'm saying if I don't have Medicaid. It but you're talking about uh, the managed care organizations take insurance. I mean, that's my understanding. Do they? Do they not? They don't? Do you get what I'm saying? No, I'm saying like... Um, <laughs> they aren't contacting us now. We are the public exactly. behavioral health care yes. services. And so we take care of individuals who have Medicaid as well as those individuals who... Um, are within the Alliance program or have no ability to pay. That's a public behavioral health care system. We do not uh, take insurance for our services. I understand you don't take insurance, but I think the, also the public sees the Department of Behavioral Health as a public information repository about behavioral health services in the district. Mm -hmm. And so if the information is only geared towards a subset of the population who has Medicaid, for those who are trying to navigate the system with private insurance and they say, oh, let's see mm -hmm. Department of Behavioral Health as the, right. the depository, where do I find that info? But I'm over my time. Councilmember White. So your issue is, so how does somebody with public insurance get the information they need to get to the right place? Private insurance, yes. Mm -hmm. What's private White? insurance, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Councilmember White. 
Yes. Give me one second. Yes, I want to start with Director Bazron. Bazron, sorry. Uh, in your written testimony, you spoke to several programs, but did not have the actual number of participants in each program outside of the, I guess, ACE, the Alternative to Court and Juvenile Behavior Division Program, JBDP, which is specifically for court-involved youth. What percentage of the participants uh, of the other programs will be engaged with DYS? Do you know if you can get someone to answer that, that'll be helpful. Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, we do have specialized programs, as I said before, but in addition to that, um, that we work, um, as, as the director was saying, when a young person um, steps down and is reintegrated in, back into the community, they are eligible for the full range of services that are available through the Department of Behavioral Health. Got it. Do we have any numbers? And if you don't have them at the moment, we get them. We sent these, but we're waiting to get it. No, I don't have the numbers of young people that have reentered from DYRS and are are currently receiving services. Okay. Um, you talk about this STEP program, strengthening youth enriching parents, uh, which we've heard from several uh, of our community members today about not just addressing the youth, but we address the youth by providing services for the families. Mm -hmm. uh, your, pro your, your program title speaks uh, to strengthening parents, but description go talks about the families overall. What exactly does that program do <clears throat> to ensure stability and support for families and parents? Mm -hmm. uh, the STEP program, uh, by the way, is a partnership between um, the Department of Human Services, the Department of Behavioral Health, the Police Department, uh, and the Sasha Bruce, Bruce Network. And uh, we provide um, services to help stabilize families and break the cycle of youth, youth who are running away from home. That's the, that's the target population there. Um, and so we really address kind of those underlying issues related to um, uh, persons who are likely to be court involved because of um, of runaway behavior and other behaviors um, for that population. So that is particularly focused on that group. Thank you. We've heard um, MBI talk about this high fidelity wraparound program, uh, which offers recreation activities for youth. Um, can you speak to how youth are chosen for that? And I know this is offline for for years. And it's my understanding that you helped bring this back. If you can speak to who has that with the referral processes and how that is working. Yes, um, our provider for high fidelity wraparound, and we have an in-school program as well as uh, a, uh, a program for any uh, young resident and their family. Um, MBI is the contracting agency for that program. As I said earlier, we now uh, actually use um, local funding to support high fidelity wraparound. And essentially what it is, is it is, um, it, it follows the systems of care approach where agencies, all of the agencies that are involved with the family really uh, come together. Uh, the, we work with the family and wrap services around them uh, to help them better support their young person. And um, the program is evidence-based with results. And we have also seen results in terms of decreases in um, uh, negative um, juvenile behaviors, increased attendance in school, and better family functioning. And so um, I really pushed to have a uh, high fidelity wraparound included in our state plan amendment which means that um, it now uh, will be Medicaid um, billable. And that means that our young people, regardless of how many uh, or how much they need, will be able to get that service. The other thing I like about High Fidelity Wraparound uh, is that we do have flex funds that are a part of that. And so uh, if a parent has a different kind of need that may not be a mental health need, but but may be related to the social determinants of health, we can use those flex funds to pay for that. Like I remember um, 
uh, instances uh, when uh, we have had to use those funds for everything from helping somebody to pay their rent for that uh, that month to having to uh, to help them buy a, a you know a, a smoke alarm uh, so that they could stay in their their apartment, having a child go to a recreation program that that costs some funds and so forth. So uh, this is one of the programs that really addresses the full range of needs of that child and family. I don't know, Dr. Sullivan, if you want to add anything. Uh, I'm going to have to jump to the next question, Dr. Bajron, to DYS, Director Ebbett. Um, Director, can you tell me how many DYS youth are currently in resident, residential treatment facilities and how many are in psychiatric resident treatment facilities, both locally and uh, in other states? I don't have the numbers right in front of me. We do have kids in uh, RTCs and, and PRTFs, but I can get that uh, number for you. Are you able to get it tonight before the hearing is out? Yes. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, DYS has 11 mental health specialists, three program managers, and behavior health service director. Is that enough staff to be able to handle uh, the, the mental health, the trauma, and just the behavior issues in the department? So those are the, the behavioral health staff that are, you know, professionals like psychologists, counselors, uh, but we have uh, other staff that also uh, aid in uh, dealing with the behavioral health issues. And uh, a big group there are the credible messengers. They are trained by our behavioral health staff uh, uh, to uh, work with our kids and, and work together uh, with behavioral health on uh, some of the interventions. Uh, and they, they actually lead some of the groups and they are very effective at being like a force multiplier for those things. And I know earlier in the hearing, you mentioned a, uh, a program that you were uh, part of, and this is the, uh, the uh, community uh, over ops. Uh, that's, just, that's the meetings that we're having with young people uh, in our facilities to deal with the disputes that are spilling over from the community. And that's a collaboration of credible messengers, our behavioral health team, our secure programs, community members. Uh, and I'd, I'd like to thank you as well for uh, being one of the people to, to bring that idea to our attention and help us bring it to fruition. But those people uh, are all critical members of our team and, and really do assist us in uh, dealing with uh, the, the issues that our youth face. Thank you, Director. And real quick, uh, access of PDS about uh, the youth interaction and accessibility to their lawyers and their families. Uh, when I was there, some alleged that they wasn't getting adequate access to their lawyers, especially during the time of critical incidents. Uh, can you speak to that? Uh, and, and that was just at YSC. Can you speak to that? Yes, if there is a an incident that's ongoing, uh, we cannot facilitate a, a visitation at that time, and so uh, that that has a that has happened uh, uh, on some occasions. Uh, I know that there was a, a request for um, sort of unfettered access anytime they want. Uh, I'd like to push back on that a little bit because um, we do operate schools uh, and we do operate education programs, uh, and I'm, I'll just speak to to YSC. Um, and we want, we don't want to interrupt uh, the school day for a visitation. Um, and so I do think that we should have appointments uh, that are scheduled. Uh, we will certainly uh, do our very best to honor those appointments so that they can see their clients uh, and, and use uh, the phone to, to talk to their attorneys. Uh, but coming in at any time, I think, would be problematic for me. Oh, he's back. Ask member white. Um, you're on mute. Thank you. I apologize. Yeah, director. Uh, th there is normally, uh, for intake, 
normally 10 days. Uh, and there are some who have been in intake longer than 10 days. Uh, can you speak to the agency's process with getting people, uh, I guess, move throughout the facility outside of those 10 days for uh, intake and speak to uh, how your team is addressing the trauma of those who are in extended stay in intake units? Yeah, so what this is is really a symptom of uh, long lengths of stay. And so we do uh, we do want to move youth. Uh, and I should say long lengths of stay is the really underlying problem. There, there is a population uh, when we have high populations, that's when uh, youth may stay longer. If there are conflicts uh, and we don't have uh, a, a unit that we can put a youth in where there is an, uh, or there's a safety issue. Um, but the high population is, is, is a big concern. <clears throat> and to address that, uh, we are uh, putting our efforts into streamlining the placement process. Uh, and we've also, uh, so we've had uh, a new deputy director uh, on board uh, and his number one priority is placing youth. Uh, we at currently have an average length of stay for kids that are committed to us of 55 days. And that's unacceptably long. These are kids, uh, when, you, when you stay in a detention center, <clears throat> it should be a brief stay. It should not be a long stay. And once you're committed, you should move expeditiously into your treatment program. Uh, so we're putting our efforts into uh, uh, driving that number down. Uh, and uh, in addition to that, we have opened up more space at the facility. So we have 10 additional beds uh, at YSC. So we have more room to uh, uh, classify youth and move them into, uh, into their uh, living units rather than into the intake units. So we're making a lot of progress. Currently, we have 69 youth at YSC. Uh, the number had uh, gone up to nearly 100 at one point. I think uh, we peaked at 96 kids. Um, now we have a capacity, a bed capacity or room capacity of uh, 98 beds. We're, we currently have 69 youth at YSC. We have 56 at New Beginnings. Uh, the other piece that we have to do to uh, address this is on the placement side. So uh, there were comments about the continuum of care and the number of placements. We don't have enough placements uh, available for our kids. And so mm -hmm. if there's an uh, emergency order, uh, one of the things that it does is it allows us to uh, streamline that procurement process so that we can get uh, additional private providers. As you know, we only have new beginnings as a uh, district uh, operated uh, treatment facility. So we have to use uh, private providers, and the emergency order allows us to uh, 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 take additional steps to get those providers on. We have prioritized shelter beds first, and we have signed contracts for uh, shelter beds, additional shelter bed capacity, um, and we've also had uh, conversations with private providers that have, I think, uh, th there's been expressions of private providers not wanting to work with our uh, our agency or the director. I had to cut you off for one second. I apologize, but, but <clears throat> I'm over my time, and my phone is on. The other phone just died. This was on five percent. <clears throat> um, there has been an appetite, as you heard from witnesses, for uh, people being able to get relocated to better living conditions. Um, I'm pretty sure you've been listening to the testimony earlier uh, and feeling safe outside of their normal environment, even outside of the district. Uh, I know that we had a history of bringing people back in the district closer um and it seems like the public is saying it's not safe around here it's it's, it's too dangerous we want to be able to put our kids somewhere else what's your stance on that briefly directly if you can answer directly and briefly that'd be helpful so generally speaking i think young people should be closer to their families uh we do want to uh, maintain uh connections with their families but there are certainly occasions where uh, the uh, situation in their home or in their community is unsafe for a young person. And that really, uh, you know, there are a lot of factors that I would look at before uh, wanting to place somebody, uh, you know, far away from home. Uh, but I would look at their age, someone that's older, uh, I would be more likely to, to support something like that. Um, and I would look obviously at the safety considerations, if there were safety considerations. 
um, and the, their ability to connect with the right services. We need to make sure that they're getting the services that they need. Addition, it's not just a, a matter of geography. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman. If I can ask one more question, I know I'm a little over. I'm not sure how long may to be on. Go ahead. Chairwoman. Go ahead. All right. Uh, I want to ask uh, Director Snead uh, questions real quick. Yes. Okay, there we go. Can you, can you uh, explain how youth are being connected to OLA? Um, and it's a school base and uh, students allowed to go independently. How's the connection happening? So the connection really happens through the school directly. So the original pilot started off with the high schools and then upon uh, the pandemic, we expanded to three middle schools. And so we rely so we rely on the school to connect us to the students that they have identified as needing OLA or One's Leadership Academy services. Thank you. We've heard that uh, our family reached out on an earlier testimony and was trying to get a removal assistance. Uh, can you explain the process with that? And if the money ran out, because that's what I'm hearing, because the, the I guess the new fiscal year started, I'm not sure. I think sometimes I think with ones, the one thing that we need to do better about is explaining the processes that encompass our services. And so sometimes I believe that it's misunderstood. I don't believe that in that instance, it wasn't about the funding, but more so about the, the qualifications and the criteria being met. But I, in that instance, um, council member, I did not actually hear the fiscal year. So I would like an opportunity to look into the matter that was raised because I didn't hear the fiscal year that it occurred or any other details where I could identify. She explained that this happened uh, last week and she said it just closed down recently. So this is. So I will say that in the instances where there is flexibility within government processes, we have administrative partners that we work with that are able to uh, step in and make placements when they have met the criteria. And also, we also have case management uh, provider that also works with families to assist with placement as well. Okay, so the, to the short answer is yes, you are still placing people or helping people to move or transition. Is that accurate? That is correct. And you still have funds to do that? That is correct. Okay. And, and one of the, uh, I guess one of the hallmark programs of ONES is Pathways. Yes. That allow our highest risk individuals to get intervention, job, or just training, just some teachings, uh, uh, the plethora of things they get while they're in them sessions. Uh, I, as my understanding, you all have not started a new cohort. Right. And I know the mayor committed to doing 500 new people in pathways, but it seems like there's been zero movement in the last couple of weeks, which is not normal. Can you speak to that? Sure. We're so excited to announce that um, the new cohort starts the week of June. I'm sorry, June, January. Let me say that one more time. It starts the week of January 22nd. Our team is right now working with different uh, providers that have made recommendations to the program that will uh, that are being considered and interviewed for placement. How many will be in the first cohort and how you is how do you plan to reach the 500? Because that's a large number that the mayor is committing to, no miss about 25. I haven't actually received that number, but I would love the opportunity to go back and research it. But in terms of meeting um, cohort size, generally ranges from 25 to 30 participants per cohort. And the program lasts for nine weeks. Okay. Um, yeah, that's the number that the mayor has stated at several press conferences and said she funded it. So the community was really excited about that and the connectivity to jobs. I'm over my time. I uh, have a few more questions. I'll try to get a second round if my phone lasts. Uh, Chairman. Thank you. Um, I, I want to ask a question about data sharing amongst the agencies. Uh, what does data sharing look like amongst your three offices? Anybody? Do y'all okay. Is there a data sharing agreement uh, between DBH and DYRS? 
I'm not, I'm not sure if there is a data sharing yeah. agreement, I think, but we do have um, a coordinator as Dr. Bezran mentioned in both of those courts. And mm -hmm. so there's information that's shared um, obviously so that we can help connect those youth to behavioral health services as well as support the families. Is there um, a data sharing agreement between DBH and CFSA? We, we do have data sharing agreements with um, uh, some of our agencies, not a the data sharing agreement with uh, uh, DYRS, but I do believe we have one with CFSA. Well, we also, that. as you know, with CFSA, we also have a co-located staff. Too, right. So. And we have co-located staff there on site. What I'm trying to get at in this is that in a different hearing earlier this week, we had a conversation or started the conversation about truancy, chronic absenteeism, right? Oh. Truancy and chronic absenteeism. Mm -hmm. I have 4,000 ninth graders who have missed, I don't know, like over 21 days of school. Okay. If we can identify those groups, th those kids and see which agencies are touching them, then we can coordinate our approach better. But it doesn't seem like that level of less focus on this 500, right? We're going to identify 500 kids who we know are at risk for all of these other things. And then we're going to see, all right, whose families are getting benefits, whose families are getting services, bring in the MCOs if that's the case to then really try to sort of formulate something because I think some of the other things from the public witnesses is that we operate in silos. Mm -hmm. The same kids y'all are dealing with, CFSA is dealing with. The same kids that the ones office sees might end up at DRS or where's that DRS and now they're out. And like, I feel like we're not sharing information in a way that allows for us to prevent I think we share information about individual children who are being young young people who are being seen because we have co-located staff, for example, at at, uh, at CFSA, and so we know the young people that are coming there, and we share information about uh, those particular young people. Um, we also have staff uh, in the courts who uh, see kids that are coming through that are going to DYRS. And so we have information on those young people. However, uh, we don't have a formal data sharing agreement um, that's uh, among and between it. And I think that that's something for us to investigate. Okay. I think it's, a, it's an yeah. interesting question. Um, yeah. This came up uh, and I don't know necessarily 100% how I feel about this, right? But so one of... Um, the juvenile victims of this year was uh, engaged in a attempted carjacking, 13. The difference, or not differences, but one of the differences in this particular case is that the school reports, he attended school every day. They had no idea this kid was justice involved. Mm -hmm. No idea that there was anything that was sort of a miss per se but it could have been the opportunity for someone in the building to intervene in a different way. Now, I get it. I, why I say I haven't like fully thought this through is because I don't want anyone to negatively use that information against a young person. But if, if, if there's a person in the building that's a trusted adult, but they have no idea what you all have ideas on or access to, are we missing opportunities to intervene in a way that is coordinated? And for those young people who are receiving services, of course, we know which agencies they are uh, involved with. And we do pull those agencies together as we're doing treatment planning and service delivery for those young people. Okay. Um, let me ask uh, one's office in particular. I brought this up earlier around the people of promise. So in FY22, there were 15 people of promise participants. Of those 15, 10 were referred um, for were referred to people of promise for trauma-informed care. Um, two were referred for adult counseling services and three were referred for youth counseling services. And then FY23, there was one participant. Um, what happened? Thank you for asking the question. We, we heard the question earlier. So we answered the question based off of the age group, not 
the total number of services because we were told youth up to tw age 26. And so the, that one person that was uh, fell in that category of okay. that age group. So that's, um, thank you for giving me an opportunity to add that. We did not add that to the answer as a notation. Okay. Um, okay, so that, given that we're seeing such an influx of um, individuals 18 to 24 mm -hmm. who are engaged in activity, should that number be higher? I mean, I think the argument can definitely be made, but here's also, that's just one program, right? Yeah. So we have multiple programs. So if you're in Pathways, then you're receiving the weekly um, wellness and behavior health uh, intervention and the opportunity to work with a, a, a professional in that area. And, F and people are promised specifically, it's based off of the needs assessment, what comes up in that conversation with that individual. Sometimes it's not behavioral health. Uh, mm -hmm. It's, I need help with identifying work or, or developing a skill to gain or acquire work. So it, it runs the gamut, really. Okay. Um Councilmember White asked about the um, One's Leadership Academy. Mm -hmm. um, you'll see an increase in funding. How will this impact OLA? Were you able to increase capacity this year? So uh, the uh, so increase in expansion, right? Okay. That's the conversation. So also we look at services and how we're delivering services. I think if Councilmember Lewis George were here, she would ask you about the expansion sites. So yes, uh, we engaged with the principal recently to uh, McFarland, McFarland, mm -hmm. McFarland Middle School, um, and we just finished recruiting, doing the recruitment process and identifying the personnel that will be assigned there. And if I'm not mistaken, with before the holiday break, we will be in going there to actually sit with the school to kind of talk about how to enmesh OLA into the fabric of the school. Okay, so is this going to start the school year? Yes. So second semester. That's correct. Lord, y'all in the second semester. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, Director B. So uh, Councilmember White asked about the the staff, you know, 11 dedicated health specialists, three program managers, a behavioral health service director. Uh, how many vacancies do you have out of that group of individuals? Oh yeah, that, your, your mic is near you. Uh, let me let me just say I should check that number and make sure that we don't. I don't know of any vacancies in the behavioral health team. Okay, I know we do have thirty currently thirty vacancies, four of which are YDRs, but I did not check the the. the... Okay, have you hired a medical director? We have. Okay. And he starts on the 18th of this month. So oh. he'll be starting in a few days. All right. We're Very moving happy to report that we're moving in that area. Um, you know, I was a little disturbed to hear from PDS sort of the, what do they refer to it? Like the spot check therapy or that what they said? when they, um, is there a particular reason that the model at YSC of new beginnings doesn't include weekly counseling or therapy? So at, at YSC, we do have weekly psychiatry visits. We do have uh, psychiatrists that do visit there. Uh, again, YSC is a detention center. It's not a therapeutic environment. And that's why my focus is so much on moving them into their treatment programs and uh, driving down that length of stay. Um, we also have a population at YSC. Wait, sorry. Can you say more about that, moving, that, moving them into their treatment program? What do you mean by that? Yes. So uh, generally, detention should be for pretrial youth. Mm -hmm. uh, as was mentioned earlier, we have youth that are awaiting placement. That means they've had their trial and that they're awaiting their placement. And that was the population or subpopulation was 55 days. And we are doing uh, a number of different interventions to drive that number down. But uh, another subpopulation that we have at YSC are Title 16 youth. Those are the youth uh, charged as adults. Right. And when we looked at the last three fiscal years, um, <clears throat> the range of their length of stay in pretrial status, so they had not been sentenced, uh, ranged from nearly uh, 500 days to nearly 1,000 days. Okay. 
And uh, that environment is going to be uh, very detrimental to a young person to be confined anywhere near that long. And a detention center was never designed to hold kids for that period of time. Right. Uh, and so uh, when we have these long lengths of stay, that's the underlying problem that we have to address. Have uh, shared that information with the courts uh, and with the U.S. Attorney's Office to try to motivate uh, our partners to uh, also focus on length of stay. Mm -hmm. Because uh, no matter what treatment programs we may offer, and, and it's, not a, it's not a treatment facility, it's a detention center. I get that from a detention center. I think the, the rub is that your agency is called the Department of Youth Rehabilitation Services. And the rehabilitation part seems to be missing. No, at, at New Beginnings, New Beginnings is a treatment program. And that is where we have individual group therapy, where we do uh, the work with our restorative justice uh, staff. Uh, we have uh, therapeutic outings. That's a treatment facility and has a treatment milieu. Mm -hmm. what, what folks are trying to do is impose that model on a detention center. And while we are the Department of Youth Rehabilitation Services, we also operate the detention center, which is akin to a jail in the adult system. And those facilities are not designed for treatment. Their purpose is to hold you pre-trial. And so what we've, what we've got here is a situation where the lines have been blurred and we have to uh, unblur those lines and be very intentional about who we hold there and how long they stay there. And how long because they stay. You, you yeah, because if you have somebody who's there for a thousand days. They're going to deteriorate significantly. We've, we've missed time, I think, too, in, 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 in our abilities to sort of work there. Um, what's Progressive Life Center's role with the agency? Progressive Life Center? Mm -hmm. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I know that particular provider. They're, they're listed as like, oh, apparently it's like listed as a partner for the agency. Yeah. Um, I have, I, okay. partner, we'll follow up. I, I don't have the uh, specifics on them. Okay. Um, I think I, I asked maybe at a, a different hearing in terms of the relationship that you all DRS has with PIW, the Psychiatric Institute of Washington, and they have new leadership. Have you had the opportunity to have a conversation with them? Because I know that sometimes um, there are very few beds, youth beds that we have available for youth experiencing um, a psychiatric incident. Have we had conversations with them in terms of building a better relationship so that they will accept Dr. Bazron and I were just speaking about that earlier, Great. Uh, that we want to set up a, a time to meet the new leadership, establish that relationship just as you recommend. Okay, so it hasn't happened yet. It has not. All right, so we'll see you at Performance Oversight in a few months. Uh, so let's hope in the next, I don't know, 10 weeks, we can get that scheduled. Because um, I think that's super important in terms of um, what we're doing here. I think a lot of what we heard from uh, the public witnesses today was around like, how do we prevent? And that's not necessarily you all per se. I think ones has a little bit, maybe in terms of the, uh, the leadership Academy work. Um, but it also feels like the schools need to be at the table here too. Um, I think we do, the department of behavioral health does have a role in prevention and particularly through school-based behavioral health, we do take a, uh, if you look at our model, it's prevention, intervention, and treatment. Mm -hmm. And and that um, is very, very um, uh, specific. And so we do provide prevention um, services. We want to get upstream. That's why we have the early childhood programs that I talked about earlier, uh, both in the child development centers, as well as specialized services at Howard Road. So I feel that we do have a role there. Um, as uh, we uh, uh, move um, uh, to uh, fully um, uh, move behavioral health care uh, uh, the, the direct services over to managed care. Um, our goal is to provide much more of a health promotion and prevention role, because I think there are two pieces of that. 
prevention, but there's also health promotion so that people have information related to behavioral health, the signs and symptoms, what to do, how to manage your uh, behavioral health. One of the things that I say almost every time I do something is mind your mental health. And so we need to kind of focus on that. Okay. How do you evaluate the effectiveness of the grantees that you all have in the area of mental and behavioral health? Uh, we have um, uh, contracts with them, well, grants with them, and the grants do have um, have specific uh, evaluation measures that we look at to determine whether or not uh, they are performing or not performing. The other thing that uh, we well, are let's, doing- uh, Like what? Is it attendance, like in terms of people who have come to your program? Is it uh, based on participant number survey? Seen, I mean, there, there are a number of them, but the other thing I was gonna say is that um, uh, Dr. S uh, Sullivan can talk to this. We are also beginning to do on-site assessments okay. um, of, of the programs. And that's something that we're starting up now so that we can in real time see what's happening and then use that for um, uh, to improve performance. Will those on-site assessments be scheduled? Likely not. Oh, okay. um, we um, are thinking is not to catch people, but again, for it to be natural and to come into the environment as if we weren't there, we want to see how they're working, yeah. especially within school base. Um, we've talked a lot about how it's important to be integrated into the school. And so we want to see that firsthand. Um, as that they're know, showing up every yeah. day. Like we, we talked about it, and, some of the. And are they at the post, right? We talk a lot about things like you're in the front of the building when they're walking mm -hmm. in, right? So yep. that they can see you, they you become mm -hmm. part of that school. The other thing that we've um, worked hard on is creating benchmarks for school base. And so while each school has different needs and there is some flexibility in what, um, services you're providing, there are specific things that um, our clinicians are required to do. And so we monitor it that okay. way. Okay. Um, I think Councilmember White's phone died because oh. he's, he's not here. Um, Council, none of my other colleagues are here. Um, I want to ask one last question and then we can wrap up. It's, it's been a very long day and I know um, it's been a long day for you all too, because many of you have been here at this entire time. Um, Dr. Bazaran, do you have an update on the uh, rate study? Yes. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, you should be getting it shortly. We have What's the definition of short. short okay, <laughs> weeks as opposed to months, right? Uh, we have the uh, the draft. Okay. Uh, the draft is currently under review, and um, and we will finish that shortly, and we will be able to send it in. Okay. Because uh, I think some of that is, uh, if we want to increase the number of providers in the community, right. we need to make sure that they're being paid appropriately mm -hmm. for the work to decide to yep. do all the various things. So that is super important. Give me just one second. Okay, I wanna thank all of you uh, who contributed to today's oversight roundtable on youth public safety and behavioral health. Um, I think the testimonies from today emphasize not only the um, urgency and necessity for a more coordinated system, um, but also that it is very complex mm -hmm. and based on every child's needs. I'll repeat what um, many of you have already said, right? Not every child who is justice involved has a mental health mm -hmm. um, issue and not um, every child who has a mental health issue will become justice involved. Mm -hmm. um, there are plenty of youth who are dealing and coping. Um, and so we're just trying to figure out what are the best ways to address some of the um, the complex issues that we're seeing right now, especially out in community. Um, that is not necessarily involving law enforcement in those conversations. So for anyone who was not able to testify, um, uh, today's roundtable will accept public testimony until December 27th at 5 p.m. You can submit your written statement um, by uploading your document to the council's hearing management system. 
can be found by going to dccouncil.gov, clicking on hearings, and then click on the access hearing management system. If you find the date for this particular hearing, and then you can just upload your information right there. Um, the Committee on Health will be back here tomorrow morning because we're working. Um, let's see. Yeah, our next hearing is at uh, 9.30 tomorrow. It's on maternal health. And uh, none of you agencies will be here. It will be DC Health and others. I don't know if you have something you wanted to end with, Director Abid. Thank you, uh, Chairperson Henderson. Just wanted to answer one question that uh, Chair Chairperson White asked. Oh, yes, he uh, did. About how many youth we had at RTCs and PRTFs. We currently have 17 in that level of care. 17? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm going to list out the follow-ups real quick so that everybody's on the same page of music. Okay, so um, PDS, uh, we had a question around gaps in Medicaid coverage and lapses in medication when young people are leaving facilities. For DOIRS, um, some more details on the, OS the OASIS program, so the program capacity and how many have completed in the first two cohorts. Um, the uh, I think Councilmember Trayon White asked the number of youth who have exited DRS and who are receiving services. Um, you just asked, answered the one about psychiatric facilities. Um, whether there are any vacancies with the behavioral, behavioral health department and progressive life centers role with the agency. And then DBH, a follow up around um, data sharing and what that regular communication looks mm -hmm. like with other agencies. Yes. All right, there being no further business before the council or this committee, uh, it is 7.58, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you.